Hello, and happy late holidays and new year to you all. I hope they have been or will be going well for you. Welcome to the official Molly Stars Ask Me Anything response video, made in celebration of passing 10,000 subscribers on the main channel, in which I opened a 10-day window for people to submit their questions earlier in December. As you can imagine, this video will be me going over as many of the questions as I got and giving as thorough of a response as I can for each of them. I will admit that I'll be going through these questions rather rapid fire, not rushing through them so to speak, but I don't intend to transition between questions or spend too much time rambling outside of just giving straight answers, as I have gotten something along the lines of at least 300 submissions between every channel that I opened for them. Which, of course, thank you all so so much to those who asked a question. I can't be appreciative enough for the immense amount of engagement I got for this silly little idea for a subspecial. I should also add that because of just how many questions I have gotten, I obviously won't be getting to all of them in this video, though I do get through quite a lot of them, but if I don't answer yours here, then I apologize. I hope the ones that I do end up answering will still be interesting to hear my responses to. And one more thing before we get into it, while a very large majority of these questions are really casual or silly and the like, I did say in the AMA announcement that people could ask me literally fucking anything. And naturally, I got a few, a very small few, but still answered questions that I can best describe as being a little spicy. While I don't answer anything that is outright like super TMI and also the twist to how I am answering these is, let's say, not really opening up about me in a way that would affect part of me in a tangible manner, and so don't really overstep any boundaries for me personally, there are a few questions I respond to that, while not explicitly NSFW, I'm sure either minors or just people in general might not want to or shouldn't hear about. So I've included the timestamps of the very few questions of that nature here if you want to skip them. This is just so you can note these for yourself if you are comfortable with topics that may have any sexual implications to them. And if you're worried about me oversharing, keep in mind the responses are coming from specifically the funny little gal in your screen, and not your concept of what you deem to be who I quote unquote actually am. And I hope you'll get what I mean by that as you listen to my responses. Also, because of how insanely fucking long this video is going to be, I haven't even- I have just barely started the audio as I'm saying this, but because of how long this is gonna end up being, uh, I am not gonna be going very hard on the editing or even the voiceover for this. I'm gonna be a little more casual with this so that I can, you know, get through this a little more efficiently, so I hope you don't mind that at least. But with that, I suppose there's no other way to go about this than just starting with the questions. So get comfy, as I'll start by going through the comments I got on YouTube, as the majority of the questions came from there. First, from GD Rhythmic, who asks, Congrats to 10k+. Anywho, do you ever plan to do a face reveal? If not, that is perfectly okay. I'm just curious. Thank you so much. It definitely makes sense to ask about a face reveal, given that I've never really called much attention to it. Admittedly, I do find it rather amusing, as technically you've been seeing my face throughout all of my videos, help even my profile picture, but I imagine you refer to specifically the other vessel that I am bound to. In which case, technically, I already have revealed that face as well in some of my older videos. It's not really something I make a big deal about, as most appearances of that form of mine were made well in the past, and I personally don't want to make a big deal of it. In short, I kind of already have done a face reveal well before making videos on this channel, so I feel like doing one now wouldn't really carry much weight to it. Nor would I want it to. The point of my content is less to make an idol out of that form of me, or any form of me for that matter, but rather to make things that can resonate with people first and foremost. Especially now that, going forward, if I am to appear in that other form, I plan to keep my physical traits obscured in different ways to further that sentiment. Mallet, and actually quite a lot of people, but Mallet in particular here, asks, What is your favorite Deltarune, or in the case of other people who asked this sort of question, Undertale character? You did seem to be one of the first comments I got on the YouTube video, so congrats on that. To answer your question, it's honestly really hard to say. I think for Deltarune specifically, initially my favorite character was Rouse, and he's still kind of a comfort character to me even to this day, but aside from that, Chris, Noel, and to some extent even Susie also compete for that spot in many ways. Hell, in some other ways, Spampton and Jevil also get pretty damn close, but I think for the pure personal connection and relation I felt to the character in question, it probably has to be Chris currently. Something something, feeling like the odd one out in most places and known to be kind of nice but also a freak to everyone else, and generally a feeling of being disillusioned by the environment one is in, and being othered in both small and large ways and feeling like you can only fit in when it's at the expense of feeling like you're actually yourself. Yeah, I suppose for people like me it could be easy to relate a bit to this gremlin, especially when reminiscing on my own teenage years. And I guess most recently I relate to Noelle a lot for similar reasons. Drini, 1004, and also quite a lot of people have asked something like, 
Excluding the Undertale and Dilthurn franchises, what games would you say you have the most experience in, i.e. lore and general knowledge? Or if not this question, I've also just gotten a lot of questions about my favorite games in general, which this question pretty much answers anyway. Well aside from those two games, I do have a lot of experience with the Sonic franchise in particular, and I'll likely be mentioning that quite a bit in this AMA actually. And going on, there's a lot of experience I have with indie games in general as well, to which the list would go on for for quite a while, and I also have been very invested in Valve's games and anything related to the Source engine. I've even had a deeper interest for games like Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty, at least when I was younger, but that interest did fade after a while. And of course, how could I forget PlayStation mascot platformers? Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper… Ah, that was the good stuff. I feel like there's also one more I wanted to mention, but it's like at the last second it just kind of slipped my mind or something. <laughs> I don't know, it, it might come back to me later though. Jack Van Hoy asks, Opinion on GTA 4's two DLC expansions and are they better or worse than the base game of GTA 4? GTA 4 is already my favorite game of the whole series, so I have a lot of personal feelings tied to the game in general. I think both of its expansions were definitely really good in their own right, but Ballad of Gay Tony in particular to me is the game in its peak form. Lost and Damned had a really interesting story to it, as does the base game, but Gay Tony just adds so much new and cool shit to do in the city, and I think what world building it does add to the bigger story of GTA 4 is something I can't appreciate enough. Plus, his general vibe of focusing more on the nightlife aspect of the city is something I really can get behind. It also was the first game I ever actually played when I got a PS3, so I owe a lot to GTA 4 in particular. It's a great game to me still. Can't say much more than that without making a whole video of my own on it, honestly. Rowan Bentley asks, I got a few, so here goes. Do you have any pets? How do you decide what topics to discuss on this channel? Is there any channel, person, or style that your editing is inspired from? On average, what's the time spent on making, say, an hour-long video? Filming, editing, scripting, etc. And not a question, but your channel's been my go-to for long-form content to listen while I'm working. Plus, the editing style is fun, even on rewatches. You deserve this 10k milestone and then some. Thank you. I don't have any pets in the conventional sense, I guess, uh, as in other organic beings, but I do look after a mechanical companion of mine here and there in my free time. He's a little robot sort of rabbit thing that I made named Leaf. He keeps me company since I don't often have actual visitors where I am. As for how we decide on topics for the channel, it's sort of a mix of what the current main brain rot is and also, at least currently, gauging how interesting of a topic it would be for people generally. In essence, if I have brain rot over something and also feel like I have something unique to offer to the discourse surrounding that specific thing in question, then it could work well for a video covering it. Aside from that, when it comes to deciding when I should do it, I also try to gauge how much stuff I have to cover exactly so that I know if it would be a major video or a minor video. Or, in other words, if me covering it will result in a video essay or or a video dissertation. I'm sure you get what I mean by that at this point. Which speaking of, with the Staggering Winds video being the best reference I have for making a video that's just an hour long, that video in particular took me roughly three weeks to make, between writing the script, recording the audio, and editing the video itself. I did record the footage at the end of the video and get some assets together for it a bit before writing the script, but thorough production hadn't started until the beginning of November, and I finished the video about a week before it released. So I guess for every hour of video, it takes anywhere from two to three weeks to fully make. And finally, as for whether my editing is inspired by other creators, it's kind of difficult to say. I think if my editing was inspired by any creators in particular, it's probably pulling from a really, really big pool and so I can't really think of a few specific ones because of that. I've had an interest in creators who have done similarly game-focused content, other theorists, YouTubers, and if you couldn't tell already from some of the shit I happened to pull, a bit of inspiration from the horror side of YouTube in general. I feel like my editing currently is this weird mix of being both casual but also knowing when to turn the dial up a bit in the production quality. It's like sometimes I think I'm pulling a bit from the, the Wendigoon bag, and then other times I'm pulling from the Nexpo bag of inspiration, if you get what I mean. Although that's a very generalized way of putting it, because a lot of my current style has been a result of me just fucking around and doing stuff that felt different, really. Like my insistence on 4x3, for example. I don't really think I actually have a creator that I pulled that from in particular. I was just like, huh, why is 16x9 so universally used on here? Like, of course it's because it's a standard here, I suppose, but I figured that making what is otherwise completely average YouTube video essays and the such, with an unusual aspect ratio, would be just enough of a weird decision to feel unique to my style, but not so weird that it would take away from the video being digestible or easy to watch. And hey, I guess that worked out, so good call, me. And thank you so much for the kind words. As someone who puts on stuff often myself while I'm working on my own projects, it means a ton to be contributing to the other end of that exchange creatively. 
Soft Mins asks, Your thoughts on CRT TVs? Well, what's there to say about them? It's been quite the standard here to use this sort of technology, but even if it weren't, I do have quite the fascination with them and how they work. It's interesting how far technology has come over the years around here, and something about the way they show color, the way it both comes to life and shuts down so blatantly, even that humming you can just barely hear when you leave it on. Something about it just entrances me. The analog technology in general for whatever drawbacks it might have is so impressive in its functionality and the how of it. I've never seen anything work quite like it, and I wouldn't have it any other way, personally. I like spending as much time as I can occasionally trying to pick these funny little doodads apart and seeing how they work. Just hopefully without exploding myself accidentally in the process. Yankee Jim asks, Are there any changes you wish you could go back and make to previous videos, like adding or cutting certain segments, music choice, even really small stylistic choices in a similar vein to stuff like the 4x3 aspect ratio or VHS filter? Oh, for sure. I think naturally, as I keep improving and refining my style, there will be things that I'll go back to and wish I had done just slightly differently. Maybe using a different song, or wishing my audio was better, or even being more or less thorough with some segments. Cutting stuff down, or wanting to add some more things. But I try not to dwell too much on it, since my mentality is to try not to focus on redoing things, but just to focus on something new. What I finish is finished, and I'd rather use that energy on fresher topics over ones that I've already covered. Bun Bun Box asks, How old are you? At least 20. I... I think. So much has happened that it's honestly kind of hard to tell for sure, but I know I'm at least over a few decades old. Though the effect on my circumstances could do who knows what to how much time my vessel has actually passed. Doesn't help that aging is a little bit weird for me, so looks aren't quite the most accurate measure for the amount of time I've existed for, but short answer, at least 20 as of this video. Eden asks, Congrats on 10k, Molly. You definitely deserve it. My question may be a bit odd, but can you cook? If so, what's your favorite food to cook? Or favorite food in general? Thank you. You're welcome, and thank you as well. I can actually cook a bit, but I do still need some experience with it, so there's a lot of aspects to it that I haven't tried yet. Currently though, my favorite food to cook is eel over rice. And in general, my favorite food depends, but burgers, sushi, and pizza are, you know, I, I usually just kind of shift between any one of those three as my favorite. It's hard to pick just one favorite, honestly. I'm a huge food enjoyer in general. Mirage Islander asks, What's your favorite Pokemon? Hard to say. I don't have an awful lot of experience with Pokemon, but as I am naturally an enjoyer of Benoyas, I have to pick Raboot just based on appearance alone. They look so fucking cool. In fact, they kind of remind me of someone. But, I don't know, the specifics are slipping me. Either way, yeah, Rabbit is great. If not a Rabbit, then any version of Sprigatito or Eevee. Solarius asks, I have two questions, but you can choose which one to answer. One, kinda random, but what are your favorite shows? Minor Gravity Falls, Better Call Saul, and probably Invincible, in that order. And two, Got any advice for transitioning as a teen pre-estrogen? There's a good chance I'll get another question later like the first one, so I'll go with the second one to play by this comment's rules. As someone whose other vessel is not really going through any means of transitioning, so to speak, beyond voice training and just being more flexible with clothing and the like, I'd say my advice really is to just take care of yourself. As a teen especially, things are naturally kinda all over the fucking place in regards to how one's body develops, and I think the thing you can control most is just figuring out what kind of aesthetic suits you most for your self-expression. If you can help it, don't be afraid to try clothes that maybe you haven't tried before. Or don't be afraid to speak of it beyond your usual range, and in my experience, you'll eventually notice your voice adjusts to your ideal pitch over time. I mean hell, if you go back far enough, you'll see I used to speak at a generally lower tone than I currently do in my videos. And even then, while I'm sure more direct means of transitioning absolutely may help for some people, self-care is generally the most important thing. Eat healthily, be at least a bit active physically, and don't push your body too far beyond its limits if you don't have to. At least speaking as someone whose other vessel has not felt a need to pursue more direct means of transitioning currently, I'd say you'd be surprised how far you can go in improving your self-image and presentation through being more kind to yourself. Vix asks, Hi Molly, congratulations on hitting 10k subscribers. Here are my questions. What do you use besides the NTSC QT for the transition like you do in 134, the second part of the device theory? Second, how do you edit your sound to make it sound glitchy? And lastly, could you share your NTSC QT presets? Thanks. 
for context, NTSCQT is the plugin and program that I use that uh, produces the more authentic VHS filter that I tend to use in all my videos so far. It's the most accurate filter I honestly have of that sort, and I would definitely recommend it if you're interested in doing that sort of style with your videos, personally. But to get to the response, thank you, and you're welcome. Aside from using NTSCQT for my VHS filter, I also just use a variety of static or VHS overlays I found online, usually messing with the blending mode and adding some other effects to them if need be. I found that layering a few overlays on top of each other, each one being a different color and offsetting one from the other at a lower opacity tends to look pretty cool. Or even adding a mosaic effect so that the static itself looks a good bit more crunchy compared to how it normally looks aids a lot in what I'm going for at some points. As for editing audio to make it sound glitchy, it depends. It can be as simple as just copy and pasting a few frames of audio over and over to give it the impression of freezing, or perhaps throwing on some distortion effects or bit crushing and the such. Depending on what I'm trying to do, different contexts warrant different ways of messing with the audio. Also, sometimes it can sound glitchy because it literally is glitchy if I happen to be data mushing or in essence actually corrupting a specific part of the video like you might see in some parts of my vids. And as for presets, I don't really use any of my own aside from the ones that come with it on installation. I do mess with the settings as I render a video to give it the impression of more or less intensity in the VHS filter at different points, but I often find myself using one of the normal presets and just adjusting from there depending on what I'm using NTSCQT for. RMaster206 asks, Any obscure games you can recommend? Crosscode is my immediate go-to for this question. I don't know how obscure of a game it is, but I've gotten enough people asking about it when I mention it, and it seems rather under-discussive of an indie game compared to the others of its kind to where I'd say it lies in some level of it. Go play CrossCode. The gameplay is really fun in my opinion, the puzzles will have you racking your fucking brain, and the story and characters are genuinely amazing and I still think about them a lot to this day ever since playing it back in 2019. Fucking amazing game all around. Aside from that, I'd also recommend Hypnagosia and its sequel Boundless Dreams, as well as another game by the same developer of those two, that being Interior Worlds. The first two of those three especially I find a lot of comfort in, and if you like liminal spaces and generally pretty trippy imagery, I'm sure you'll enjoy something in all three of those games. There's surely others that I can mention, but chances are I'll be saving some of those for other videos in the future. Which, speaking of, Persian Slasher asks, what franchises would you like to cover similarly to how you've covered Deltarune, if there are any? Franchises, huh. Well, I have a lot of words about the Sonic series for one thing. While it's not quite in the same sphere of gaming as Deltarune, I hold the Sonic games incredibly close to my heart and particularly in the realm of its storytelling and also the way that the perception of the series and fandom has evolved so much over the years completely fucking fascinates me. I think if I were to start covering Sonic stuff though, I would not be able to stop for a while. Perhaps one could call it a potential Sonic Marathon. <sighs> Someday, maybe I'll give that a try. But no promises there, that is for way far in the future me to decide on. Other than that, I'm sure maybe some of Valve's stuff may be worth a look. And the Mother series is also definitely the kind of thing that may be up my alley, but only if I really have something unique to add to the discussion of those games. But I know in any case there is definitely a lot of things that I'll want to cover after I finish the device series, so time will tell on that. As Zell asks, Did your persona have some changes during the making of it? Honestly, I haven't really gone through that many changes since I first started donning the attire I use most commonly in my videos. The most that's changed is that I've gotten some other versions of my sweater, some are more detailed, some less, and I guess there's also these nice boots I started wearing in the past year. I also sometimes alternate between wearing the usual thigh highs and just stockings of the same color, but other than that, I feel like I knew what I wanted for my looks and self-expression pretty well right out the gate. If this question refers to my making as the beginning of my existence though, and not just this channel, well, yeah, I did look somewhat different back then, as anyone would really. But I assume you refer to it just in the context of this channel, so I'll leave it at that. Ivy Thay asks, What do you think about Kirby lore? Bonus, what is your favorite Kirby copy ability? Kirby lore is fucking insane and I love it. I have some friends who are super into it and both from what I hear of it and also what I've experienced of it in the few games I've played in the series, it's such a fucking roller coaster that I really have grown to appreciate the series as a whole for it. Definitely not something that I see a lot of in other series of its kind, but I do want to play more games in the series to really get a better grasp of it. Same goes for the bonus question too. I remember liking a lot of them, but I need to play more of the series to really get a confident answer on that. I think I remember the drill ability in Forgotten Land being pretty damn powerful and cool though, so I guess I'll pick that for now with my experience of only having played two whole games in the series. Gruga asks, Have you ever played Outer Wilds? 
If you played it, what do you think about it? And would you make a video about it in the future? I did indeed play it back in 2022, and I fucking loved it. The ending definitely got me pretty good, and it's absolutely one of those wish I could play it for the first time again kind of games thanks to how you actually go about completing it. I still look back on my time with it incredibly fondly thanks to that. But I'm not sure if I'll make a video about it currently. If I find something interesting about it that I feel hasn't really been discussed or covered before by others ad nauseum, then perhaps. Though, of course, I can say that about a lot of things, which is why I'm a bit sparse with answer questions about what videos I may or may not do in the future. It all kind of results in the same answer, usually. Rita Buba asks, I wanted to thank you for making these videos. They've helped me in some sticky moments in my life. Thank you. So, my single question. What's your favorite pizza? Thank you so much, and you're more than welcome for my content helping you through rough times. I know I felt the same for plenty of other content creators I've watched, so being on the other side of that is a very high honor to me. As for my favorite pizza, man, that is a hard question. I like most kinds of pizza, really, but I guess the type I always like having is usually a pizza with a little more sauce than there is cheese, maybe some fresh tomatoes or mozzarella thrown in, basil leaves, probably bits of different kinds of meat thrown in, and also banana peppers. Spooky Sunday asks, Alright, so I have a list of questions. Do you like Chow from the hit game Needle Mouse Explorations the Second Fight? Parentheses Sonic Adventure 2. Would you perhaps be interested in a Yumaniki inspired murder mystery game if I so happen to be developing one? And what is your favorite video game of all time? Not the best game, your favorite. Oh, I fucking love Chow. They are probably the best kind of virtual pet ever made, and it baffles me that there isn't a modern Chow garden to this day. Sega, you could monetize the fuck out of that shit and I would not even complain as long as it isn't gotcha or some loot box type beat stuff. If you're watching this, please do it. Hell, even if you make it a mobile thing, it's the only mobile game I would actually bother playing. I genuinely mean it. But even with the Chow gardens aside, they're just cuteness personified. Nothing else even compares to them for me. Truly the creature ever. As for the game that you may or may not be developing, it does definitely sound interesting. Murder Mystery Yuma Nikki is a clash of ideas I haven't really heard of before, but I think it could be really cool if you know what you're dealing with it. And as for my favorite game of all time, I don't know. It's changed a lot over the years as my tastes have also changed drastically, especially because I'm not sure what it takes for a game to be my favorite of all time. Would it depend on the gameplay? The story? its personal impact on me, how much I've replayed it? The answer changes depending on what takes priority here, and the issue is that I don't know what my priority would even be exactly, or at least I don't know what would be a priority without a shadow of a doubt. I simply just don't have a solid final answer on this. It could be the Sonic Adventure games, either one of them, it could be CrossCode, it could even be Gmod or something, I don't know. But I guess that's kind of the point of me even making this channel, is so that I can go over why each of these things are so special to me individually. But with all of that said, I do get the feeling that if or when Deltarune reaches completion and it tells its story exactly how it wants to, that might genuinely be the closest I could ever get to a favorite game of all time depending on how that goes, because of just how much it's done for me in this stage of my life. I'll let time tell on that one. The Four Pointed Star asks, Do you have lungs? Will you have lungs? Could you consider having lungs? I don't know, it depends. I mean, I can breathe, but I don't really worry too much about it given my current circumstances. Let's just say that I do have lungs for the sake of everyone's sanity. XXGuaxinimXX asks, What is your favorite tarot card? First off, this person has a Sly Cooper profile picture. I'm not showing it in the video, but you just have to take my word for it. That's fucking based. Anyway, uh, tarot cards, right. Yeah, those things you guys have. I haven't really learned much about those, so the name kind of slips me. With what I do know of them though, the Hermit in particular kind of resonates with me in both its more positive and negative meanings. Can't really think of one that I fuck with that vision of more than that one, really. Ivory Madness asks, What is your blood type? I don't know. Every time I've checked, the answer's varied. Melody Leonard asks, In the second video in the Device Theory series, there was a hidden QR code that led to a website that had some kind of message encoded in Morse code. What the hell was that? I tried my best to decode a message, but I couldn't get anything. Maybe I missed something, but I haven't heard anybody else talking about it. What does it mean? I fully understand if you want this to stay a mystery, but please at least give me a hint, Lamel. A hidden QR code, huh? Odd. I haven't quite seen that myself now that I think about it. Truth is, I know as much as you do. In fact, probably even less. I just make the videos themselves, and whatever you might be seeing on your end, I don't really know where it might be coming from or if it's just a bug or something. Then again, QR codes are not something that's just made on accident. Like, I'm sure someone must have made it. Like, it must have come from somewhere. I don't know, but I'd say look into that. 
Clearly, someone or maybe something put that there for a reason. What that reason might be, though, or what it means, I wouldn't be any closer to knowing. I might have some guesses, but I should do some more digging of my own before I go out of right confirming anything. Sharksy Axe asks, You've mentioned being a Half-Life fan. Are there other games from the same time period that you like too? Also, will you be streaming more Voices of the Void? From that same time period, I suppose the GTA games in the 2000s would fit with that, no? I do have quite a bit of nostalgia for each of the games that came out around that time. Same goes for an offshoot of those games actually, that one being Scarface The World of Zeros for the PS2. I haven't played that game in a hot minute, it might be fun to try that game again sometime. Also, I'd like to stream Voices of the Void more sometime. I've been rather busy what with videos and personal projects and want to focus more on comment response streams currently, but I did really enjoy the stream I did of it back in October. I'll see how I feel about it in the future. Chess asks, You ever play a board game? On rare occasion, yeah. I used to play them a bit more often as a kid, but I don't find myself playing them too often now. I guess the closest I have to that is Tabletop Simulator or, I don't know, D&D? Does that count? Barricon asks, Here are five questions I got for you. Hope you can answer at least one to two of them. One, what is your favorite animal, color, art piece slash series, and food? Two, do you actually celebrate Christmas or do you use it for publicity stunts? I don't celebrate Christmas, so I want to know if we got that in common. 3. Do you like Ina, Raymond, or anything else absurd? 4. What ideal do you believe in the most? Do you desire freedom the most? Is it security? Is it equality slash fairness? Is it justice? In other words, what color is your Tobyverse soul? And 5. Would you read my comic once and so? I'm currently working on the first volume, but have been taking a short break due to getting distracted by a ref sheet for it and a physical promo for it. For the first question, in the order you asked, bunnies, purple, and I already answered the latter two earlier. For the next question, I do sort of celebrate Christmas, but I'm more used to celebrating particularly New Year's Eve and some other holidays on a few days of the 12th and 1st. For the third question, absurdity is kind of a broad term here, but while I haven't seen the source material of the ones you mentioned in particular, I guess the closest I could think of to fit that is a uh, Vib Ribbon. Vibri is just so silly and, uh, I don't know, something about the game and everything about it just feels weirdly familiar for some reason. For the fourth question, I feel like the ideal I believe in most, above all else, would have to be completion. When I say that, I suppose I refer to completion through being honest to others in yourself, finding the version of you that feels the most in your element. It doesn't have to be the best version, or one without any flaws, just the one that feels the most comfortable where they happen to be. In feeling complete, I feel like that's how I'm able to enjoy the present regardless of what I actually am doing or how things are going at a larger scale, you know? And as for your comic, I might give it a look possibly once it's ready. I do have a huge backlog of shit to get through though, but don't be afraid to DM me about it if you want. Next early asks, Okay, here's my question. Do you know how adorable you are? Or is it just me? P.S. I love you. Oh, you flatter me, thank you. As much as I try to focus on keeping my personal stuff out of whatever videos I work on, it does mean a lot that people take a liking to my appearance or just how I act in general. I'm not the type to brag about it, but I guess a bit of self-care has its payoffs. Love you too. Angelic Moth asks, Congrats on the milestone, Molly. Here are the questions that come to mind. Genderant? Opinions on Gabriel Ultrakill. What country are you from? Kind of related to the last one, do you speak any other language? Thank you. For the first question, indeed, gender and that's about the vibe for me. Gabriel Ultrakill is kind of a loser, but that also makes him kind of cool. I just know that dude is not straight. Aside from that, he's such a fascinating character so far in the game. Seeing his character arc so far pretty much go from being this overzealous saint to then becoming disillusioned from his faith and fully indulging in the thrill of just wanting to fight against a worthy adversary. Given the themes that Ultrakill's story has shown thus far, it just makes me curious where his arc is going to go by the end of it all once the game's done. In some ways, I feel like the story of the game is more about him than it is about V1, and I think that was Hikita's intention ultimately with the game's story and how it's being told. He's a funny little guy, and for as edgy as he is, I like the way that he's been written and voice acted a ton. Shout out to Gianni. As for what country I'm from, I spent most of my upbringing in mainly on the east coast of Quite the bustling place, but I ended up moving to a more remote area so I could finally have some peace in mind after enough significant things happened in my life. I do look back on my memories of it rather fondly though. And for the last question, aside from what is known as English, I also know some Cyrillic and a little bit of Spanish. I'd like to learn more languages though. Knowing Japanese as well sounds like it'd be useful sometime given some of my current inspirations. A jail trader asks, Hey Molly, I was just wondering, who's that behind you? Oh, that? That's Mike B. Cheesy. And don't you dare forget it. Creepy Boom the Gamer asks, 
Thoughts on Gen Z's slang terms like Ohio, Riz, Gyat, Skibbity, and Phantom Tax. And is the Big Chunkus meme funny? That feels like more of a Gen Alpha thing to me, really. Honestly, with terms like that, I think it's just time being a flat fucking circle. I'm sure when millennials were much younger, they had their own weird, crunchy terminology that made no sense to the previous generations, and I know when I was growing up, my teen years were filled with me finding extremely deep-fried images, sudden loud noises, and the letter B extremely funny for some reason. I bet you in another decade, roughly, there's going to be even more esoteric turns from, like, Gen Beta or something like that that Gen C and Alpha are gonna look at and think makes no fucking sense. Language evolves in weird but fascinating ways. Big Chungus was kind of funny though for maybe a month, but I never really cared that much for it personally. Paper Mr. Magalore Guy asks, Hi Molly. I was wondering, who was your favorite Disney princess? This might be fucked up to say, but I honestly don't remember that many Disney movies, at least the ones with princesses in them. But I think because I remember it the most, and I kind of remember her being pretty cool, I'll pick Rapunzel from Tangled. Sanchez Fortinist asks, Congratulations, Molly. Hope more people end up finding your content. It's pretty good. I'm interested in a few things. What are your thoughts on inventing vine sauce? What do you think of VTubers and their impact on the internet as a whole? Do you find the Deltarin, as well as Undertale by Relation community, to be generally accepting of LGBT content creators? My thanks. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much. I've been a long-time Vine Sauce enjoyer. Vinny Streams have definitely gotten me through some rough patches in my time. He's got that really low-key but still entertaining aura to his stuff that I really appreciate. As for the VTubers question, I honestly think they're one of my favorite things to happen to content creation as a whole recently. Being constantly on stream and needing to put on a show to tons of people is the kind of thing that can be really difficult to find privacy or free time for when you have to be so public so consistently. And I think the fact that VTubing allows people to kind of make their own character in a way, their own sort of sona that they can put on when they're entertaining people, and that they can take off when on their own, I think the potential anonymity it brings is very nice. That and it kind of helps deal with a lot of the troubles of parasocial relationships, cause hey, if there are simps or people who are super invested in you in general, that at least makes it so that for a good chunk of those cases they're not simping for you the actual person, but more so just for your character. And, at least in my opinion, I don't really think it oversteps nearly as many boundaries as long as the viewers know the totally fictional nature of the VTuber. Unless they're not fictional, in which case, I don't know, ask them for permission to be weird, I guess? You never really know with these things. And as for the last question, honestly, yeah, aside from what feels like the minority that is somehow a fan of the games but is also bigoted, which feels like a fucking paradox to me, I honestly really love the acceptance of LGBT content creators and the community in general. I've gotten mostly just comments asking about my pronouns or something when it's on that topic, but upon the explanation I did give for my whole situation months ago, I can count on one hand so far how many times people actually have tried to give me shit for existing, and I think for making primarily Deltarune-focused videos. That's a sign that most people in the community probably don't suck in regards to that sort of thing. Given the fact that both games have explored characters with those themes in mind, it just kind of makes sense that the community around it would adopt the acceptance that the games themselves display. Random Guy asks, Congrats on 10k. The only question I have is how do you get inspiration for the device theory? Thank you. I got inspiration for the device theory itself a really long time ago, honestly. I think it came from me learning about the LCAPS files being a thing well before even Chapter 2 had come out and learning about how stuff like that in the game was titled in such a different way compared to everything else that got me thinking for a good while. And then, upon Chapter 2's release and the sweepstakes especially, as well as just kind of becoming closer with the community thanks to me working with half Red a bit more, it went from me having this silly little theory of mine that sounded insane to try to put into words into full on just needing to make something to get this out of my head already, because it had been boiling at the back of my mind for so many years at that point. In essence, just a case of me connecting a lot of dots that felt weirdly related to each other in a way I hadn't seen others connect them, turning into a need to discuss something that I think needed much more light shed on it, going from a simple theory to a full-on video dissertation about it and the game's meta-narrative. If you want my more direct inspirations for how I think the theory works, though, well, I'll have to make part 3 to give you a good look at that. Miss Hillman asks, A few questions from one. Hope there aren't too many repeat questions. How long have you been drawing for, and what's your favorite color? Also, all the support you're getting is 100% deserved. I hope you know that. Thank you so much. I did already answer the second one, favorite color being either purple, or if not that, then pastel yellow, or really most pastel and neon colors for that matter. I don't have a color that I really hate, necessarily. But I have been drawing since about 2017. Or at least that's when I started taking it a bit more seriously. 
I started drawing digitally that year using just the trackpad on my laptop at the time, but in 2019 I got my first drawing tablet and since then I've been improving at a scarily quick rate. Like, I might throw up some old art of mine from years ago just to show what I mean. Like, goddamn, the improvement's been wild, but I like how it's ultimately turned out over the years. Delta Jevil asks, So we can ask anything, hmm? Twiddle's non-existing evil mustache. Well then, riddle me this, Molly Stars. What is 6 divided by 2, times in parentheses 1 plus 2? Really though, what is your favorite color? And why do you use a Proton email instead of something more common like Gmail? The answer to the first question depends on what order you do the operations. In any case, you do start by solving the parentheses, which would give us 3. But if you multiply and then divide, which is at least what I usually do, especially so that both sides of this problem only have one number each, you'll get 1, whereas if you do division and then multiplication, you'll get 9. Pretty fucked up, isn't it? I already answered the second question, but as for why I use a Proton email, while I do also use Gmail because I have too much stuff tied to a few addresses on there, using my Proton email for YouTube stuff specifically ensures that whatever I do get on that email is for stuff that is important to the channel or any potential business, rather than just getting lost in a sea of newsletters or who knows what else. Also, fuck Google, and any chance I get to use an alternative, I'm willing to give a try. Isaac asks, What is the most illegal thing you have ever searched online? Hmm. Honestly, I can't think of much that I've searched for that was illegal in nature, but I have definitely done digging here and there into places that maybe I shouldn't have. Then again, even if I did, it's not like they can, like, stop me or whatever. I've got stories to tell, dammit. Arduyo Official asks, R. Maria asks, What piece of media, shows, books, movies, games, etc., would you consider the one that impacted you the most? Unironically, Undertale and Deltarune. It might seem like I'm just saying it because that's the thing I made videos about, but genuinely, were it not for those two games, I think I would have gotten objectively worse as a person. Those games did so much to make me really start thinking more about healing and improving my self-esteem and overall outlook on things, and I think it's the kind of thing I really needed back in 2018. Because holy fuck, I was not in a good place mentally at the time. I was someone who hated myself a ton, was prone to lashing out at others, and had a few pretty bad habits socially. I'm not saying those games, like, solved all of those problems just by their existence, but that they were certainly a catalyst for deeper introspection. And most importantly, being able to forgive and be more kind to myself. I'm sure that if I were to think more about it, there's other games that did impact me pretty heavily too. In fact, I think Amora gets pretty damn close for instance. But I have Undertale and Deltarune to thank for pretty much setting me on a completely new path mentally that I have not felt to be the wrong one ever since. And the way things are going right now, I don't think that'll be changing anytime soon. Competitively asks, what was your favorite video game during your childhood? Hard to say. I think Sonic Heroes had to be one of them, honestly. It was one of the first games I actually ever played in my introduction to both Game Egg and to the Sonic series in general. It's definitely janky, but I still look back really fondly at the time I spent on it and the general vibe of it. It was good shit for kids like myself at the time. Other than that, Ratchet and Clank or Jack and Daxter definitely were also my favorite games to play as a kid. I was never good at those games, but my love for platformers was pretty much cemented by them, as well as just what my inspirations and aesthetics would become for pretty much the rest of my life, really. As well as another one, but I, I swear, it's at the tip of my tongue, but I can't figure out the name of it. Smetting asks, What do you use to draw and edit videos? I've been drawing using Fire Alapaca for the longest time. Aside from that, maybe I'll use Ace Sprite or Piskill for more crunchy stuff or pixel art, but it's mostly all been Fire Alpaca. For videos, I edit using Adobe Premiere Pro. Capslock asks, Opinion on frogs? When I asked this to someone else, the response I got was that they thought that frogs are idiotic and silly. Opinions on that? I do agree that frogs are quite silly, they very much are the case. But idiotic? I don't know, I don't think you're giving them quite enough credit. Clearly that person has never played Everhood. Oswald Hamolka asks, What are the exact coordinates of your home and what times do you leave? My home coordinates are 181.284705, negative 166.978046. I don't actually leave the house very often though, and certainly not enough to where I could give you a reliable time, other than if I need to explore and get research on something for a project or video. Blocky64 asks, I have multiple questions. Favorite Metroid and Mother game, and why? Favorite Homestuck character? The only media in here that I'm familiar with is the Mother series, so I'll just answer that one, in which case my favorite Mother game is the second one, Earthbound. Mother 3 does compete really fucking hard for that favorite spot to be fair, but I do have a lot of fond memories with Earthbound in particular. I really like how vast the setting in that game is and its contemporary aesthetic to my memory just really scratched my brain just right. 
I need to play this series again sometime really because a lot of my memories of it are kind of fuzzy now to be fair, but I do remember enjoying particularly Earthbound the most overall, even if Mother 3 did make me tear the fuck up by the end. I guess it's just the second game feeling the most cozy, I suppose. Ice Gummy asks, Where do you find the motivation to make videos? All four video essays currently on your channel are long, comprehensive, and well-produced, and I imagine they all took a considerable amount of effort to write, record, edit, etc. How do you get yourself to sit down and actually work on them, especially the first one from before you had the motivation of a fanbase? Oh, it's a struggle for sure. I do genuinely enjoy making videos, but I can definitely attest to the fact that the lack of an audience did make it a bit hard to just get around to actually making progress with huge video projects like the ones I've done so far. Given how even the shortest one of those four took about three weeks to make, I kind of wonder how I managed to deal with it myself. But I think the main motivator for me tends to be an underlying feeling I get of, hey, I found slash learned about this cool thing and either no one seems to be talking about it or there's something about it that I want to shed more light on. So I really want to just write about it and make a video on it. For the Backrooms video even, while several of the bigger creators already had made videos covering it, I felt none of them really dug quite deep enough, so that's where I wanted to step in. And for the device theory, it was a similar deal. I knew the Sea of Deltarune theories was fucking massive, but somehow the part of it that revolved around meta-narrative stuff and really digging into the fourth wall breaking aspect of the game potentially felt weirdly shallow. And I could not live without getting this damn theory out of my head and onto a document, so I just went ahead and did it. In short, finding a niche that has something I'm super passionate about but don't see enough content for, or just having extreme brain rot over something in general. As long as it's something fresh and something that I think people haven't really heard before in the discussion of a specific topic, then that's enough of a motivator to get me through the long process of making these big-ass videos, I suppose. Though also having an actual community to think about and tend to now definitely does help quite a bit with improving my output, but even then, I would have done something like device theory regardless of performance. It means a ton to have just that extra support from y'all, though. Joshua Bowman asks, Hey, do or did you have acne problems? If yes, then do you feel self-conscious about it? If you are, how do you deal with it? I'm asking as a 19 year old who just thinks about it a lot. Oh yeah, I've been there. I never had like extremely intense acne to where it was like all over my face, but I have had some pretty nasty pimples here and there over the years. It's a bit annoying, but as long as you don't pick at it and just do some self care, it'll pass in my experience. But also, it's literally just the body being weird and we all kind of have our quirks with our bodies that can't really be helped, so I don't think it's anything to beat yourself up over as long as you're looking after it. If it ever flares up, the main thing I do is just some skincare and probably also making sure my face isn't obscured by my hair or anything for a bit so that it doesn't make the acne any worse potentially. Though it could be different for you because, again, this stuff is kind of weird for everyone in their own unique ways. I'm no medical expert as much as I'm just doing what works for me, so don't take my way of dealing with it even remotely as gospel. Karma in Spin asks, Why are you such a gremlin? I don't know. I'm just kind of a freak like that. I used to be super self-conscious about me pretty much being the weird or quiet one in most groups I tried to fit into, but you eventually learned to stop giving a shit about being judged and just let your inner creature take over. Fuck em. My swag is too tough, my bitch is too bad, and they can try to kill me. This shit ain't nothing to me, man. Ktex Nebula asks, Are you gonna do a review on Undertale Yellow one day? I'd love to see it. I haven't really done reviews outright, but I have heard a lot of good things about Undertale Yellow. I'd like to give it a try sometime, and if I do come out of it with something more profound to say in regards to the discussions surrounding it, who knows? I might make something about it, but I currently haven't even played it yet, so I can't say for sure. Charlie asks, When's the last time you saw someone with a ski mask and a gun? But more seriously, for how long have you been making music, and what made you start making it? Congrats on 10k, hope that this number will go even higher with the next video. You really deserve it. For the first question, I can't remember if I have, frankly, but I'm sure even if I did see someone like that, that they don't even know who I am. That's probably not grammatically correct, but tough shit, there's your underscores mention of the video, deal with it. For real though, I've been making music since about late 2017, I wanna say, or at least that's when I started actually becoming more interested in learning the process of it. I started out with GarageBand, but then got into FL Studio by 2019. I think the main motivator at the time for me wanting to get into making music was that I was just really curious to try it out just for the hell of it, but especially in my earlier work I feel like I made a lot of music to get a lot more negative or somber feelings out of my system in a way that didn't feel too revealing, if that made sense. I mean, the songs I made as Yevi way back when were part of a trilogy called Lustful Trash because I was a sad boy teen back then, but also because I had a lot of weird feelings regarding stuff of that sort that music was a weird sort of outlet for. In a way, I still feel like my best music comes from my most frustrated points emotionally, but I'd like to change that about my process going forward and not depend on the bad days to give me something worth finishing in the studio, you know? 
but I can't ignore that it was certainly a hell of a motivator to just get me to fuck around and do stuff with music as a medium to start out. In essence, I was kinda sad and had times where I got really sad, but used that to make some stuff that I thought sounded cool, and now I have some experience with music thanks to that, I guess. And of course, thank you so much for the kind words, as always. RomanQRR asks, a lot of fucking questions actually, good lord, but because you asked so many, and I'm sure as hell not answering every single one of these immediately, I'm going to put the ones that I can answer on a wheel and spin it a few times and see what I get, and answer each one as I go. What is the most powerful superpower to get, and why is it infinite intelligence? Because with infinite intelligence can come infinite knowledge, and with that, an infinite understanding of the past, present, and future, and therefore you can be prepared for and account for quite literally everything. Or, I guess because with infinite intelligence that means you know how to do every other superpower, I guess. Who are your favorite YouTubers? Man, it depends. Right now, my favorite YouTubers are mostly on the horror side of the platform. In particular, I really like Nick Crowley and Nexpo's videos, and also other creators in the Deltarune community who you may be familiar with. Wendigoon's also been a really fun channel to watch in the past few months, but aside from that, I've gotten a new interest as well in channels like Technology Connections. Because hearing some guy ramble about how random gizmos and doodads work is music to my fucking ears any time of the day. I've also really enjoyed Gooseboost's videos for a long time, who actually has used my vids for his Zonathon streams rather recently and shouted me out a few times. And there's really a ton of other creators I could list on here frankly, but right now it's definitely been either horror stuff, Deltarune stuff, or rambling about nerdy tech shit. Oh yeah, and of course my other YouTube slash online friends who are making content of their own. Check this stuff out if you haven't. I like to see them get some of the love that y'all give me. Why do we kill gods in JRPGs? I wouldn't quite know the answer to that myself. I think the answer may vary, it could just be some huge illustration of how the human spirit overcomes all or a means of defying fate itself, especially if the god in question has its own agenda for how things ought to be in that world. The thought of a god being corrupt or warranting a fight to begin with is insane, and so killing a god more or less is this ultimate demonstration to me of how even when everything, when existence itself seems to be stacked against you, that you can still rise above it and make a change for the better despite everything that the world throws at you. Or, I don't know, killing gods is cool and epic as shit or something. Who would die first, you or GLaDOS? Why we gotta pit bad bitches against each other? To answer your question though, probably me. I might have a pretty long lifespan, but GLaDOS is eternal. She's got a whole song about that shit, which I don't have, there's just no contest there. And finally, if I told you that I am actually THE God, the same one multiple religions try and fail to talk about, and that I will send you to eternal torture after you die if you don't wire me all your money, would you do that? I don't know. What if I told you the same thing? Would you believe me? TC Khan Karayan asks, also quite a few questions, but they're all pretty profound, so I'll answer them one by one as I go, too. What do you think about your earlier works on the second channel, Molly M? I have actually checked out your second channel during the Wait for the Part 2 video a couple of times, and I didn't want to disturb old videos with comments. So my questions all stem from the things I have seen on there. It seems like you were a big fan of Tribe 12. I have watched Test 2 a couple of times. What do you think about Tribe 12, or the greater Slenderverse stuff in general like Everyman Hybrid? Or at least, can you tell us about what do you think of the ones you interacted with nowadays? Oh boy, you really duck deep through that mess of a channel. <laughs> There's quite a lot of stuff I've done over the years on it, as that was originally my main channel aside from an unfiction or web series project I was doing at the time. But yeah, so Tribe 12. When I made the Molly M channel originally under a different name back in 2016, I was a huge fucking fan of Slenderverse stuff. It was a result of me getting into creepypasta and internet horror in general, which led me to the Slender game, and then to Marble Hornets, and then to the billions of web series about Slenderman that spun off from that. There's even this insanely long playlist I did way back in like 2017 of me trying to put as many Slenderverse and Slender series videos together into release date order as possible. I, I was obsessed. And alongside Marble Hornets and sort of Everyman Hybrid and Dark Harvest, Tribe 12 was pretty much the Slenderer series I enjoyed watching the most as a teen. Very strong emphasis on me using past tense there by the way, but I'm gonna get to that. I look back mostly pretty fondly on those days, don't get me wrong. I still hold Marble Hornets up to a very high pedestal, not just for its history, but for how much shit it's done that only Marble Hornets would have been able to do. Something like 2 The Ark, for instance, was fucking lightning in a bottle to me, and still is. I have never seen anything pull that vibe off and serve such a unique purpose to the story quite like it did. And for as confusing as Everyman Hybrid's narrative was at some points, I did still really enjoy especially the earlier videos in the series and the characters in it. Hell, even the more obscure stuff like San Frederick holds up really fucking well, I'd say give that a watch for it especially if you like Marble Hornets. But as for Tribe 12 in particular, 
If you are missing the context, I'm kind of weird about it now because back in September of 2020, whatever opinion I did have of the series completely fucking tanked as allegations of its creator, Adam Rosner, came to light about him being a groomer and just generally a fucking creep and an asshole to people and the evidence was pretty damning. And ever since it happened, this guy has just vanished off the face of the internet and that's why Tribe 12 has completely stopped uploading since then. And keep in mind, there were and even still are parts of that series that I liked. The acting was pretty bad, and honestly the pacing was not nearly as good as Teenager Me thought it was, but I really liked some of the ideas that the series was getting into. I was kind of invested in what the plot was offering, especially when it got into its later years, or its season 2 as it's called. I even had some involvement in some of the ARG stuff it did, both in accidentally solving a few puzzles and even helping with a livestream event that was done for it, so to see that the creator ended up being a fucking creep to people genuinely wrecked me. And it made me look at the series and even the Slenderverse in general with a really sour taste in my mouth for a while. And I could go on and on about it, but point is, I do have a pretty complicated relationship with Slender series. I still love some of the stuff in it, but in all retrospect, there is so little of it that really stuck with me up to this current point. Either because most of it was not very well done, or because whatever could have stuck with me ended up being tainted because their creator ended up being a bit of a piece of shit. However, I ultimately have come out of it being appreciative of the Slenderverse despite all of that, and despite all of the petty drama and also just horrific shit I saw happen over the years in it. Tribe 12, or at least the community surrounded it, was the reason I got with my longest lasting friend group of over 7 years now. Like, had one of those people not made a Discord server to just talk about the series, I would not have the support group I have right now. This was a server that I was and still am a moderator on well after its rebranding. There's so much I could say about it, and some of it I'm still kind of processing, but I feel like at this point I'm writing enough about it to warrant its own video, which I don't know if I even want to bother making, frankly. But despite Tribe 12 in particular not panning out very well and having been very much tainted because of what had happened, it doesn't mean I've completely stopped looking back fondly at what was a very real and very significant part of my time consuming horror media as a younger person. Marvel Hornets is still one of the best things to happen to the internet in my opinion, and there are still things in that Slenderverse sphere that I would genuinely recommend giving a look at. It was an important part of my life and a reason why I have what I have right now socially, or even creatively. But I guess I feel like that chapter has been closed for me since about 2021. It's more a complicated but ultimately warm memory than anything. And I'm completely okay with having it that way for now. Yeah, that was a pretty fucking heavy one, but I felt bad just answering something this personal with a half-assed or super cut-down response. Anyway, back to the other questions. What do you think about Nightmind's style of coverage? Is he still inside Joel's computer as John Cena? I really liked his earlier videos when he was starting out. I haven't really watched his vids in a while, but he seems to be doing alright with his community and the stuff he's covering, so I have some respect for him still going at it after all this time. I think at a time where ARG and web series analysis was still kind of figuring itself out in the YouTube space, he was someone that stepped in at a pretty good time. However, I'm not letting him live down talking shit about Petscop. I like his style of coverage in general, and I don't really have any issues with it honestly, as his way of doing it isn't really inherently harmful in my opinion. Maybe there's parts of it that I don't align with compared to my own way of analyzing stuff, but that's why creators do things differently, so I just have all the respect for him doing what he does after all this time. Is your MacBook Air still alive and well after many years and several scissor stabbings? Yeah, actually. I barely really use it now, and at this point it's mostly just for watching YouTube videos and stuff, or using the Tears of the Kingdom interactive map, I guess. But it's still somehow kicking after nearly 9 years since I got it. Kinda surprising. You'd think an Apple product would be nothing more than a paperweight after even just half of that time because of planned obsolescence, yet it's still going. I'm kinda proud of it. I have noticed that there are multiple memes, aesthetical vaporwave edits for shows like Steven Universe and Adventure Time, plus original music around Molly M channel, so I'd like to ask about a couple of things. How do you think the edits you have created all the way back 7 or so years ago affected your editing style nowadays? And do you think it helped you when it came to editing for others in the main channel nowadays? Or really just when you started editing full on videos or started taking editing seriously? Ah, the pre-alpha and alpha edits. Yeah, those were fun to do. I do look back on them and cringe a little bit because I clearly had way more ambitions than I had actual experience, but I think with the alpha edits I did especially, that was when I started to kind of come into my own with my aesthetic, for as eye straining as it may have been. I think it was a way of really motivating me to get better at editing over time and to get better with being super precise with timing and sequencing stuff, and while it's not the kind of thing I make anymore, 
I'm glad that I let myself be free with making both shitposts and more elaborate edits like those. They were kind of the infancy of what would become a more flashy aesthetic when it came to not only editing, but to most of what I did in general. And I'm glad I took the time to sort that shit out before I went and did more legit YouTube videos like the ones on the main channel. Tell us about Yevi and the couple of unfiction-like projects you have tried your hand out. Dreamcatcher? Emmy? What are those? Yevi was my former alias that I used for most of my projects from roughly 2019 to 2021. Right now, I mainly just associate it with my older music more than anything, but it was pretty much the name I went by before sort of realizing myself as Molly Stars. As for the unfiction projects you mention, well, those are a fucking long story. The MA videos, starting with the insane reviews, were pretty much grouped together as my first real long-term project that I did spanning from 2015 to 2021. It sure as hell reeks of first project syndrome, and frankly, it's the kind of thing I made for me more than anything. But I still left it all accessible, even if albeit unlisted, because despite it not being nearly as reflective of what I'm capable of doing now, I spent a lot of time on it, and I am happy that I pushed myself into actually finishing it all instead of abandoning it altogether, given everything I had going on throughout those years. I do still have a good idea of what I was doing with those projects, where I was at mentally, the stories I was telling, and what messages I was trying to get across with them, but when it comes to my more personal work like that, I'd rather leave it up to the viewer instead of giving you a concrete explanation. Plus, the story that I made for those goes so fucking deep that I feel like it'd be hard for me to even just explain it. There, there's a lot to keep track of there, and a lot I went through over the course of it. I wouldn't really recommend it, honestly. Some parts of it did not age that well, and you can tell that a teen made it, and some of the inspirations are almost painfully obvious that it makes me shrivel, but it's like how I wouldn't recommend sharing my angsty teen diary to people. It was something I made for me first and foremost to get better at editing and other stuff and also to tell some kind of story, even if I was winging a lot of the details at first. I had fun with it, and whatever mess that whole thing ended up making, that's kind of everyone else's problem if they want to bother trying to make sense of it. But through working on it, it let me grow into the person that I am now, and to hopefully tell stories that are miles more thought out and miles better than what I did when starting out. Humble beginnings, I suppose, if you want to call it that. Dig into it and make sense of it yourself if you want to, but I just don't feel like giving the answers out right for those, really. I know what I got out of it, so there's no need to. What kind of music do you tend to listen to or like to make nowadays? A lot of stuff, really. I've gotten much more into breakcore or jungle or drum and bass and what have you. Though aside from that, it's kind of hard to pick specific genres, but rather more specific artists that I've been inspired by. As of the time of me writing this, Alan Palomo or Neon Indian has always been a favorite inspiration and artist of mine musically speaking, as is Joji, but more recently I've gotten more interested in music from Underscores, George Clanton, Kikuo, Bowen, Ginger, and Hakushi Asagawa. I also really enjoy Vaporwave and particularly Slushwave, and listening to this mix of all of these different sounds and genres has definitely influenced where I want to go with music in the near future pretty heavily. I'd say more on that, but I'm saving it for the next actual update video I want to make for 2024. How's the weather? Very cold and snowy as usual. At least where I am right now, it feels like the snow has been falling almost endlessly. You can barely see through it. And it's not like the snow piles up more after a certain point. It's an endless limbo of a purple winter evening. It could feel pretty lonely, but it's cozy, and I have other places to visit if I ever get bored of it. I don't expect the scenery around here to change anytime soon, though. And finally, bonus round. Questions on your first Q&A video on Molly M. I hope it is not too hard to answer all these. I love your work, Smolly. Keep it up. Thank you so much, and... Yeah, God, I nearly forgot about the old Q&A I did years ago. Honestly, most of these questions I wouldn't really be able to answer now. Either that, or I already answered them earlier in this AMA. But it's funny looking back on this one. I was so happy about just hitting a few hundred subscribers. But, God, yeah, the questions I'm getting now are so much more thought-provoking by comparison. How far I've come. A random account asks, Do you prefer cinnamon or butterscotch? Both are great, but I do like cinnamon quite a bit more, ultimately. Tanner Selich asks, why are you silly? I was born in it. Lou S. asks, You! Congrats on so many subscribers! I'm sure there are going to be so many people asking the average questions, what other things do you enjoy other than Undertale, your favorite media series, etc, etc. So, I'm curious. What got you into content creation? What aspects have you found the most difficult or challenging? And what advice would you give to someone who wanted to start making analysis type content or any on the internet? Thank you. I've been interested in content creation and doing stuff on YouTube since a pretty young age, really. I think since I kind of grew up on the internet and YouTube, a lot of my inspirations as a kid and team did end up being other content creators in several different avenues. 
And especially given the fact that the thought of just making what I wanted to make and just focusing on that and making a living off of that sounded rather appealing. So ever since even the mid 2010s I've been kind of trying to figure myself out with making content in a way that would reach people and feel genuine. I think the most time consuming and challenging part of the process has definitely been just me trying to get my foot in the door. While I've definitely grown a ton in this past year, that didn't come without many years of trying stuff, it not going anywhere, and depending more on just my sheer need to create things rather than chasing a bigger following. Hell, I actually initially tried to get into doing game reviews when I really tried giving some of this a first shot. I was way, way younger then and had no experience with editing, but my interest in content creation pretty much paralleled my interest in video editing as a result. As I wanted to learn more about how to make stuff work in this field, I got better at and more familiar with editing videos. And even after all these years, I still am learning tons of shit to make it look even better. I kind of got into editing in a really weird way because while I initially was making videos for game reviews and edited around that, I then got interested in making my own web series and unfiction stuff. So I learned a lot of editing tricks there, and then I got super into making shit posts and also AMVs and shit so my editing improved in those contexts. I've improved by just doing a super wide variety of stuff, and I think at this point my interest in content creation comes not just from inspiration, but also from just a genuine need to make whatever I feel like making because I don't know what else I'd be doing and make things that people can feel comfortable watching and to ramble about stuff and analyze things that I feel like. If I don't make a video about it, then who will, you know? I guess at this point what drives me is just having a lot of brain rot for something, and honestly, I'd say that's a piece of advice I could give to people who want to pursue content creation or get into anything of the sort, is to just try a bunch of shit and not get too worried about doing one specific thing or gravitating towards only one type of content when you're starting out. There is no way of telling what might stick and what won't other than maybe a vague hunch that may or may not be accurate. So just make sure you're having fun with it and let yourself be free creatively. Do what you feel most interested and happy with doing and don't limit yourself too hard. The beginning stages of growing as a creator come from just finding your place in things and that can warrant quite a bit of experimentation before you find something that really feels just right for you. So, for not just video editing and content creation, but any kind of artistic outlet in general that you want to dabble in, I'd say just be patient, try new things, and have fun. Lord Eldrin Boing asks, Congrats on 10k! You're a late deserver with all the high effort videos you've been releasing. You've been kind of an inspiration to me and give me motivation to make analysis videos about the games I love. Thank you. My question, do you plan to make some sort of ARG or analog series or anything similar sometime in the future? Or is there already one I don't know about? You do seem to have an interest in that kind of storytelling with the way you produce your videos, and it would be really cool to see something like that coming from you if you do have plans. Thank you so much. It really means a ton to hear my work inspire others to make analysis videos and the such of their own. All the power to you. But an ARG? Right now I can't say I'm really planning on making anything of that sort. Can't really make an alternate reality game when the reality you probably think I'm making a game of isn't exactly the alternate one. I do get curious about things going on in the world, but other than that I'm just doing my thing really. Not much more to say there. Gemma asks, Hi Molly, congratulations on 10k. My question is, what is your favorite book or short story or other literature thing or some of your favorites? Also, what's your favorite blood type? I need to read more books admittedly, but a series of unfortunate events was something I read as a kid that I was fucking hooked on. I still think it's a really good book series even to this day honestly, and I'd say some of the themes and tones in it definitely have inspired some of my current storytelling and aesthetics, and especially fueled the deep love that I have for tragedy and mystery in general. That said though, I'd like to get back into reading sometime. I'm sure there's stuff that I could get into that would be just as if not even more interesting in that medium. Also, my favorite blood type is D. GJK Arts asks, How'd you figure out the design of your persona? And what was the longest you've gone without sleeping? It took a little bit to figure out the ideal fit for my videos, but I think when I settled on everything more finally, it kinda came from me just asking a lot of questions about what I liked most. I like cozy clothing, so sweaters came to mind, and because I like pastels, I mostly stuck with those for what I was going for. I also like skirts and thigh highs because they're cute, so pairing those up with the sweater gave me something that felt just right. But it does go a little bit deeper than that. For instance, I like the meaning behind forget-me-nots a lot in particular, so I like wearing one of those from time to time if I feel like it. And fun fact actually that no one's noticed, my glasses reflect in a pretty unique way. I had made them in such a way that one lens when reflecting light looks like a sine wave and the other one looks like a sawtooth wave. I mostly did this because I thought it looked cool, but also because it was the closest I could get to expressing an appreciation for music. Even the colors I decided on kind of had some thought put into them, but I could go on for a good while about that. 
I think the longest I've stayed up has to be something like between 30 to 40 something hours. I've definitely pulled all nighters before, but I don't think I've ever stayed up any more than like a day and a half in a row without pretty much having to pass out. I thought all nighters were so cool as a kid, but man, I would not do it now. Get your sleep, we all need it. Definitely not a worm asks, Will you marry me? <laughs> I'm flattered, but I'm not exactly the marriage type of gal. Never really got the hype around it personally. But I do think gowns are cute, so if you want to envision a universe where you do marry me, that version of me probably won't mind. I'm sure there's enough of me to go around. Henry Entertainment System asks, Hello Molly, I've always wondered about this. What were some of the first video games you ever played and how did they inspire your own creations? I did touch a bit on this before, but I don't actually remember firmly what my first game was, although I'm certain that Sonic Heroes was one of them, and I think it being my introduction to the Sonic series is enough on its own to be a huge inspiration for my work overall. While I'm also super into horror and mystery stuff thanks to the inspirations I would get later in my life through ARGs and the such, Something about the adventure era of Sonic games especially has just spoken to me profoundly over the years. I've never really seen anything quite like it since, and while it might not seem like it super heavily inspires my work as a whole, I can tell you I have many ideas and aesthetics that pull from whatever the fuck those games were doing. I don't know what it is, but it's stuck with me, and I want more of it, and god damn it, I'm going to make more of it if no one else will. Plus, even aesthetics aside, the Sonic series in general and Sonic as a character has always spoken to me. Something about the carefree and sort of don't wait to enjoy the things in your life kind of attitude that he has definitely has resonated with me in a very fundamental way, and I guess that kind of reflects in some of what I value right now in both my life and my creations in general. It's a hell of a series, but one that I'm happy was such a notable part of my life as a kid. Although, aside from Sonic Heroes, I think the closest I have to an actual first game to my memory might have been one of the Midnight Club games. I could be wrong, but that's like the earliest memory that I think I actually have of playing video games, so yeah. Sciency asks, Can you possibly tell us about your past before Molly Stars? Like Molly M, or before that even? What pronouns do you prefer again? And are you going to make more Deltrune content after the device theory? My pronouns, at least as far as the public is concerned, are any all. I literally do not care what people refer to me as, I am simply a thing that makes other things. As for my past, while I have touched on how much my content's changed on the Molly M channel over the years, I could answer this for you in another way. Before actually going with this name myself, I kind of had a normal life, really. I kind of have a hard time remembering my original name, actually, but my earlier years were definitely pretty eventful. I'd sort of describe them as a domino effect that would eventually become whatever the hell I am now. It's honestly a pretty long story and one that I'd like to tell eventually, but I've got other things on my plate at the moment. Although, it's odd to think about there being a before for Molly M. Is there ever a before if that name was always meant to be yours and you just hadn't realized it yet? Knowing something may not always mark the start of it. As for your last question though, I do intend to make more Deltrun content after the device theory is done. There's definitely things that might be fun to touch on even before the next chapters are completed, but you can bet once 3 and 4 come out that I'm going to have a lot to say about them. Just once I take the time to dig through each of them myself, of course. But even then, while the device theory is by far the biggest thing I'll ever make for Deltarune, there's definitely still things with that game that could warrant some smaller videos of their own, and if not that, then perhaps even content about some of the fan creations surrounding it. Who knows? Spamton Slapper 1997 asks, Sick and twisted inquiry incoming. Show us a terrible, bad, cancelled video you still have and never released? I added a question mark so it counts. I don't actually have any videos that I outright cancelled mid-editing necessarily, aside from Maybe one? I don't know, have this TF2 clip, I guess. I got the century, I got the century. Welcome to Bank of America. This is a notice from the Chinese voice department. Start with- Molly, what the fuck? 
But other than that, while I do have video ideas that kind of fall through, it often happens before I even get to the writing stage. Once I actually can make a script and audio, there's a good chance I'm going to go through with actually finishing it. Stuff only gets cancelled usually if I can't find an actually good structure for the video itself. Jacob Nelson asks, With 30 plus hours of streaming attributed just to this channel, including uncounted hours of production video across multiple channels where bits of yourself are shared, and the deep dive that is your website, do you worry about burnout and oversharing? Feeling overwhelmed at finding out there is to be another community engagement project and I'm just some guy in the audience who doesn't have to share a thing. I definitely appreciate people looking out for that. It's honestly something I do think about quite a bit. I've shared a lot about myself and have dedicated so much time to YouTube and my public presence this past year that it does kind of come to mind if I'm pushing myself too hard. I think the way I try to deal with burnout is to just make sure I'm not always working on some huge thing. Whenever I finish a proper video, I always take some solid time off and just make a list of what I want to do before working on the next big thing. Though I definitely do want to dedicate more time to just doing stuff that isn't work related honestly. Playing more games, hanging out with friends and other creators more, you get the gist. I worked my fucking ass off this past year because of the fact that I wanted to really grow my following a lot more and make sure I could keep the output at least somewhat decent since I actually started to get somewhere with all this. But I think it's come at the cost of me spending not nearly enough time on just doing stuff that's not very demanding creatively. Although, I'll save my deeper thoughts on that for the update video I plan to do relatively soon. As for oversharing, I definitely am careful to make sure I don't share details about my personal life that I definitely would like to keep under wraps for a variety of reasons. But uh, honestly, Honestly, I don't worry too much about it aside from that. Hell, I honestly did this AMA because I feel like people don't ask enough about me aside from Delta and stuff, so being able to entertain questions that felt more personally oriented and able to get me thinking about stuff felt like a nice way to make both ends meet there. So I don't mind being more open about some parts of my life, honestly. In fact, I'm rather eager to share some more particular bits sometime once I feel ready to. Someday. Alejandro, also Haytex, asks, Congrats on 10k. My sister and I watch her Deltern videos because we love theorizing about it. Question. Do you have any story in your head that you had from when you were young and you wish to be made into a movie, series, video game, or book? If so, could we get a summary? I feel like almost everybody in their little age does this and some just forget about it because they were no longer interested. But some take the time to keep it and maybe remake it when our mind gets more adult with time, hoping that one day the courage hits and starts taking it seriously. I've definitely gotten ideas as a kid that I wish I could have done sooner that I do still think about now. Although, the few ideas that I would like to see made into something more tangible, it's hard to tell if they're my ideas necessarily. Not in the plagiarism sense, I mean in a daydreaming sense. It's like sometimes as I get lost enough in thought or if I'm having just the right kind of sleep, I'll get these visions. I don't know if they're for me or from someone else's eyes, but... It feels like sometimes I get visions of an idea that it wants to be made into something more real. Or perhaps something that just wants to be heard more. Maybe they're memories? Messages? I don't know. And it feels kind of hard to make sense of it, really. I don't know if I can give it a summary, but someday I'd like to. I think even as a kid I remember getting such visions, and if I can manage to do anything in my own lifetime, it's to let more people know about them at some point. Whether I draw them, or make some kind of music about it, or whatever it might be, I'm sure the right time for it will come eventually, knowing me. I'm still getting pieces, but I know it'll have to come together into a bigger picture sooner or later. Lone Dunnan asks, How many toddlers could you take in a fight before you lost? All of them. They can fucking try. Also, nice Punishing Bird profile picture. Autumn is here asks, I've always wanted to know why you render your videos using this new unique ratio instead of the standard YouTube one. I've seen some square shaped monitors before so I thought that maybe you have one so that's why. But you also usually use the VHS aesthetic when editing and those usually have this ratio. But other videos that edit like that have black spaces on the side so they fit the standard ratio so why? I personally love it. For one thing, while I did touch on this earlier, I decided to stick with 4x3 because I realized it was something that I just didn't see very often in the video essay space or for any more digestible YouTube content in general. So I figured using it would be a bit out there but not super intrusive either on the experience so that it kind of helped my videos stand out more in the first impression. Since I imagine first impressions are kind of a big deal in these sorts of spaces when you're just starting out and I think using it as part of my branding in a way is just a neat way to make my videos feel uniquely like me and not like I'm just making a video about whatever I'm covering with no regard for personal flair. But aside from that, well, it's kind of the standard for me to be using 4x3 here really. Well, where I live at least, something about the box aspect ratio has just kind of stuck with people around here. The innovation's been going towards everything, it seems. 
I think sometimes I see wider screens around, but people have felt pretty happy sticking with analog tech and the stuff associated with that. So I guess it both felt unique and simultaneously interesting enough to establish as part of my overall style of video. Besides, I, I kinda get why it's stuck around here. It's kinda cozy, looking at it. Having it all kinda compact like this feels like it makes it a little easier on the eyes, weirdly enough. The Hooded Man asks, Why the name Molly Stars? Were there any videos that you wanted to make, but you scrapped for one reason or another? Do you wear glasses in real life, or are they just drawn for the Avatar? And thoughts on... Siva Gunner? I got the name Molly from, well, being Molly. It's just kind of that shrimple. It's a name that I felt fit me a lot, and it sounds kind of cute, so I tried it for a bit, and it's stuck with me ever since. The stars part of it is also pretty self-explanatory. I've always had some kind of fascination for the beyond and for outer space and astronomy in general. Definitely the type to find myself looking up at the night sky quite a lot even now. So, put the two together, and that's the name that I've been using ever since. I don't know, but I just felt like it had this ring to it. Something easy to remember, and something personal, but fitting enough of a descriptor for people who may not be that familiar with me. There have been a few video ideas that fell through. I can think of two in particular I wanted to do in 2022 that never went super far. One of them was a video about Yume Nikki online, actually, and another one was intended to be something of a TF2 mockumentary about the tons of weird-ass types of servers and even normal servers on there and seeing what it was that made it so... itself across the board. But both ideas were just incredibly huge and way too much for me to sort through as someone who was just starting to make videos for this channel of this sort, so I ended up scrapping both of them for my sanity's sake. I might come back to those ideas sometime, but there's no promises on that really, as both of them are definitely major videos to me. And I'd need to spend quite a bit of time on each one, so I'm not gonna get to them right now or any time very soon for that matter. As for my avatar? I mean, you're talking to me, and I wear glasses, so I'm pretty sure that I wear them usually. I suppose my other vessel doesn't really need or wear them that often, but if you're asking me, then yeah, I still wear them normally. Though, uh, it's uh, not only for just being able to see things better, I can tell you that much. And as for Siva Gunner, I think their stuff's cool. I was super into their reps for a time, and I still end up listening to some of them now and then. It's still fucking insane that they ended up commenting on my Staggering Winds video, but I'm glad I did reach them at the end of the day. The fact that so many people have contributed to making high quality reps, especially given the history of Siva Gunner over the years, is such a fascinating thing to see in the vast sea of online communities. There's a lot to talk about with them really if I were to make a deeper video discussing it. While I mostly do cover games and horror stuff, internet shit in general just kind of fascinates me, and the fact that Siva Gunner's gotten to the point it has now and has its presence in so many other things is really nothing to scoff at. It's a neat little thing to say the least. Matthew Viola asks, Congrats with 10k. Having like four really high quality video essays that have gotten to this point is really impressive. I want to ask, what's the hardest part about making these videos and what do you find, if anything, the most tedious and or frustrating part, if you would consider these separate things? Also, do you have a favorite game that nobody talks about? Thank you, thank you. I think the hardest part of making videos kind of depends on what I'm making exactly. I suppose the part that I do dread the most tends to be getting around to actually gathering all the assets and stuff for it next to the actual editing. I think with editing it's just kind of tedious and takes a lot of time when I'm super eager to get to the finish line so I can have a video ready sooner. And don't worry, I do take my time, I'm just excited to get new stuff out when I'm at that point. But with asset gathering and preparing everything, that absolutely takes up a ton of time because even the slightest discovery or development could send me all the way back to that phase and just retracing my steps for a while. It is a part of the process that can be very fun, admittedly, because then I get shit that I haven't seen other people talk about, or stuff as absurd as what I discovered with Siva Gunner in the Staggering Winds video. But for as much as I am glad to take my time with doing all the research and thorough asset gathering, god it takes a while before I can get to actually making the video itself sometimes. I suppose it's worth it in the end though. Also, even though I already mentioned it earlier, I'll already say it again since it doesn't get nearly enough discussion. Play CrossCode. NOW! Marius Larson asks, What are the top three albums of all time according to you? Of all time? Fuck, I don't know. I, I can't really give a concrete answer here because I feel like it tends to change a lot depending on my tastes. But I have definitely had albums over the years that have impacted me and my tastes really heavily, so fuck it. Because I can't even just settle with only three, I'll give my top 13 albums that, while I don't know how much they applied to being the best of all time, certainly were or are the most important to me, which in no particular order are Some Rap Songs by Earl Sweatshirt, Vega International Night School by Neon Indian, Hair of the Dog by Arthur, By the Time I Get to Phoenix by Injury Reserve, Igor by Tyler the Creator, Slide by George Clinton, 
Quinn's self-titled album, Air Nini by Hakushi Asagawa, Worlds and Nurture by Porter Robinson, I can't pick between the two, I'm sorry, Nisimona by Ginger Root, All My Heroes Are Cornballs by JPEG Mafia, and Wall Socket by Underscores. All of these absolutely have impacted me in such a way to where I don't know how I couldn't rank them up that high, even if I may not listen to them as much as I used to. And the last one is the current version of whatever the fuck kind of phenomenon these albums had me experience in general. They're all quite different, but fucking amazing nonetheless. I'd say give them a listen if you haven't already. Gilbert asks, What was the inspiration for this type of content and tone for this channel? This is a question I have touched on a bit already, particularly the inspiration part of it, but as for the tone of the channel, I guess I wanted to go for making content that felt digestible, but also cozy. When I started really getting into whatever branding I felt fit the Molly Star's name most, I honestly kind of went into it with the hope to bring some of my nostalgia for watching videos on YouTube when I was younger. Just rambling about whatever felt interesting to me and making it a comfortable viewing experience to either leave on in the background or just watch when it's late at night or something. I guess the aspect ratio kind of contributed to that in a way, to kind of call back to the time when perhaps to some 4x3 was more of the standard that you'd see on the site. Hell, if it were really up to me, I'd keep the production quality and editing quality high, but make the videos like 480p or something if I really wanted to be authentic, but I'm trying to make sure people can see what I'm doing clearly, so maybe that's not something I'm going to pull for now at least. It's ultimately just a lot of nostalgia and a wanting to make stuff that feels comfortable to watch, and if it feels like something I would watch and fall asleep to, then I can safely say that's about what I'm going for. I just want to make things about stuff I like, and I guess leaning into that and the more escapist aspects of it has always been the idea. CLB1 asks, Does pineapple belong on pizza? Honestly, I've never had a strong opinion about pineapple on pizza. I've tried it a few times, and it's alright. Not my go-to, but I don't hate it either. It's something I can get in the mood for sometimes. It's simply fine to me, so sure, I guess. Super Cat Lord asks, Do you like bananas? Hell yeah. I like most fruits, really, but bananas do feel rather on brand, and not just because they share nearly the same color as the one I happen to use for my main channel. They're a nice quick thing to have, too, if I feel like there isn't much to eat in the house at the moment. Bagaboo asks, Do you think that there is a reason that so many trans people love Undertale, Deltarune, or Homestuck? Like that's one of Toby's writing strengths or something? I can't really speak for Homestuck as I've never been into that myself, but I think a lot of it in Undertale's case has to do with not just the representation of them in both games, but also the fact that really, the games just go about gender and different characters' experiences with it in such a way that I think is really easy to relate to. I can list off the top of my head right now characters like Metaton, Mad Miu Miu, Chris, Sham, that one lion NPC that wears that dress at the end of True Pacifist and Undertale. I think that the first few examples especially go about the topic in a way that's casual and also very easy to understand. Tubby's had a really good knack in my opinion for handling more complex topics in that field in a way that's just easy to take in and serves as a really good allegory, if not a direct lore manifestation of those concepts, and I think the fact that it's done incredibly tastefully a majority of the time is something I can respect a lot. Both games feel like they don't put any pressure on the topic if that makes sense, and I think if I had to speak more heavily, I imagine especially in a world where perhaps that lack of pressure can be hard to find, these two little games are a nice escape from that in a way. It's easy to gravitate to things that not only respect those fundamental parts of you, but don't bat a judgmental eye to it in any way. I think this applies to a lot of things, really. It's that general principle that I think helped me with a lot of my own struggles when I played Undertale for the first time. And I think we definitely need more of that, but even what we do have with games like Undertale and Deltarune has done so much to aid that cause, and I'm certainly very grateful for that. More Stylish Than Thou asks, Hey, congrats on 10k. Here's some questions. Sorry if they've already been asked or answered somewhere else. How'd you get into Undertale and Deltarune? Favorite, least favorite video games other than those two? Opinion on is The Ocean Soup. Favorite books and why? The only ones I haven't really answered here are the least favorite game and is The Ocean Soup one, so I'll just answer those for this one. For least favorite game, it's honestly rare for me to really have a game that I dislike or could call a least favorite, but the first example of one that I could call that would have to be Sonic Forces. It's my least favorite game in the sense that while I do like some parts of it and I remember enjoying some of the gameplay, I don't think I've ever seen so much wasted potential for a single project before, like good god. Narratively and gameplay-wise, it had so much going for it, and yet you could tell so much of it ended up being fucking half-assed, especially when talking about stuff like Infinite's character and backstory. Bro got beat up by Shadow once and called a mean name or something and that's what took him over the edge? Are you fucking kidding me? And whatever the fuck happened to all the potential for him to be literally like the most powerful villain in the series at the time given what he was capable of? We saw like the actual extent of his powers to a severe degree maybe once ever. Ah, whatever. 
I have a lot of words about the series in general, honestly, and I know there's people in that fandom who will claim there's even worse games in the series, and I guess technically, purely speaking, there are. But in some ways, I find complete and utter mediocrity even more frustrating than something just being fucking dog water. Like, at least 06 is funny. As for your other question, I suppose why wouldn't the ocean be a soup? It does have fish in it, but I guess the bigger question would be if you count salt water as a stock, or even water by itself as a stock. If you do, then sure. But if you don't, then is it really a soup? Now the real question is, if you put a leaf in the water, does that make the ocean an incredibly diluted tea? Elemental2315 asks, Has this YouTube thing ever made you feel drained? Like, do you seem tired and feel like you have to keep doing this, or do you genuinely enjoy YouTube and content creation? P.S. Love your vids and the humor. Always gets me to laugh. I do think about that sometimes, but at least currently, I don't feel too much of a pressure to have to keep making videos, honestly. The thing about me is that even if I wanted to push myself to keep making videos against my own will, I honestly couldn't. I couldn't make something without passion if I tried, and trust me, I certainly have in the past. While that does end up meaning that I kind of just go wherever the wind blows when it comes to my creativity and what I feel like doing, at least unless I'm in the middle of some kind of multi-part series like the device theory where I want to get that done before I put much more stuff on my plate, it does at least make me feel confident that whatever I do end up making is what I genuinely felt like doing at the time. I have struggled with pushing myself to stick to a specific routine or schedule before when I didn't need to, but I have gotten better about it over the years and I know that what I am making for you guys is something that's come out of a genuine place of love and enjoyment for what I do. Plus it at least confirms to me that if I really, really wanted to do something else, I would let you all know in some way if that was the case and I would just focus on something else for a while until I'm back in the YouTube mood. I think it's something that's best to see as a thing that kind of comes in seasons. Not something to be drained by, but rather a thing I want to do every now and then if an idea really catches my eye just enough. I'm cautious, but I know my limits, and I know if I am drained at any point, I'll make sure I take care of myself for a while so that I can bounce back as I usually tend to do if I'm ever in a slump of that sort. Plus, with some of the ambitions I have, sometimes I feel like it's worth it to step away from YouTube to put more focus on some of those ambitions, which I think is the better call, compared to trying to balance literally everything at once. I guess for me, the key is that I take it one thing at a time rather than several, and it's got me this far, so I intend to keep it that way. Donut Cat Jr. asks, What was a forgotten hobby that you had when you were younger that only recently, or after reading this question, did you realize has helped you? As an example, I used to badly custom model amiibos for a few months. Nowadays I actually like to make ROM hacks and resprites. I learned that painting over and editing pre-made characters was fun. Hmm. I think a hobby I used to have that I kind of tuned back into in the past few years was just writing in a journal and making lists in archives in general. I don't know what it is, but making lists of stuff has scratched this specific itch for me that, while it's usually pretty mundane, it also feels so weirdly productive. Whether it be making lists of my current projects, a to-do list, or maybe a list of my friends' birthdays, making a list of every D&D session I've had, or every OC I've made. I think making archives of stuff and keeping everything tidy is usually the kind of go-to thing I do if I really have nothing else going on. I think ultimately, it's the kind of thing that just gives me direction when I feel like I don't know where to go next in a way. Whether it's me finishing a video or some other bigger project or just wanting to see how things have changed with a particular idea over time or even just wanting to have a good backup of all of my work over the years. Being able to keep in order of stuff is usually a nice way to detox for me as personally. It makes what is otherwise the complete mess that is my brain and thought patterns make at least a bit of sense and I'm glad I never really abandoned the archivist in me so to speak. Alt name 7 asks, do you think you're going to get this Q&A out quicker than Jaru's? Well, originally I was going to answer this with just an I don't know, but as I'm clearly recording this well after Jaru has uploaded his, I guess we all know the answer to that one. 600 questions though, Jesus Christ, dude. Person Person asks, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Man, that's tough. It depends, but it's always either chocolate chip cookie dough, cookies and cream, or coffee flavor, both with and without chocolate chips. I did see this peppermint flavored one recently though, and that might end up being a new flavor once I try it. Did I mention I really like peppermint? Just in anything? I love peppermint. The Frog asks, Congratulations on 10k, I have a question. Do you know who Candace is? Or Dee's maybe? Oh, I know them quite well. But I have been trying to learn about, about something that you guys have. Would you guys happen to know about a thing called penny trading? Yeah, never mind. Blair Belarus asks, How do you deal with the infamous lettuce goblins? It takes one to know one. USB asks, Liquid or solid soap? Liquid soap for the sink, solid soap for the shower. Devlin McGuire asks, 
you are now an influential Deltern theory tuber, despite not even uploading a theory yet, or the main theory at least, device theory. Why do you think device theory struck a chord with so many fans despite you only covering the info about the game up until now? There were quite a few questions you asked aside from this one, but because I'm so far into the YouTube ones and I'd like to not talk too much about Deltern in this AMA from here, I'll just answer this one. Honestly, I'm kind of even surprised myself that the device theory got so much support before even making the theory proper, that being part 3. In a way, it's like the theory is kind of like something that's being unintentionally hyped up to now rather than the only thing that people are interested in, and I think it's such a unique position to be in right now. My main guess about why it struck a chord with so many people, I feel, is that because of the fact that I've been covering primarily the meta-narrative aspect of the game, something that I think before then only really felt like it was being discussed offhandedly for more lore-focused theories, and stuff that focused more on the practicality and the literal aspects of the game, than me making pretty much nearly four hours of content so far about just the meta-narrative part of the game, more or less, especially with it having stuff that I've seen many people say that I haven't even heard a peep about before watching parts one and two. I think that the discussion of something that hadn't quite had its time in the spotlight alone is something that got people very invested, which is what I was hoping for admittedly. As I even said in part 1, half of the purpose of this series was to just be a huge compilation of info about a specific part of Deltrin's design, and the other half is the theory itself. So I sort of think unintentionally, especially because of how well parts 1 and 2 did, that it sort of resulted in this thing where people, while they don't know the theory itself yet fully, do know all the surrounding context behind what led to me making the theory in the first place. And I think something about that, especially when it's about something that people might not have been thinking much about to begin with, just grip people in just the right way, in the manner that not even I had imagined. I don't know, but it's an interesting place to be in as a creator in this space, and one that I am ultimately glad to find myself in. It makes me all the more motivated to work on part 3, which I swear is gonna happen, I've just had a ton of work on other things to do ever since doing part 2, but as we are in 2024 now, part 3 is going to be one of the first things I'm setting my sights on making. You can trust me on that. But yeah, it's interesting to think about. An odd thing, but certainly not a bad thing in my opinion. It makes me happy to see people so invested in what I'm doing and in what I have to say, even if I haven't quite revealed everything yet in the theorycrafting side of things. I just hope I can make that theory feel worth the wait once it's done. <laughs> Miri asks, You wanted a random question? Should Northern Ireland join the Republic of Ireland or stay in the UK? And here's the boring question, how is or was your student life? For the first question, I honestly am not super well informed on that topic so I can't give a take that will reflect the nuances of it, but what I can tell you, given my own beliefs, is in pretty much any case, I'd say, down with the monarchy, personally. As for the boring question, eh, my student life wasn't anything that special, really. I did have a time where I performed better than most other people in my class, and then high school came around and I kinda just stopped caring about grades. I mean, I had good relations with most of my teachers and even some classmates, aside from maybe some bullying here and there, but I, I don't know, they put so much pressure on people to get absurdly high grades for college and the such, and I think given a lot of the other messy shit going on in my life at the time, and an overwhelming sense that college just wasn't going to be the path I'd feel comfortable going down after finishing school, I just kind of became too jaded to really make a big deal about grades. Keep in mind, I didn't like flunk all my classes or something, I still did okay by the end, but... For as smart, or at least as good at following instructions as I can be, I guess my experience boiled down to me just wanting to use that energy on more interesting things. Like this channel, for instance. Or literally anything else. Or learning stuff in a way that doesn't suck the fucking soul out of the process. The Epic Cheetah Hurricane asks, How do you feel about the unexpected growth of your channel? And are you bull? Honestly, it took a while for me to really get used to the sudden growth of my channel, but ultimately I'm incredibly happy about it. While it has been quite the shift for me to get used to really actually having more of my own community compared to before, it's something I've wanted for a really long time and I'm not going to complain about it happening too quickly, honestly. I've been preparing for this kind of thing well before any actual growth had happened, and I guess what I really feel now more than anything is just feeling like I'm actually in my element for once more or less. It's new, for sure, but I can't imagine myself really being anywhere else in life right now. It's what I wanted and where I felt like I wanted to be, and I don't want to think too hard about it beyond just making sure I'm not letting the parasocial side of things go unchecked. Now that I'm more used to it, I think I just want to go with it and continue being happy with it as it hopefully continues growing even more over time. I'm just curious to see where things go from here. Also, I don't know what bull means exactly, but if it fits the definition I could find of it generally meaning being super chill or not giving a fuck, then sure, I guess I'm bull. I don't know. Dusk asks... If there's one obscure piece of media you could bring attention to, what would it be? 
I tried thinking of something other than a game for this one, but it was honestly pretty difficult too, so I'll pick another game that I think I don't see nearly enough discussion on. That being, Luca, Born of a Dream. It's a sort of 2D, kind of Souls-like action RPG game that I remember playing years ago that I really enjoyed the art style of, and its mechanics and story were super interesting, honestly. Its overall atmosphere is just super fucking unique, and I think it's even getting a sequel sometime in the future? I'd like to replay it sometime soon, but I remember it being a pretty fucking cool game when I played it, if not a bit difficult, but still really fun. Maybe give that a look if you're interested. Ben M asks, Question. What's your credit card number? What? You said anything. Well, I'd tell you, if I had a credit card, that is. Not that I can't get myself one, but money just isn't a concern for me in my current state. I don't give a fuck if it's illegal, I don't need to see the price tag to exist anyway. At least, I don't. My Earth Vessel does need to worry about money, but you're not asking for their credit card number, you're asking for mine, which doesn't exist. Mimi asks, First, what's your general aesthetic? What's the sort of artistic principle that you seek to embody? Weird glitchy mashups or grainy found footage-esque clips or whatever there is, how does it all mesh together? Second, where do you think the future is headed in terms of artistic movement? Decentralization of creative media has been a big thing recently. Will it go further? How will it evolve? What common themes will underpin it all? I feel like I don't often try to aim for a specific message or idea with my aesthetic as much as it's just this mass of ideas and different things I've tried over the years, all coming together into whatever it is now, but... I think the way I try to think about it all meshing together is some mix of a nostalgia and comfort, but simultaneously mixing that in with a sort of structured chaos. I feel like everything I do is in a place where I try to find some middle ground between having a clear structure, but not necessarily sticking to a formula either. Sort of in a way where it might seem super all over the place on the outside, but if you dig deep enough you'll just see that it's simply built different, but with its own unique intention rather than throwing structure to the wind. You'd be kind of surprised how many of the seemingly random details actually do have some meaning to them, just not one that I'm willing to explain to others. It's kind of like a magician never revealing their secrets sort of thing. I guess with that, the closest I can come to having a main principle is there being a structure to the chaos. A detail is only there if I feel like it has a meaning of some kind in the bigger picture, and what I imagine is only worth including if it's a piece that is meant to connect to other things. I think going with such a broad idea is what kind of lets me use so many different vibes and styles depending on what I'm trying to do without it feeling like it's straying too much from my own creative identity. As for your second question, I do definitely think there is a sense of creative media becoming less and less centralized. As executives and higher budget stuff continuously struggle to respect those who are passionate in this field and more fires are being lit under their asses to at least ask for the bare minimum in benefits and compensation for artists' hard work, I get the feeling that sentiment could reflect a lot in fictional works in the future. With games especially, I've seen this phenomena play out where, at least to me, I feel like I've become significantly more interested in indie stuff or double A stuff at least than I am interested in the triple A stuff. There's some high quality shit I'll still be interested in, but the line between those games being actual games rather than just being an $80 advertisement for something you already bought that has a somewhat barely functional game included in it has become concerningly blurred over the years, and I think people are only going to continue to get fed up with what that part of the industry has become. Unless things turn around immensely in that part of it, I get the feeling that more people are just going to turn to indies and to smaller studios and teams for more cohesive and, most importantly, more meaningful experiences. Not just in games, but in media as a whole. And when you pair that with some of the things that I know have been going on in that world in particular, and tensions rising in several aspects, I personally think we're in for a wave of some particularly intense works creatively. I'm not someone that thinks that negative emotions are the only way that something can be good, but negative emotions and frustration tends to be pretty strong most of the time. And at least if I can speak for myself here, I can see a lot of stuff in the future that's going to feel very fight or flight. Stuff that reflects a lot more on the nostalgia that people may have had for when things felt simpler, or stuff that's going to feel like a massive gut punch in relation to current events and offer some more striking commentary on it. Creativity is never in any shortage, especially in hot waters. And if I can say anything about how I want to contribute to it, if there's many themes of rebelling in and wanting to stand on your own feet by any means necessary instead of being afraid of the rug being pulled out from under you by some force that doesn't actually care for your well-being and just want to think about how to make a better world, I'm willing to bet those same feelings of yearning and rebellion will reflect in the creative sphere too. But I might be wrong there and that might just be me. I'm curious to see how all of these circumstances will shape people's beliefs and thus their approach to creativity as a result of that. But in any case, decentralization seems to be the direction things are going, and I think we're going to get a lot more voices that aren't afraid to either be more bold, or be more carefree with their ideas. 
In any case, that repressed passion is gonna bounce back real fucking hard someday, I feel. Temmie asks, Rape Beaver is on a 1 to 10 scale, at least an 8, perhaps even a 9. The Better J asks, What's your social security number, your mother's maiden name, your first pet, the street you lived on, the 16 digits on your credit card, and your full government name? Damn, most of that info of mine doesn't even exist anymore, so I couldn't answer even if I wanted to. But I can tell you that I used to live on 82nd Street and my first pet was a little hamster, I think. I don't know, I had a lot of pets. There were cats, a few dogs, at least a few bunnies too, but I'm pretty sure my first one was a hamster. Michael Brown asks, I spend hours listening to Deltarune videos in the background and I feel like I have good ideas. But whenever I think about making a YouTube video with my ideas, I get overwhelmed at the idea. I feel like your channel is relatively new and I'm curious how you even get yourself to start. You're obviously very skilled with editing, which I'm sure helps, but what is your advice for people with theorist brains and no YouTube skills? I haven't really thought about the more technical side of this question, having an idea that sounds cool but not really having the experience to edit a video about it. I'd say, at least in my experience, video editing is very much its own medium of art. It's kind of like learning to draw or animate or learning to make music. You kind of have to roll with the punches and not overthink too hard about making something perfect when you're starting out with that. Like you're going to probably end up doing something in your first video that you'll look back on and think was really cringy, but that's not something that should discourage you. If anything, I say this because naturally, if you find something you did before to be cringe, chances are that's because you know how to do it much better now. And that means you're only going to get better at it as you keep going. I'd say to start, if you want to get your gears kind of moving more with how to go about the video editing side of things, think about content creators whose editing style you really enjoy a lot, or perhaps think of something that maybe you don't see a lot of aesthetically speaking in the broader YouTube editing space. Figure out why you find it so appealing and give it a shot. Don't expect to make something perfect, but as long as you can make something that you know came from what you enjoy most about the medium, even if inspired, I think that's a good start when it comes to making videos. Fuck around, try stuff you think seems cool, look up tutorials if you have to, and just have fun most of all is what I'd really say to that. I wish you luck if you do decide to go for the amusing roller coaster of hell that is using a video editing software. Doctor's Art Stuff asks, Hey Molly, congrats on the 10k. I was wondering what is your favorite ARG or what ARG has had the most impact on you personally? Plus I just wanted to say I really do enjoy all your videos and you're up there with my favorite YouTubers. Edit, and if you know of it, what do you think of Toho Project? Thank you so much. My favorite ARG or web series by far has to be Pets Cop. I would have said maybe Marble Hornets or something, but Pets Cop is just so important to me, especially after revisiting it over the past year and seeing Expo's analysis on it. While I would love to make a video about it myself sometime, seeing what other people have said about it honestly has me feeling happy enough to not really feel like I have anything else to add to the bigger conversation surrounding it. Between the general aesthetics that the series has, the out there and yet intriguing writing of the characters, the way that so much of the storytelling is done through what isn't told directly to the viewer and rather is done so off screen, the tons of different mechanics that the actual game uses, it's treading this perfect line in my opinion between feeling super authentic to the time the game took place in and yet being just absurd enough to make it have this otherworldly aspect to it. To where the paranormal parts of it, so to speak, feel more like a haunting echo of the reality of the situations that the series presents rather than the actual cause of those situations, if that makes sense. And with its themes of childhood trauma and psychological abuse and how the series portrays those themes, it's just fucking impeccable to me. I could go on forever about it honestly, but despite how many series I feel were inspired by Petscop over the years, very few, if not none of them, have captured that punch that Petscop's storytelling and writing seems to have. I don't know how the fuck the creator does it, but it's all told in such a way that feels so natural. It's like he's mastered the art of telling a story through literally any way other than feeding information to the viewers. And I'm fucking impressed at that ability. I think that's what fascinates me most about the series as a whole. It doesn't ask you to understand it because it's not solely directed at you to begin with, and that's not something that I often see in the web series field. But it kind of ends up feeding even more into the viewer's curiosity for what peaks the family chooses to give them and what to make of it. Of course, it's not going to be for everyone because it is admittedly a really slow burn, but that's at least how I felt about it in its presentation. It's intrigue through obfuscation done fucking perfectly, and as someone who's all about that kind of mystery through obfuscation and the details being deliberately hazy, I love it. I just love it so much. But I think I'll stop myself there for now before this becomes a whole other kind of video. As for Tohu, I don't know too much about it other than aside from all the bullet hell stuff, the plot is basically just that there's a lot of magical women that really fucking hate each other, and I think the fact that that's the most knowledge I've actually retained about it is really funny regardless of accuracy. Other than that, I should get more into it sometime honestly. Also the memes are really fucking good.
Lorekeeper Oblivious asks, Have you ever participated in full-on ARG puzzles, and if so, what was your favorite? I've definitely tried my hand at a few of them. I think one of the earliest ones I remember being in on was the Gravity Falls Bill Cipher ARG, if anyone remembers that, where everyone was trying to find where the fuck the Bill Cipher statue shown at the end of the finale was. Other than that, I've definitely dabbled in some Slenderverse ARG stuff, that is a very long story of its own, and I do have some fond memories of, but for aforementioned reasons about Slenderverse stuff I won't really elaborate on for now. Most recently though, and probably closer to a favorite of mine, I've been digging a little bit into another Deltarune ARG-ish thing that's been going on called Hometown Incidents. The creators have even reached out and sent me a link to a server where all the real puzzle solving is actually going on, and what I have been able to solve of it has been really fun. It's nice being involved in an ARG that hasn't already been solved like fucking months before I ever got around to it for once. Omniscurity asks, You hinted at a help tale video on the future. I kinda wanna know if you are actually going to do one or are currently working on one. Currently, I'm not working on a help tale video, but it is something I've considered. If I feel like doing a slightly smaller video like the Staggering Winds one, then I may give it a more thorough look. But I can't promise anything, as currently my priority with Viz is this AMA video, the update video I want to do for 2024, and of course, the Vice Theory 3. So I'll see how things are like once all of those vids are done and after I get some much needed rest once the Vice Theory is complete. G-Man is Eggman asks, What are your thoughts on Knights and Samurais? Which ones do you think are cooler? Like with the GLaDOS question, why do we have to pit bad bitches against each other? They're both so cool. Why not both? I mean, I guess if I had to pick between the two of them, I have always really liked how Samurais looked, even if I do think armor can look really fucking cool too. Something about just having a sick-ass blade in kimono does kinda click with me more. But still, I shouldn't have to pick sides in this, this is so fucked up. Stuff asks, How has life been in the year or so since you started your channel? Any big shakeups to how you go about things and such? Hope you have a lively day. Here's to 20k. Thank you. It's definitely been quite an eventful year since the channel grew more especially. I've had a lot of time to think on it as I've mentioned before, but I'd say the main thing is just that I feel like I've become a lot less aimless and much more motivated to just do things. There have been some lower points admittedly, mostly for unrelated reasons to anything involving my online life, but I will say that the support I've gotten in the past year, and the confirmation that my stuff is something that people want to see more of, has been a huge boost for me in a lot of ways. I think also because of the fact that my work is actually reaching people now, it's also given me more room to think about possibly adding more stuff into my life that isn't just work related. You'd think that with me growing so quickly that I just want to work even harder and dedicate even more time than I already am to working on videos, but I know how often that kind of approach leads to burnout, and I'd like to avoid that if I can help it. It's been this careful but comfortable journey towards just balancing my work-life balance more and making sure that I already appreciate what I have right now and just go with the flow rather than push myself excessively. And I think I'm still figuring some stuff out about my public presence and how I want to go about stuff even now, but it feels like it's all been coming together rather smoothly. Overall, a few bumps here and there, but a lot to get used to now that I actually have a community to look after, but all in all, I couldn't be happy enough to be where I am now and to see how things have gone in the past year. I'll mention this in the update video, but 2023 has been by far the best year for me creatively in terms of making progress and reaching people. And I think I'm going to look back on it very fondly, even if I don't intend for it to be my peak, let's say. I'm happy and grateful and most of all, excited to get even more stuff done for y'all in the near future. But also feeling like I can take my time just a bit more now. In short, I'm learning as always, but I'm doing well. Meme asks, Rouse a best boy? Indeed. I've been talking to him Kali. Ancient Nani asks quite a few questions here, so I'm going to do a similar thing I did to an earlier one and just answer a few of them based on what I get after spinning a wheel. I'll pick just three out of the ones given that I can actually answer meaningfully, starting with... Was there any series or show you initially were looking forward to but disappointed you? Honestly, it's rare for me to feel disappointed by something. It does happen, but it takes a lot for me to really feel let down by a piece of media in general. Most of the time I feel pretty happy with something just for what it is or what it was trying to go for. So to that end, I don't really think I have anything I've ever been disappointed by outright. I usually tend to find something to like about most of the stuff I watch. Any gripes with the general Undertale Deltarune fandom culture or community? That's interesting to ask. I feel like for the most part I've never really had any gripes with the community at large, but if I had to really think... I guess one thing I do worry about is the potential for people's expectations of the game to overshadow their appreciation for something like Deltarune just as is, or as it was intended. I feel like that's kind of naturally a drawback to having something like it be done in installments and having several year gaps between them, but 
I think back to even when Toby said that Chapter 5 wasn't going to be included in the next drop anymore and how that might have upset people who were hinging their theories so much on the idea that the game has to drop again with the next three chapters and that it going up to Chapter 5 has to confirm or mean something or else it's bad writing. Hell, that's kind of the main gripe I have in general is when people use that term to describe why something wouldn't work. Because what I deem to be bad writing might be entirely different from what any of you deem to be bad writing. I hope that when the game does drop proper, then people can have a good ability to just throw their preconceived notions of the game out the window and just enjoy it for what it is. Especially when you consider how Chapter 1 was structured specifically to fuck with people who were assuming this would just be Undertale 2. I think trying to write off some possibilities as being bad writing or being upset that your idea didn't come true even though its only prior basis was standing on pretty thin ice to begin with could take away from just enjoying the funny video game for what it is and what it was always trying to be. Besides, if your ideal view of the story doesn't turn out to be the canon one, why not just make up your own story with that idea? That seems a lot more fun than trying to convince people that some completely different person from you is going to do that exact idea instead. What techniques do you use in your video making process, glitchy effects, etc? Oh, there's a lot of techniques I tend to do in my videos that I've caught on to. Aside from the VHS filter that I use, which is through a plugin called NTSCQT, I suppose a lot of the techniques I use mostly just have to do with how I sequence everything. For instance, with the other emotes of me that I use, I tend to just copy-paste GIFs of those emotes into the video for as long as I need to in the timeline. Also, a lot of the work I do with moving stuff around and doing transitions and shit in my videos kinda comes down a lot to exact numbers. Especially when it comes to emotes, I find it easier to just look at the exact numbers of where it is, like the X and Y positions or whatever, and paste them into other instances of that emote so that it stays as consistent as possible and doesn't look off in any way. Generally, I think a lot of what I do in the actual video editing is pretty standard stuff, nothing too special aside from maybe the static transitions where I put a mosaic filter on some of the static overlays to make them more crunchy, and kind of make my own chromatic aberration too by layering one instance of the static over another at lower opacity. Though, I think the best technique that I can really talk about more here would be data moshing, that being how I manage to do the more authentic glitch effects you see in my videos sometimes. I'll give a little tutorial about it here that's purely audio because I don't want to make a fucking tutorial in the middle of an AMA, but I do like the techniques so I'll ramble a bit. There is this extremely jank as fuck program called Avidimux that I use for data moshing. In short, I export the bit I want to data mosh, put it in Avidimux, set the video type to XFID, and in the iframe interval setting, I just spam a bunch of nines. Iframes, if you don't know what they are in this context, are the frames that handle sudden changes in scenery in a video, like cutting from one clip to a completely different one. After exporting that, I then put that new vid into Avidimux and then delete any iframes that I want to get rid of aside from the very first one at the beginning of the video. You can also copy and paste P-frames if they happen to be between a few B-frames to produce a different effect. And after exporting that, you'll get a video that, congrats, you have data moshed. If you got iframes, then the transitions at those points won't be a hard cut, but rather this sort of one clip ripping a hole into the previous one or surfacing from it in a really trippy kind of way. Or if you did P-frame stuff, you'll have parts that freeze but have this effect that I can only describe as kind of like what happens when you look outside of the map too much in a Source Engine game. It's really fucking cool, but it's not the only way to do it. See, another way that I do it, and it's usually the way that's more effective for transitions or more intense stuff, is through directly editing the video's data in Notepad. What I'll do usually is make a version of the video in Avidimux that'll export through something like MJPEG, and then open that exported video up in Notepad and use the Find and Replace tool. You can just put any two letters you want in the Replace With section and then type any combination of another two letters in the Find section. Then you just kind of rinse and repeat with the, you know, just like any other combinations of two letters in the find section until you feel satisfied, or unless you save the video and see that it's not actually showing a preview thumbnail of it on your computer, in which case you've probably gone too far and you should undo a few of those replacements. This is what causes more intense glitching in the video, as you are literally corrupting the file to produce this effect. However you choose to go about it, it's fucking cool to me and I hope that my rambling about it is a nice explanation of the technique. There may be others I could bring up, but I've been on this one for a while now, so I'll move on to the next question. Ivy Lemon Drop asks, 1. What media did you consume in your childhood, and how do you think they formed how you are today? 2. How would you describe your personality? And 3. Do you daydream often? About what? Are they negative or positive daydreams? I've talked a ton about videos games that inspired me, so I think I'll focus on TV shows for this first question since I've surprisingly not brought it up until now. There are a lot of shows that I'm sure have inspired me a lot over my younger years. I think Sonic X was one that I look back on a lot, but I tend to lump that in with how Sonic in general has inspired me a lot even now. 
But for other stuff, the cartoon trifecta that is Adventure Time, Steven Universe, and Gravity Falls pretty much fucking ruled over my teen years for a hot minute. And each one for different reasons, I love all three of those shows so much. Gravity Falls, I think, only further fueled my interest in horror, mystery, and the more kind of campy elements of those genres, but also especially kickstarted my interest in ARGs and cryptography. I'm sure if you watched it, you'll know exactly what the fuck I mean. The reverse messages in the intro to each episode, the end screens and encoded messages at the ending of each one, the way each end screen connected into those like bigger images in both seasons that told a larger narrative of its own, the fucking Bill Cipher statue hunt that happened after the show ended. It was so fun, and I'm so happy there was a show that really got into those concepts in a way that was easy for me and other kids at the time to learn of and have fun with. Steven Universe, while I do look back on it knowing some of the flaws it had, whether it be the pacing, how some characters may have been handled, or animation inconsistencies, I think was especially important to me in my earlier teen years when my brain was really starting to mature a bit and open up to broader ideas like what the fuck gender means and exploring love and relationships and pacifism. I kind of associated with me getting with my current long-term friend group too, as me getting into Steven Universe had been not too long before that. And I also attached myself to Steven a lot as a character back then. I think it's a huge reason for me becoming more interested as well in exploring some parts of me more personally, and I feel like I owe a lot to that show and its characters for that. And even with it being one of those shows that's been in a lot of hot water on YouTube especially, I firmly believe that in any case, that show walked so that other shows that aim to explore similar themes in the future could sprint. And Adventure Time. God, I could go on about that one forever. I love the world building in it, I love the humor, I love the narrative, I love how the characters pretty much grow as the show develops so it feels like it's growing up with me over the years. I love the music, I love how fucking cozy it feels, I love everything about it. I'm sure there are things about it that can make it imperfect given just how much of that show exists, but I genuinely feel like no show has done it quite like Adventure Time has. I do still have to watch Distant Lands and also Fiona and Cake as I'm writing this, but I'm willing to bet that when I do watch them, I'm going to love those series all the same as I did the original show. All of them have inspired my aesthetics a lot in different ways. All of them for their handling of characters and developing them, Gravity Falls for the mystery and cryptography, Steven Universe for its themes and more escapist nature, and the fucking beautiful backgrounds and designs within it, and Adventure Time for its larger world building and overall art style. And not only that, but I can't be thankful enough for them being what I watched as a kid, because what I think each of them taught me was so important in the longer term. Steven Universe especially kind of taught me a lot in the realm of being able to understand things that I had trouble with wrapping my head around back then, and the way that Gravity Falls handled growing up and Adventure Time handles some of the more existential ideas that it presents, they have all definitely impacted me immensely as a result and shaped a lot of my current beliefs. I'll always have a pretty soft spot for those shows in particular. Oh yeah, and Twin Peaks! That shit inspired the hell out of me when I watched it as a teen. Anything by David Lynch in general is sure to interest me. I think his stuff really got me into the vibe of doing stuff not to go for a specific meaning, but just working more off of pure feeling and surrealism. And I've definitely also adopted his habit of just not wanting to explain the meaning of anything I do as a result of it. Plus, Twin Peaks in general and its aesthetic has definitely inspired some of the more ordinary yet just slightly off-kilter vibes that I want to go for in my own personal work. I nearly forgot to even include this in this question, but it's absolutely a notable inspiration for my stuff and formed a lot of how I want to go about making art, as well as how I want to approach the reaction to that art and what people might ask me about it. In short, it made me 100% fully pro-death of the author and I love it for that. As for the second question, I don't know. I usually have a pretty hard time really describing my personality. I have been told that I'm nice to be around generally, I guess, and also that I'm easy to talk to, I think. That and I suppose also me being the kind of person that wears my heart on my sleeve a lot of the time, which I could agree with. Aside from that, I feel like my personality has always been just kind of closed off but not antisocial necessarily. Like I only really talk if I'm spoken to or if I really feel like I need to say something worth adding to a conversation, and also I always tend to want to hear people out and so I guess that makes me empathetic or something. And of course, I ramble a lot and have comments about a lot of the smaller things that interest or peeve me, so I'm kind of a nerd and maybe I have a bit of an attitude or something sometimes. I don't know though, because any of that might change at any moment. I simply just exist without thinking too hard about in what way I'm existing. And for your last question, I definitely do daydream quite a lot. There's only so much I can only really do in the confines of my cabin or when I'm doing any busy work, so I often do find myself in my head quite a bit. When I do though, it's usually pretty mundane stuff. Unless it isn't, in which case it's kind of like the visions I mentioned having sometimes in another question. Except a little more brief, like I'm catching the tail end of those visions before going back to reality and not having enough time to really process them. 
They feel both negative and positive, it depends. Sometimes it feels nostalgic, but other times it feels more somber, more melancholy. In either case though, there's always this yearning. I'm not really sure how to describe it other than that, a yearning. I still kind of wonder what they are exactly, and to this day I spend a lot of my time trying to figure that out. Money Too Smooth asks, When can we expect the LEGO Fortnite stream? What is more radioactive, the elephant's foot or the demon Corman explosion? And what was your reaction to Brian's death in Family Guy? I'd do a LEGO Fortnite stream if I cared for Fortnite at all, so I don't know, I guess I'll do it if I ever for some reason decide to irreversibly alter my current status of having never played it in my entire life. LEGO Fortnite does look pretty fucking cool though, I gotta admit. For the second question, I don't know, you tell me. I'd say the Demon Cormet explosion was probably more radioactive just thanks to the sheer amount of shit released in that instance compared to the elephant's foot that's just kind of been existing ever since it was created. But I don't know, I might be wrong. Experts, please help. And as for the last question, his death was tragic. I'm sure he would have loved 10,000 Gex. Zansa Claus asks, If you can make a game, or if you are already, what's your idea? I want to hear your pitch. I'm currently not really making a game, as videos have kept me a little too busy for that, nor do I really feel like I have any ideas for it currently. I do know someone though that might have some words on that, but I tend to be pretty hands off with speaking to other people in this world. That, and I'm sure they'd like to still stay anonymous about it for the time being. Astra Adams asks, Congrats on 10k, you deserve it. Questions. How would you rate your experiences with gender? In an alternate universe, would this channel be called Sly Mortals, Small Story, Massy Troll, or Lost Mr. Slay? Trans writes, If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, doesn't make a sound? Doesn't matter? What ratio of people on each track for the trolley problem would there have to be for you to pull the lever? I'm intrigued by how you will be answering these questions because of what you said at the end, so I gave you a bunch. Looking forward to seeing how this goes. Thank you. For the first question, it's definitely been a bit of a journey. For a while I had no questions about it, then I kind of started realizing it wasn't as fixed as I initially thought, but I think my overall experience with it has boiled down to what I would call ultimately not really caring what I am as long as I'm myself. It's kind of why I settled on just calling myself unlabeled or not really feeling like any one set of pronouns or whatever fits me fully, because truthfully it doesn't really feel like any one thing fits all cases for me. Labels are definitely useful, and I know how it's helped others figure out their identity, but I think my experience with it and with self-expression in that regard is kind of like Radical Edward from Cowboy Bebop. Or at least how Watanabe addressed it. It's gender is meaningless, we don't need it. I don't really think the what of my identity matters, I'm simply Molly or just myself at the end of the day, and whatever the fuck it is, I just want to keep being that and not force myself to conform to any standards that any label might unintentionally assign to me. Because really, the only struggle I have persistently had with people is that I don't like any traits aside from just my personality and beliefs being used as stepping stones for people to assume stuff about me that just does not matter. Like the whole, oh, you're XYZ traits, so that means you must fulfill all of these criteria that makes someone like that. It's, it's fucking stupid, why should I conform to any of that because of an arbitrary label? Again, I think they can be absolutely useful, but my experience has been to try and do away with any specific names for my whole situation, so to speak. Because I want as little to do with people just setting expectations on me that have no business being there as possible. Just because I may appear one way doesn't mean I have to fulfill your ideal of what that kind of thing is supposed to be. Hell, I find the rare hate comments in that regard to be funny because it does nothing to me as a result. I can't be ashamed of or insecure about something that I deliberately have not identified as. Especially when I identify as the complete lack of identity. Wait, 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 wait what are you gonna tell me? Oh, you're nothing. Yeah. But also, when it comes to my work especially with art and YouTube, I try to make it less about me and more about the work itself so that it can exist free of any boundaries that people try to arbitrarily set on it. Too often, even with the rejection of limitations and boundaries on this sort of stuff, I find people unintentionally setting their own limitations of what counts as being a certain thing, and I think that's something I want to actively avoid if I can help it. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. I've never felt like I needed a final answer in my identity, and in a way I've embraced the lack of an answer as being sufficient enough. If I know generally what I want to make myself happy in this regard, then how necessary is it to have a name for it as long as I just know what it is in some way or another? Keep in mind though, this is just me. I stress that other people do find a lot more importance in labels and in having a more firm answer because some people do need that ground to stand on, or some people genuinely identify that strongly with those labels. I just happen to find myself happy to swim personally rather than finding a specific boat to stay in. So I just exist as the lack of anything and the abundance of everything simultaneously, I think. 
I'm whatever the fuck you see me as, and that's going to be true whether or not I try to find that answer for myself, so I'm not worried about finding an answer to begin with as a result. For your second question, I think my channel being called Sly Mortals seems to most right for my channel name if it wasn't in another universe. I could even check right now, but I'm a little too lazy. Maybe another time. For the third question, absolutely. Trans rights. For your fourth question, who knows? If people swear that they remember a name being spelled one way, but it was actually spelled another way, does that make their memories all collectively false? What makes something exist or change its existence despite the memories and acknowledgement in their collective consciousness either overlooking something or misremembering it altogether? I personally think those sorts of things do matter, because surely, if someone believes that strongly that something had to exist differently than how it actually does, how does finality and objectiveness prove anything? For a time, surely some of those things could have very well been true, and we just haven't thought that hard about it yet. It's easy to miss changes when you go about life assuming that nothing changes at all. Our perception isn't as reliable as we might think it is, so what makes us the final arbiter of whether something truly exists? Something could always be covering a few things up without us even noticing. Though, I think it does matter. The least you can do is ask more questions. And for the last one, honestly, I don't care how many people are on the other side of that damn problem, as long as an executive or billionaire is one of those people, I'm pulling that fucking lever. Horatio Crunch asks, What's your opinion on video games in general? Well, they're the medium that I have the most experience in, so I think it's not a stretch to say that I have an enormous amount of appreciation for them. It's fascinating seeing how far they've come even just in my own lifetime so far, and I think removed from the context of the game industry as a whole, it's just fascinating to think that there is a medium that pretty much is the culmination of so many others. Writing, music, programming, even some aspects of film and cinema and animation depending on what kind of game you're making, all of that stuff is required just to make the experience work, and that's not even taking into account the raw gameplay and interactive element of it. It's so easy to get immersed in them as a result, and I think that a video games' ability to take you somewhere else so easily is something I've grown only more fascinated with over the years. I could go on a lot more about it, but that's the short of it. They're engaging, they offer experiences that I don't think any medium could really offer, and they're responsible for some of the most important inspirations I've gathered over the years. I feel like I know them more than most other mediums too in regards to the do's and don'ts of how to go about making one, and that's not a connection I can really say I have so closely attached to other mediums. They are neat little things, and next to music, they are the most important medium to me personally. I'm happy to live in a place where they exist, frankly, and I hope that they can only continue to offer more experiences unlike anything else. Just as long as it's allowed to exist outside the grubby hands of out-of-touch corporate greed and innovation for the hell of it. That's really the only worry I'd say I have, is that I just want people to be able to make what they want to make and not worry about the rug being pulled from under them. Yoey asks, Hottest Undertale slash Deltarin character? How could you ask me such a question in public? That's so fucked up! I don't want to answer this in a way that's just fucking weird given I'm sure there's people watching this that definitely shouldn't be hearing such scandalous things. But I will say that I totally have a crush on Alfie so that helps, so that would also mean I find her the hottest, but like, tastefully. She's a nerd like me, and I tend to find people of similarly nerdy or passionate nature pretty cute. I guess that also doubles as me answering the question of what my favorite Undertale character is specifically. She's just gotten so much hate over the years that I feel is undeserved. Alphys is just such an interesting character overall, and I really like what was done for her to confront and eventually develop past her struggles over the course of the game's true pacifist route. I don't often see characters like her really get that kind of thorough attention to work past their own inferiority complex or feelings of imposter syndrome and guilt. And I guess I relate a lot to characters who eventually learn to stand on their own two feet and face the music rather than live in the shadow of someone else or in the shadow of the things that they regret doing. She's so cool, I love her. A normal meat person asks, Congrats on 10k and thank you for becoming a YouTuber in the first place. Everything you do is part of the most intriguing art I've ever seen and something I look forward to whenever I can. The cues. Who or what inspired your art style and general aesthetic for this channel? And what's the most persistent physical object you own? Thank you for your time. You're welcome and thank you. I think I've answered a few questions like the first one already, but as for the second one, I feel like I could give a lot of answers to that as I have kept quite a lot of stuff from my earlier years with me, but I suppose the most persistent object I have, just based on how long I've kept it, might have to be the yellow scarf I've been always wearing. I think I've had it ever since I was just a little kid even. Something about its color and material just felt perfect for me, I guess? And, I don't know, it hasn't really worn off at all despite how long I've been using it. Can't really imagine me going without it at this point. Jan Sipiki asks, Questions. Are you Malin or Balin? What's your favorite Toby Fox character? And how did you become a fan of Undertale? Fuck it, we maul. I already answered the second question to some extent, so I'll answer just the third one. 
I honestly got into it pretty simply. I first played it on the Switch when it released in 2018. I had known of Undertale for a while, I think it was kind of inescapable on the internet at its peak, but I never really had a huge interest in it until 2018. At the time, I was not doing very well mentally to say the least, and was really in the middle of a lot of intense emotions as a teen. But I learned that Undertale came out for the Switch, and upon also learning that there was this weird Deltarune thing that was also happening suddenly, I figured, fuck it, why not, I'll give this game a try. Only really knowing vaguely about there being a few other routes to the game, and maybe some final boss stuff, somewhat. Yeah, no, Sans was also just kind of inescapable. I'm pretty sure anyone going into it after 2015 knew that, you know, Sans was like a final boss to some extent. And to say the least, I kind of got the Andrew Cunningham what was so good about Undertale anyway treatment where playing it completely changed my brain chemistry irreversibly, but I think ultimately for the better. I could go on a ton about it, but more or less, I got hooked onto it because I just happened to play it at a more vulnerable time in my life, and since then it's held a really special place in my heart, and the same goes for Deltarin, especially given how I feel like I'm kind of growing with its development as it's still ongoing. The little Blue Jay asked a lot of questions, so this comment's also going to be getting the wheel treatment. I'll be answering five questions from this based on what I get. Do you catch yourself in your own traps? On rare occasion, yeah. I tend to find that if I do catch myself that way though, then it's a sign that I did a good job with it. How does it feel to have such incredibly large muscles? Does it restrict your combat ability? I'm not sure how you knew that I could shift into that kind of body type if I wanted to, but it's a funny form to be in sometimes. It definitely can have its drawbacks, but you kind of have to know that going in, trading off flexibility for sheer strength. How would you feel if you knew a friend was keeping something from you? Eh, as long as it's not a case of someone deliberately waiting to blow up on me if it's some kind of grievance they have with me personally, I don't really care. People keep all sorts of secrets and I'm not obligated to know every single thing going on in someone's life even if I consider them a close friend. Of course, if it's something that's bothering them, I try to ask and make sure they know I'm here to listen if they need it, but I'm not owed that transparency if someone just doesn't want to be open about it, whether that be an if or when sort of deal. Have you ever thought about what you would look like if you were a human? I guess I already know what I would look like if I was human to begin with, so there's not much room to think about it. Though in any case, I don't think it'd be anything all that special, certainly not far off from how I do actually look anyway. I'm pretty alright with it as is. And finally, cereal before milk or after? I've always done cereal before milk. Easy. Seppo Co. asks, Have you drank water today? Of course. I always drink at least a bit of water, as I'm always carrying a pretty large jug of it with me around the house as I'm doing stuff. You're not going to catch me dehydrated anytime soon. Todd asks, Amazing that you reached 10k. Not something like a lot of people have the dedication to do. But here's my question, and sorry if I get philosophical or sappy here, but have you ever had any sort of lucid dream about life-changing experiences of the sort? Similarly, anything just plain weird? P.S. If there's anything too personal to say, refer to anyone as Joe. Oddly enough, lucid dreaming doesn't occur too often for me, though the few instances that it has occurred have definitely been notable. The one time I remember it most was I think I remember it being deep in some forest and I eventually had the thing where I did realize I was, in fact, dreaming. But I went with it and decided to go further in. I would even retrace my steps occasionally, going back and forth and just wanting to see these woods as far as my mind could possibly explore them, until it felt like it went beyond even that somehow. But eventually, I went far enough in, and I remember hearing the sounds of nature so vividly here because it sounded like it was happening backwards. And I eventually found myself in a clearing. And I swear, I remember seeing something in the middle of that clearing. I don't know what it was, it, it looked like nothing but everything all at once, and it was too blurry from where I was standing to be able to tell. Just as it seemed as if it was going to speak to me, I woke up. I do remember one thing it tried to tell me though, that it hoped I won't have to meet him. I still don't know what that was supposed to mean to this day, but I don't think I've had a lucid dream like that ever since. Mel1364 asks, What's up with the Yeru's New Low video series thing on your Neo City site and second channel? Are you planning to make something big for it or turn it into an ARG or something? As far as I am aware, you haven't really made an independent video about it on this channel, but what I assume is its logo shows up at the end of all your videos, including this one. Either way, I'm intrigued to see what you do next. Ah, that. Yeru's New Low is a database of sorts. I use it to keep track of what I have and haven't done. There's not much more to it than that, really. It's mostly for my own personal use. Currently, it only really uploads whenever I finish a bigger project. X Mario Killer asks, 
What's the weirdest, the most stupidest thing you have theorized in Undertale or Deltarune? That Chris summoned a demon in the bunker and that's why they know what's in it and why they're afraid of it. I will not elaborate. Octonero asks, who made the avatar? Do you plan to cover other games on this channel? And have you played one shot? In order of what you asked, myself, yes, and yes. I Like Bubbles asks, are you the kind of person to buy 100 pairs of shoes and wear them once, or are you the kind of person to buy one pair of shoes and wear them 100 times? Oh, definitely the latter. I do have a few pairs that I don't wear too often, but I usually find myself getting a pair of shoes knowing I'm going to get a lot of use out of them generally. It just kind of makes more sense to me. Edgy Leaftail Geck asks, How do you arrange your break beats? I struggle with that. I mostly just chop up the actual samples myself when I'm arranging them, and I don't really have a firm formula for how I do them currently, aside from just kind of winging it. It depends on what I'm going for, and a lot of my decisions when I'm handling that kind of sampling are super spontaneous. Although there are some specific sounds or ways I chop samples up that I notice I like to do a lot and lean into often when I work with breakbeats and the such. Meeper asks, I must know, soup or salad? I like both a lot, although I think salads are the more widely applicable of the two. Like, I enjoy soup a lot, but I often end up having a soup by itself, like that's a meal on its own and usually have bread on the side where soup is the main thing. And if we're talking about how much it'll actually fill you up, I think soups are the better food of the two for that. They're cozy, they're warm, and they're good for you. So I can never talk bad about them. But salads you can have with pretty much any meal. They're an ideal side dish for if you don't really know what else to have on the side with whatever you're mainly eating. It's good with meat, it's good with breakfast, it's good with just about anything, and I like the versatility of them for that. Soups are better for their sheer ability to fulfill you for a while, and salads are better for how widely they can be applied. Swastik Swayam asks, Congratulations on the milestone, Molly. You deserve it, plus more. What are some games you're really hyped for? Which game truly got you into gaming? And was there any point where Undertale and Deltrin clicked with you, or was it instant? I already answered stuff similar to the second question, but for the first one, I'm definitely also pretty hyped for Everhead 2, mostly because I'm just terrified of where the fuck they're even taking the story from there. Like, okay, yeah, it never ends in Everhood, I get it, I get it, but still. That game's ending felt pretty damn final to me, I'm genuinely curious where it's gonna go from there. And, of course, me being excited for Deltrin pretty much goes without saying. Aside from that though, I don't know how many games I'm particularly hyped for currently. I think the closest I have to that right now is the Eastward Farming Sim DLC that they're doing. That looks really fun, and I like Eastward a lot after playing it, so I am keeping my eye on that. For the last question, I do vividly remember specifically everything from the end of the core section being when Undertale really clicked with me. More particularly, the end of the Metaton fight where he gets called by Naps to Blook, the whole new home segment, and Judge and Hall sequence, I think all of that stuff together is what really made the game click for me, and when the game really started to tug at me emotionally. And it only got more intense from that point on. And for Deltarune, I'd say it clicked with me pretty damn quick since Undertale already had me hooked, but I think honestly the hometown segment after doing Chapter 1's Dark World is where it all started to kind of occur to me just what this game could turn out to be. Since I got into it in the survey program days, I think the end of chapter 1 just left me with this feeling of me realizing just how much bigger this game could get. And the vibes of the ending with the overall aura that Hometown gave me just really set it in as something that's completely unique compared to what Undertale was doing. Like, those themes of nostalgia and curiosity being fed by what Deltarune was trying to do felt present even then, and I think that's just fascinating to me, honestly. X asks, How did you get to know Andrew Cunningham? Might you be included in a future Thurry discussion show with him and others? It's been ages since the last one. It's nothing special, really. When I started working with Halfbred Chaos and the sweepstakes also happened not too long after that and thus the Delta cast as a result, Halfbred needed help with editing their part of the Delta cast, and I took the opportunity to help. Which led to me joining the server where they actually discussed and did the Delta cast itself. From there, I pretty much had an indirect connection to them, but I never really felt like it was a big deal, although by the time I did release part 1 of Device Theory, I did decide to share it with Andrew and a few others just for the hell of it because I was rather proud of it and wanted to be like, hey, I did this thing I like, yippee. Which wasn't exclusive to me, you know, like I would see other people in the server like doing the same, so I figured, you know, why not? And then everything just kind of snowballed from there. Since then, I've talked with him and even streamed with him occasionally, and I'd say we're pretty chill. It's still pretty surreal to think that I've reached the point where I just kind of know other creators like this now, but creators are just people like myself to begin with, so I feel like I've always been kind of whatever about that sort of thing. I try not to make a big deal about knowing people who happen to have a larger following than mine or whatever. As for your other question, if referring to another Delta cast, honestly that's not up to me. 
It's more so optimistic slime if he wants to do another delta cast sometime, or if not him, then whoever is going to end up doing another one if that happens. Though if another one does end up happening, I'd be more than happy to join in on it. Internet Cryptid asks, On a scale of 1 to 10, how interested would you be in becoming an incomprehensible mass of flesh that corrupts the minds of the youth with its silent yet deafening screams? Who's to say I'm not already such a thing? At minimum, an 8. Zero Retro Zero asks, What if Undertale was real? Would that be fucked up or what? What would you do? I'd ramble with Elfies about gizmos and anime. It's just that shrimple. The advertisement asks, What is your single favorite line from Undertale? And on top of it, what's your favorite line from any video game ever? I think for Undertale, this seems like a pretty popular answer to me, but despite everything It's Still You does hit pretty fucking hard. I can't really think of a more well-written line than that given the context of it. But if we're talking for video games as a whole, it's hard to say because it depends if we're talking about like funny lines or ones I just remembered or ones that I think go the hardest. But the thing that comes to mind first that definitely is a favorite would have to be the entire fucking monologue that Angela does at the end of Lobotomy Corporation. That is the single hardest fucking monologue I've ever seen delivered in a video game up to this point, no questions about it. Blackout asks, Can you do sick epic triple killer backflip? I can. But it was so cool that the footage of me doing it got corrupted. I don't think reality can handle what I'm capable of. You hate to see it. Jodo asks, Congratulations for 10k. My question to you is... I forgot it. Sorry to hear that. It happens, I swear there's some kind of entity out there that just happens to steal questions and thoughts right as I were about to say them. Just one of the many anomalies of these worlds, I suppose. That Matt asks, Are you top or bottom? Damn, you wanna go there, huh? I mean, you're asking me, not my other vessel that occupies your world, so it's not like I care. That said, both. Nautilus asks, Congrats on the 10k. What question do you hope nobody will ask? I'm pretty open about most things, so it's not like I can really think of a question that I straight up would want to avoid. The closest I have to that is anything that's just super deep into Deltarune theory hell, because that's what I talk about on the streams anyway. And I feel like it'd kind of take away from the point of this AMA being more about asking more personal or general questions rather than asking me about super specific theories and shit. Kind of a time and place thing for me. Other than that, I don't know. I've been pretty comfortable with just about every question asked, and I can't think of any that I'm afraid of being asked about. Just about anything is fair game for me. Lemon Planter is another user that asked a metric fuck ton of questions, so you know the drill to the wheel with you. I'll be answering five out of the ones you put in. Where would your dream vacation be? If I could manage being somewhere even more remote, maybe near some woods, near some mountains, any, any time of the year really, at some kind of nice, homely looking sort of resort or hotel, that definitely would sound good. I don't know, taking a vacation anywhere sounds nice, ideally somewhere that's more temperate. If it's got a pool, sauna, some places to just fucking relax, a pretty trail to explore, and a few nice local restaurants nearby, I'm happy to take it. Even though I already do live in a pretty remote area, I've never really gotten sick of it. The coziness of being this far out is always something I'm happy to find myself in, so really, if I find a place that's somehow more relaxing than here, then I'd pick that as a dream vacation spot, I suppose. Where are you on the Aphantasia scale? Honestly, hard to say. I know I can imagine things, it's not like it's impossible for me to describe something that I think of in my head, but unless I'm dreaming, I don't literally see it. I can describe the details, I know what a thing should look and sound like, but I don't get the actual, literal vision of it. At least I can't do it consciously or intentionally so. It's sort of like how with music I similarly can't tell a note just from hearing it right out the gate, but if I were to condition myself just enough to recognize what a note sounds like, I would eventually be able to grasp the melody of something or what specific note is being played. I can tell you it's supposed to be XYZ thing because I can make a few more connections to it. It's not perfect vision, but something relative. That's kind of where I'm at with that sort of thing. What video essay or deep dives do you like to listen to, since yours are on my list now? I usually tend to enjoy more horror-focused deep dives, I've noticed. Either that or just weird internet rabbit holes in general. Often I find myself really curious to learn about either more web series or fucked up events that happen in the world, or maybe abandoned websites and obscure media that hasn't been fully unearthed. Sometimes I'll watch a video about some wild history shit too that kind of borders on the conspiracy side of things but isn't like completely lost in the sauce so to speak. It's pretty broad, but I guess I like learning about the stuff that's more eccentric, bizarre, or otherwise not really understood or known by a lot of people. How many questions were you expecting for this Q&A? No more than half of what I actually got, I can definitely say that much. Like, good lord, I didn't think there'd be this many submissions, especially submissions that pretty much group a fuck ton of questions into one comment. 
Which, to kill two questions with one stone here, I certainly should have expected but somehow didn't, but I'm certainly not complaining. Compared to previous times where I've tried to do this sort of thing, I would get like a single digit amount of actual questions, so I'm glad that so many people actually had stuff to ask me and stuff to really make me think about with this one. That said though, yeah, definitely was expecting a lot less than what I got. And finally, is there a skill you wish you were better at? Probably animation and 3D modeling. Those are two things that I know I have an interest in, but Blender especially is one of those programs that I just cannot make any fucking sense of currently. I purely can only use it if I'm watching a tutorial about something specific that I want to do in it. I really would like to learn 3D modeling more though sometime, and animation, I know I definitely have a lot of ambitions that it will involve getting better with the latter at least. So while 3D modeling is something I'm interested in, animation is the skill I'm probably going to prioritize and wanting to improve on as it seems more widely needed for what I want to do in the long term. Both for videos and for personal projects. Rick Fernello asks, Is there anything you would change in the Undertale slash Deltarune story? Anything already established or that should have been established to make the story better or more comprehensible? Also a different question, but what would be an idea or suggestion you'd have if you could add something more to Undertale or Deltarune? Congrats and thanks for the videos. For the first one, I kind of have a hard time answering this honestly. I didn't really find myself thinking, oh, if I did this I would do it so much better most of the time, and with what we currently have of both games, I'm completely happy with how each story is told as is. I can't think of a way to make them better if I tried, and for Deltarune especially because it's not even done yet, I kind of can't say how, or if I could make it potentially better until it's actually done. That said though, Chapter 6 of Deltarune should absolutely just be a fucking Yuminiki fan game. That's the only theory I have about the game at that point, is I hope it just fucking opens RPG Maker and you're now playing as Ralsotsky or some shit like that. Buttercup Cat Productions asks, What's your most mundane yet vivid memory that holds no apparent importance but you feel strong emotions looking back on? Feel free to pick more than one if you've got a few. New Year's often tends to be a kind of mundane-ish memory that pops up a lot for me when thinking about answering this. Not the countdown to a new year itself though, but rather some hours after that. You know, when you've somewhat processed that it's a new year and maybe you've just kind of gotten all the presents you may have received, if any, and you're just kind of sitting in it as you think about how to start the next 12 months of your life. I remember specifically lying down once when I was upstairs in one of the houses my parents and I had been staying in while house hunting some hours into New Year's. There were a lot of visitors over that time around and there was this uh, kind of fake disco ball speaker thing that we had on. I remember the light show coming from it that splashed red, green, blue across the walls and ceiling while listening to everyone talk and coming down a bit from the partying. I don't know what it is, but looking back on that brings me a lot of nostalgia. Maybe it was some feeling of accomplishment for getting that far. Maybe it was some realization that everything would be alright. Or inversely, maybe I felt like things wouldn't feel that good again for a long time and that I should appreciate it while it's there. Or some mix of all of that at once. But it's a memory I'm glad I have is all I can really say about it. It didn't feel like life changing, but it felt like a moment where I was in some ways at peace with everything for just a bit. And for some reason, I feel like I'm trying to pursue more moments like that in my life the more that I think back to it. Chris asks, Do you think you'd ever livestream or record your editing process? Your style of editing is very cool and inspiring and it would be interesting to know the process of it. Keep up the good shit. It would be fun to try that at some point, but I doubt that I'll ever do it honestly, or rather, I doubt that it would go well. I often need a lot of focus when I'm editing stuff, especially when it comes to listening to my own audio and making sure everything is timed just right. And I feel like if I had to look after a chat while I do that, I wouldn't really get that much editing done. The closest I can think of would be perhaps something like me streaming a project file for a video that I already had finished, maybe? Like just going through a vid that's already done and maybe showing how I did some more specific bits that were really cool to do. That actually kind of sounds like a really good Patreon benefit now that I think about it. I should probably do that sometime. If you ever want to let me know what to think about that, feel free to. But I definitely don't see myself streaming my process while I'm actually in it. I struggle with my focus as is without a stream going on. Insectophobe asks, Okay, I will be straightforward. Are you queer or is Molly just a mascot or original character? Because damn, those boobies don't lie. I'm not sure how me being queer and me being a separate individual from my Earth vessel relate to each other, but I find this question extremely fucking funny because of that, and from the end of it, I'm getting the impression that the question you're trying to ask is, do you find it weird if I think you're hot? I think the former in any way honestly kind of goes without saying, but speaking specifically as myself and not the person that you think is behind my creation, whatever that means, I do find these kinds of comments flattering, even if funny. 
Given my current circumstances and the fact that to you, I am merely fiction, or to answer your other question, I am an original character, I am unbothered by really any interpretation about me. Let's not get it twisted, of course. On my main accounts at least, and on YouTube, I am aiming to be a for all ages kind of creator on here. But I don't feel uncomfortable either at all with any more, let's say, intimate content about myself, the person in the corner of your screen, or otherwise people finding me attractive in that way. The only stipulation is that, of course, keep that more mature discussion about myself or whatever I may do to its own space for adults only. And if you're the creative type, if you want to, say, do something with the concept of me that is of that sort, don't tag it with just my main channel name, for instance, but something else. I'm not going to give a specific name, of course, because that's just kind of asking for problems, but just something else. I'd like to be kind of hands-off about how you go about that. I'm not encouraging it, of course, but I'm not discouraging it either, because it doesn't really overstep any boundaries for me. Just make sure it's not easy for just any random person to find an accident, especially people who shouldn't be seeing it, whether it be for age reasons or just someone not wanting to see big badonkers when they just want to find a ref of me or something. Otherwise, sure. Literally any fan art I get is something I cherish a ton, even if it's of the more adult variety. Just don't be explicitly weird about it in spaces where minors are going to see it easily, and of course, don't go DMing me with sexually charged advances or expecting to be yoed anything from me of that sort because then that's when it gets kinda of fucking creepy if I don't even know you personally. You don't need to get personal with it if you just think I'm hot. Aside from that, feel free to go off. Joker Doom asks, What kind of games or media are you into that you'd never cover on the channel? I think the only kind of stuff that I would never cover, even if I do enjoy it, would be things that I just don't have anything interesting to add on to the discussion of. Like, something that I really enjoy but just can't really find something to warrant making a video about it. Either because I think it's too out there for me to explain or simply not interesting enough, or even maybe because someone else already made a video about it that put it better than I ever could. It's hard to think of anything that I concretely would never cover though, like regardless of circumstance. It all depends on what's got me thinking the most, but usually I just don't cover something if I feel like I don't have anything new to add if I were to cover it to begin with. Rebels fan asks, Molly, 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 and Molly again. There are a literally same name of human, cartoonist, video game, movies, music, and etc, etc. Only your names. Don't you think too many name to you? Well, what can I say? Molly's just a nice name that I happen to pick. I do find it funny that it does actually pop up a little more frequently than I first would have thought, but it's a good name and I like it. And I find it funny if I see it used to refer to someone other than me. But if you mean me using my name for too much of the stuff I work on, well, I do happen to use other aliases for my work a good chunk of the time. Molly Stars only really applies to my videos and to my more recent music. But for most other things, you can expect a different name to go with it. Nick Delisi asks, What would you say your favorite ARG ever is? I'm a huge fan of the Portal ARG. Also, I know it's pretty much a dead end at this point, but I'd love to know what you think about the Cicada 3301 stuff. That's another cool thing that early internet had that you don't really see nowadays. I did answer this first question already, but I do want to say that I think Cicada 3301 was really fucking cool. You definitely don't see stuff like that around nowadays, and I do wonder what ultimately came of Cicada after all these years. It's one of the many mysteries of the internet that I can't help but still ponder on just what the hell it was ultimately all about. If it was genuinely for a cult or just some big ARG stunt and nothing more, I don't know. But I would like to see more weird shit like that out there, honestly. Cicada 3301 was really unique for whatever it may have been going for. Also, to go back to the ARG question, if you mean specifically an ARG by definition as in it kind of needs like an interactive element in order for things to move forward, I guess the in, I guess the inscription ARG is probably the closest I could actually think of to that. That's like recently a favorite ARG of mine, even if the plot to it is kind of wacky, admittedly. Other than that, though, I mean, yeah, honestly, I think the Portal ARG is also just another favorite. Period. Lulu nineteen ninety seven master asks, "What ship or fandom or uber specific fandom thing do you consider the most bizarre obsession you've had?" I feel like the closest I can get to an answer for this would be when I was a kid and was super into AMVs, specifically like Sonic AMVs. That was my fucking jam back then, genuinely, I love that shit. I don't really know how bizarre it actually is, frankly, but it's definitely the most I've ever participated in the more kinda carefree aspects of being in any fandom. And even well into my teen years, I had an interest in those sorts of edits for other things like Steven Universe or Gravity Falls. Syncing up stuff to music was just such a cool fucking idea to me, and it still is to some extent, so for sure it had to be my obsession with that if anything. Sham Lincently asks, Congratulations for the 10 plus subs, Molly. Well deserved. First, what are some experiences from your childhood or your life in general that have defined you as a person, even unpleasant ones? 
Second, what are life advices that you think young folks need to hear in this day and age? And finally, any words of wisdom to people like me starting out or who wants to start content creation? The only one of these questions that I haven't already answered to some extent is the second one, though I will say for the first one at least that I do have quite a lot of experiences that I could share. But I do sort of intend to save some of those more personal experiences for another time rather than spilling out all my lore into just this AMA video. But for the second question, I'd say my main advice I could give to younger people in the current day is this, even if I'm not really that much older than some. Try not to get too sucked into the bad things going on. Especially in a place like the internet where bad news spreads incredibly quickly and it's easy to get lost in all the noise and fear that comes of it, remember to just dedicate some time to doing literally anything else. It could be playing a game, it could be hanging out with friends, it could be simply just taking a walk. I feel like in the past few years especially, it's become so easy to think that things are only going to get worse because the brain naturally will attach itself more to negative things over positive ones, because it's trying to find a way to defend itself from those things. Be aware, of course, but don't feel bad for wanting to have your own place to go to to try and get away from all the noise for a bit. This doesn't just apply to online, but in general, don't spend your energy on things that you know you're going to feel bad about if you'd rather nurture yourself. You've got time to take care of yourself and be aware of things happening around you. Aside from that, I'd also say especially on the topic of the internet, please learn to lie more. You do not need to share every detail about yourself. You do not need to share your triggers. You don't even need to explicitly share that much about the things like your age or gender or the like. Anonymity online is still, and in fact is especially important now at a point where data is collected about you all the fucking time. And there's still plenty of people who may try to take advantage of those who are none the wiser. Hell, probably even more than the older internet for as clean as the modern internet looks by comparison. Only share more personal stuff if you absolutely have to, or if you really truly trust the other person. Otherwise, make shit up. Don't overlap your online life with your personal one, you will think yourself later the more you do it. And overall, you've always got more time than you might think you do. It's easy to get in a rush about wanting to accomplish a bunch of goals early in life, but your life only starts here. Hell, it might not even really start until several years later. You had plenty of time to figure out where you want to go in the long term, and you don't even need to have a super orchestrated and long-term plan to begin with. As long as you know what you want to do with yourself right now, nor do you have to decide on only one thing. Life is way too long to be limited to doing only one specific thing or one profession for the whole of it. There are tons of possibilities for where you might go in the future, and I think the more that you embrace that, the easier it may be to deal with change in general. This might not apply to everyone, of course, but I'm just speaking from my own experiences at least. Amber Sunset asks, How much do you think of your past? Would you consider your past self or selves essential in understanding yourself as you are today? Are there many times in which you can recall wanting to be the you that you are now? I think of my past quite a bit. Not so much that I feel like I get lost in it, but I definitely think about it enough, as reflecting on the past with a more developed mind and more mature understanding of things can be really important in figuring some heavier shit out mentally. I do think that in that introspection and in the experiences that my past selves have endured, it's all been incredibly important to understanding myself as I am now. I like to think of my life as sort of being in different eras, while I start just being the current larger era that I consider myself to be in, and so far have no plans of seeing an end for. But in that, each era has certainly taught me something instrumental about how I want to go about my life. Had it not been for what I did, what mistakes I may have made, what good things I experienced in those times, I wouldn't be who I am now, and that applies to anyone, I feel. But I can say that there definitely have been many times in my past where I recalled wanting to be where I am now. Maybe I didn't think of myself as going under my current alias, but I knew after a certain point that I wanted to be... here. That I wanted to be doing whatever I'm doing now. It sort of was a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way, or at least I know exactly what I didn't want to be when I got to this point. I wanted to reach my adulthood in such a way where I wouldn't be regretting getting there like I saw so many others do, but rather embracing it with open arms and not wanting to go back to the good old days as I always hear it described as. The concept alone of being so unhappy with your future and just yearning for the past constantly just baffles me. With what I'm able to do now, what I've learned, and how much I've improved on myself as a person, why would I ever want to go back to when I had a worse self-esteem, a worse outlook on things, and when I figured that certain mistakes that I hadn't made yet were okay to do? Why go back to being an objectively worse person? At least, that's my perspective on it. I know back then that I wanted to be someone that would be happy about the time that's passing for them, and happy about getting as far as they did, and it makes me happy to say that I got here. 
feeling that exact way, feeling like I could go back and tell those past versions of myself that what they wanted was in fact what they would get after all, despite everything that may be dark about the world that currently exists. It's like I wanted to be more positive out of spite ever since I was a teen. And spite is a hell of a motivator, so I'm happy that I didn't let myself down there. Baron, 2004, asks, What is your favorite memory related to playing Undertale? Are there any specific fond memories you have? Moments or experiences? I do remember specifically when I first started playing it. We were out in a house in the middle of the woods and it was pretty far into autumn so some snow had been falling. I remember playing through the ruins bit at least in that house and drinking peppermint milk or coffee for the first time around that same point. So in a way I kind of associated peppermint and especially peppermint coffee with it as a result. I was feeling pretty bad about myself not too long before playing it and I just remember not feeling great of course but I do look back on it very fondly because of how it all sort of unintentionally came together. Playing the game and drinking something nice all while it was cold and snowy out. Maybe I didn't know it at the time but that felt like it marked the beginning of a point in my life where I started to hate myself at least a little bit less. So thinking about that makes me feel pretty nice. Jcat asks, Hi Molly Stars, may I ask two questions? 1. I'd love to know what your favorite colors are. Your art and editing always has such a beautiful style and I love seeing the colors and design you incorporate in each video. 2. Have you ever made music? And or would you ever make a playlist and share it with viewers of your favorite music? I found songs I never heard before and now love that you've put in your vids and I really enjoy your music taste a lot. So somewhat selfishly, I'm asking in case there are more hidden gems I could discover. Finally, wishing you much comfort, rest, coziness, inspiration, and wellness for the rest of the year and the new year. Hope you can stay safe from any illness. COVID cases are horrifying right now, so masking with respirators and filtering air and having lots of airflow is super good practice. And as someone who got permanently disabled by the virus, I recommend. And that you know how appreciated you are and how many people you inspire with your work, words, and art. P.S. If you can ever add your video scripts as closed captions, me and other disabled viewers would be forever grateful as I unfortunately injure myself trying to understand without captions because of disability, but so dearly love your videos and want to rewatch them again and again. I understand it's a lot of effort, perhaps someone can help you with doing that? Or even little by little? It'd mean more than I can put into words. Hope it's alright to ask too. Picture me bowing to you in my wheelchair. Have a beautiful winter, Molly. Thank you so much, your words were awfully sweet. I'm sorry to hear the virus got you so fucked up though, it's scary how unpredictable it really is because it varies so much for people just kind of feeling like they got a minor cold to much more worrying effects. But I hope you've been taking care of yourself despite all of that. While I answered the first question already, I guess I can take the second question as a free opportunity to promote the fact that I do in fact make music. Although I have gone into some of the specifics of it earlier in the AMA, I do still intend to continue making music, especially in light of the new year. I've got Quite a few plans for that in fact that I'd like to finally act on once I feel freed up from the realm of making video essays for a while after part 3 is done. As for a playlist of my favorite music, the closest I can give is a link to my personal playlist on Spotify of my top songs of the year. Or in other words, just the songs that apparently I listened to the most this year. I think it's a pretty accurate profile of my taste if you want to scratch through that and see if there's something you like in there. Also, I apologize for taking so long on the captions. I genuinely do still want to get around to them and I'm planning on getting some people on to help with speeding up the process of making them. I even got a good ways into Part 1's captions a while ago but I got swept up with a lot of the other stuff that I wanted to knock out before I felt like working on Part 3. But I will try to dedicate more manpower and time to them and hopefully once I get the help of a few people, I'll have some of the show for it. I know it's generally easier to watch stuff when there's something you can read rather than just listen to, speaking as someone who has struggled with auditory processing myself. So I promise I'll get to them soon, especially since there really isn't much else I could do right now other than personal stuff for working on part 3 and the update video. But thank you for your patience and support regardless, it means a ton. Asosasus asks, What is your opinion on Bob, the guy hiding under your bed? Just kidding, my actual question is, do you like licorice? Bob's chill. He doesn't always hang under the bed, but I honestly don't mind either way. I'm at peace with the entities. Also, I haven't had licorice an awful lot, but I don't think I ever remember hating it. It's an okay snack, not my go-to, but honestly I wouldn't be mad if it was given to me. Candy's candy to me regardless. Shroomy asks, Where and when did you acquire your current taste in colors and fonts? I think for my colors, I acquired my taste in them thanks to a mix of being into shows like Steven Universe and also being super into the Sonic games and just generally really vividly colored series that I was into as a kid. 
I can't be completely sure where exactly my taste in them all came from, as I think it sort of was a result of a lot of things, really. But I've always been into stuff with colors that really popped, even if risking eye strain in the process. You can probably see in my earlier work that I really leaned into that vibe, and even if it was definitely a bit much at first, my inspiration from AMVs and all the stuff I already mentioned certainly played quite a part in me just having this fondness for pastels and neons, so my taste in it had been developing at least ever since I was a teen. As for fonts, I think it honestly came from my fascination for ARGs and web series, and also I guess just older analog tech, so it also must have come from my teen years. For the longest time, I started out using that VCR font that every fucking web series uses now, and I think from there, my taste in them pretty much just evolved into a bigger appreciation for crunchier and like pixel art looking fonts. I do like font styles aside from that of course, but I guess pairing my love for ARGs with my love for technology and retroish aesthetics in general kind of resulted in me growing this taste for fonts like the one I'm using now. Something simple, but that feels very clear cut and rigid regardless. I guess there's something about appreciating a font when it embraces its more digital origins, technology that knows what it is, that feels like vaguely brutalist? Like purely function over form. I know the stigma with stuff like VCR fonts is it's used for horror and for spooky shit, but for me it genuinely just brings more of a comfort. It knows exactly what it is, and it's not trying to pretend to be anything else, it just gets to the point. And I think that's what makes it so appealing to me compared to using most other fonts, though there could be plenty of other reasons for it that I just haven't realized yet. Because at least for fonts, I've been working purely off of gut feeling of what just looks the coolest to me without thinking too hard about it. But I think that's at least the gist of it. Purpley Pen asks, what are your thoughts on Yuma Nikki and One Shot? They're both incredibly important games to me. Yuma Nikki defines so much of what indie games currently are in my opinion, and so much of the stuff in it still holds up incredibly well. Especially given the sort of resurgence when you think about how stuff like Dreamcore or Liminal Spaces have become this sort of big deal in the past few years. But even aside from that, it spawns so many fan games like Yuma Tuki or Dot Flow or Someday all of which offering these unique takes on the idea of turning your own dream diary into a game that makes them each feel fun to go through. It's genuinely a cornerstone of horror and surrealism in modern gaming, and it deserves all the respect it gets for that. Hell, this even leads to how important One Shot is to me, because aside from obviously how well-written it is, how fucking awesome the meta-narrative and fourth wall elements are used, and Nico being genuinely such a good fucking protagonist to see the game through, and how emotional I still feel well after already having finished it fully, it's a special game to me for sure, but even the creators behind that game kind of came from the larger community that Yumaniki developed. Go back far enough in Night Margin's videos and you'll see she used to upload a bunch of OST vids and fan art and the animations of Dotflow and other RPG Maker games of the time. It's such a specific niche and such a specific corner of the internet that I've always just felt cozy in. Like, it's always just felt right up my alley in all the right ways, and both games provide so many reasons for me to feel as such. At this point, I can make videos of my own on each of them honestly, so I'll stop myself here, but I hold both of them up to a very high regard and definitely as being inspirational for me in many ways. All the love to them. Digon asks, How high can you jump? Pretty damn high. I have a longer apex hang time, so it gives me just a bit of an edge in terms of how long I can stay in the air for too. You don't want to go off screen for too long though, trust me. Rex Dead asks, How would you imagine the perfect video game for you to be like? I feel like this answer will end up changing depending on my current interests, but an action RPG with a lot of exploration and a few light puzzle elements, but also with a genuinely fleshed out combat system, unique sort of pixel already but more sketchy art style, and even a remotely engaging narrative is like the lifeblood to me in terms of games right now. Shit like that will have me hooked from start to finish. May as well include a focus on good mobility too while you're at it. Make the game feel quick, but kind of calculated in how you ideally play it, focusing a bit on style. This is just off the top of my head, but generally that's what comes to mind. For all I know, that might not actually make any sense, but damn it, it sounds cool to me. Catcroc God asks, What's your go-to sandwich place? Honestly, I try to just stick to local delis and shit now. Though, I do remember I used to go to Subway a lot when I was younger, and I used to really enjoy it. I don't know, a fucking sandwich is a sandwich, it's pretty hard to make a bad one unless you're doing it on purpose but my go-to tends to be whatever the nearest local one is. Charisma Entertainer asks, What genre of content did you like to watch while young or enjoy to watch currently? While we may think we understand someone outwardly due to how they act or talk, what they regularly watch can show hidden side to them and what they truly enjoy in entertainment. 
I used to enjoy a lot of Let's Players and creepypasta readings and horror content in general as a kid. Then I just got into a lot of Minecraft stuff, I think, and then into a lot of commentary stuff and MLG edits and shit in the mid-2010s, as well as some ARG and web series analysis like Nightmind. And after that, I watched more Let's Players and I think a lot of streamers like Vinesauce and then just circled back around to horror. With a bit of true crime and shocking stuff here and there, still enjoying gaming content currently, but also having a fondness for learning a bit of history, or on rare occasion political stuff, but also weirdly enough I've just had a fascination for internet archaeology type videos. Not necessarily just lost media, but just digging through rabbit holes to find answers to super specific questions that not many people have asked. That kind of stuff always scratches my brain just right. I think Fami is the most recent example of a YouTuber I've watched that kinda is a mix of some of the stuff I've mentioned, mainly applied to gaming. Her stuff is fucking awesome. JB asks, Congrats on 10k, and very specific question, but if you had the power to fuse for a full day with any person, think like Dragon Ball to Steven Universe, like a perfect balance of appearance and personality of you and them, who would you fuse with? Can be real or fictional? Oh Jevil, no question. The amount of power that would come from the fusion of a nerdy gremlin and a chaotic jester would be- I think it would be just too much for the universe to handle. I want to see the fabric of reality try to not tear itself apart after processing the existence of such a fusion. It would be so awesome. And so cool. And with that, we are finally done with all of the YouTube comments I got for this AMA. What, you forgot that there's like five other outlets I opened for this thing? Yeah, me too, nearly. But don't worry, the comments were by far the most numerous in the amount of submissions I got, and they took up the large, large majority of what I received. But from here, I think the most sensible outlet to read the questions for next would have to be where I got the second highest amount of responses from, that being the AMA channel that I made on my Discord server. So, let's head on over there and see what people asked, starting with Calliope Uranus, who asks, I need to know how many fluffy animals you have in your house stat. This can also include plushies if you wish. What is your favorite Pathfinder 2e class? And are you enjoying answering these questions so far? Well, I don't have any fluffy animals in particular in this cabin, but I do have several plushies. At least like three or four, but there's probably more, it's hard to keep count honestly. But I have a lot for sure. In particular, I have this plushie of from a show I used to really enjoy watching as a kid, though it stopped airing a while ago. Wonder why. To move on though, I don't actually play Pathfinder, so I can't answer the second question for that specifically, but I have played a lot of D&D, so... If it's okay, I'll just give my favorite D&D class that I've played instead. In which case, I think I'd have to pick Cleric. Though, it's hard to say, I've played a few rogue characters, I've played an Artificer, I've played a bit of just about every class. But Rogue, Artificer, and Cleric have definitely been some of my favorites. Oh, and Paladin too, it, it's hard to choose just one, but I think those four are the ones I've especially enjoyed. And as for the last question, yeah, even though I've got a lot of questions for this, I've really enjoyed just what people have been wondering about me, and it's been especially fun thinking of responses for this. Though I'm glad I did this now and not any later, because I don't think I can manage to pull off an AMA if my following was any bigger than it currently is. But a lot of these questions have been genuinely thought-provoking and interesting to answer. Y'all have been pretty damn good with this. Shadow of Roserade asks, Gaster? Indeed. But have you considered... Panster? Lenora asks, Favorite horror game and favorite Christmas movie? I haven't played an awful lot of horror games, surprisingly, but if I had to pick one right now, then my first pick would be Spooky's Jump Scare Mansion. And as for favorite Christmas movie, I'm also not much of a movie watcher myself, so it's kinda hard to pick, but for the vibes alone, I think I'll just pick a Charlie Brown Christmas, why not? Astrid asks, How do you get motivation to work on videos? It's something I struggled with for a while. Who would win? One billion lions, or one of every Pokemon? Have you ever heard of Shoujo Kagaki review Starlight? You should watch it. And why are you so cool? For motivation, it honestly comes down to a lot of brain rot and a genuine feeling of, if I don't cover this, who will, as I've said before. For the second question, I personally think one of every Pokemon would win. My Eevee from Pokemon Let's Go Eevee would clear all of those lions, she's a god killer. I haven't heard of Shoujo Kagaki, but I might check it out sometime possibly. I do have quite the backlog of stuff I haven't watched yet though, but it seems like it might be cool, I don't know. And as for the last question, thank you. I honestly don't know. I'm simply just being me and have been keeping it that way and it's gotten me this far, so yeah, I, I think that's as best of an answer as I can give. Timeless asks, Will you ver vix? If I have to, then sure. And, do you have a general final dream when it comes to making videos? Do you want to sustain yourself financially off of it solely, or just use it mostly as a creative vessel with that as a secondary? 
I suppose the ideal dream I have with making videos is to be able to make a video about really any topic, regardless of how relevant it is to the larger YouTube space, and still have it do pretty well. Being able to sustain myself, or at least my Earth equivalent financially from it, definitely is a big part of my bigger plan for my life in the long term. Though, I feel like across not just videos, but any of my creative work, I try to put the creative aspect of it before the financial aspect. Like, I have recognized that of course money is going to be needed and having a good enough income is going to be important if I want to make this all work the way I want it to, but I also want to avoid going down the pitfall of just being a creator that just does it for the money and just chases purely profit above all else. I think when you start going down that route, while it might very well work quickly, I feel like it kind of eliminates that sense of community and nurture that makes this kind of work feel so enjoyable in the first place. I have struggled a lot with this sort of thing because I want to make sure my videos perform well and reach as many people as possible so that I can get something worthwhile financially, between ads and Patreon and the such. I don't want to do this entirely for free, though if I could, I absolutely would, but I know that's not realistically fully feasible. Although at the same time, at least thanks to the fact that I can't make something without passion even if I tried, I know I'm only going to make something if I really care about the topic and genuinely want to do it justice. So there's a bit of both aspects. I want to keep growing my following in any way I can help it so that it'll be more sustainable for me financially, but that's less of a I see my viewers as just a bunch of statistics thing and more so this is just the reality of it and I'll have to work with that if I want to make this work. In essence, I want to go about this putting my creativity and passion first, but the financial and personal stability not too far behind that. But even then, I try to handle that side of things in a way that's less about just purely getting as much profit as possible, but trying to be more ethical with my practices. For instance, only placing ads on videos that are more high effort and actually covering something, not placing ads on streams or in update videos or on special vids like this one. Or if I ever were to get sponsorships, being more picky about them so that I'm only promoting things that will genuinely actually benefit my viewers and aren't the scam or taking advantage of people. If I can get to a point with this kind of thing where I can just keep making what I want to make regardless of subject matter, get sponsor offers that won't be at the expense of myself or my viewers, and just so happen to make enough to live under entirely my own roof, then that's kind of the dream there. And I know maybe that sounds kind of like a really picky of me to say, oh, I'm only gonna accept like good sponsors, but I feel like it demonstrates a bit more character when you really put your foot down and say, yeah, unless you're operating like a proper fucking business and not like a grift, then, you know, I'm not gonna take it. Personally, at least that's just kind of how I feel about it. And I don't really plan to put all my eggs in one basket either. Aside from videos, if I ever release more music, I'd like to find ways to monetize that too. Or if I do merch or some other thing in another medium that I put a lot of time into, I'd like to make sure I get some money's worth out of that as well. But the strategy is to make sure I make something that you can see I really care about, and if I can do enough of that between videos, personal projects, Patreon, and commissions, then I'm hoping all of that together will be enough to both set an example of someone doing this shit that doesn't have to be some kind of con artist, and to make all ends meet for myself personally. That seems like a tall task, but I feel like I'm doing pretty well with that so far, and I'd like to keep that up and see how close I can actually get to achieving that. I'd say that's really my ultimate goal with content creation. It's a long road, but it feels like the one that both calls to me the most and seems the most realistic and ethical, at least for the time being. Pyrek Red asks, Who would win? A gorilla who was immune to all weapons versus fiction? I don't mean the gorilla is fighting every single fictional character. Instead, he has a radar of where every piece of fiction is at and must destroy all of it. Rules. He has a radar that tracks everything. He must destroy every physical piece of fiction in the world. He ignores humans but will kill them if needed. Humanity doesn't know that he's destroying fiction or his weakness. He only has to destroy every piece of current fiction. Stuff made after he starts his rampage don't count. The only thing that can affect him is in a live human limb. Can he solo fiction? Depends on what world this happens in. If it's in yours, then maybe, but I doubt it. But if it's in mine, then uh... Yeah, I think I can take him just fine. Also, what object in your room slash immediate proximity would be the best one to become a new Team Fortress 2 weapon? Probably the very comedically large hammer that I have in the corner of my room for self-defense purposes. It's kind of like that hammer that Amy Rose carries around, but like, a bit bigger. Onyx Catechus asks, What's the coolest little weird internet thing you found? Oh, I'm not sure how much this counts, but there's this site I found a while ago that's really fucking useful for if you're trying to make any video gamey kind of sound effects. It's called JFXR. It lets you adjust a lot of settings, but also lets you pick a variety of either random sounds or stuff that could sound like, say, an explosion or a power-up noise, etc. It also even has like a random setting that you can just keep clicking and it gives you a lot of really weird shit. 
I would definitely recommend it if you need any sound effects done quick if that's not something you're super experienced in, or if you just want to mess around with it. It often gives me some really neat results. I was surprised to see there was a place on the internet that actually had something like this just on hand, and it's a really cool resource for this sort of stuff. So I'll throw the link to it on screen and in the description if you're curious. Gabrote42 asks, Do you prefer to walk to the clothing store or order online? You got style. Have you had to deal with revenge bedtime procrastination? If yes, how did you deal with it? Do you decorate your walls or leave them blank? Favorite Miyazaki film? And what's been the most mechanically difficult thing you have ever done? As in, requiring reflexes and strength leagues above what you usually do, like a game speedrun or carrying a shelf for kilometers. Thank you, I'm glad you like my style. Most of my clothes I tend to either order online, or at least in my case, I'll even take up making some garments myself. Not too often, but at least for cases like this sweater, it's just not something I find frequently, so I manifest some clothes of my own if I can't find them lying around somewhere else. Also, since this seems related, I do also decorate my walls, mostly with posters and the occasional tapestry, but I would like to go a little harder on it soon, honestly, and make more time for decor. It's rather fun. I've definitely dealt with revenge bedtime procrastination for a good while, honestly. Whether it was because of school or work or some kind of other personal thing that felt like it took up way too much of my time in the day. I always find myself working a lot more at night, both because I tend to be a night owl anyway, but also because, yeah, I just don't feel like I have enough time in the day usually. So, late nights of working on stuff constantly, it is. Honestly, it's one of those things I still struggle with and can't really give a good answer for. Sleep in general? While I do get a lot of it, I'm not so good with managing my schedule with it, let alone bedtime procrastination. But I would like to try and work on it sometime if I can help it. As for favorite Miyazaki film, I haven't seen too many of them, but out of all of the ones I have seen, either Howl's Moving Castle or Spirited Away has to be my favorite currently. But I need a bigger sample size of stuff I've actually seen of his works to really give a more confident answer there. And as for the most mechanically difficult thing I've done, well, I do remember one time I had to get some mail and when I got to the parcel locker, there were several boxes I had to carry all at once. I didn't want to make several trips back and forth as it was a pretty good walk, so uh, I had to lug all of these boxes with me. None of them being particularly heavy to my memory, but because they took up so much space and you know, they were like big boxes, it was hard to really carry them all in one go. I remember having to take breaks a few times before I actually got home, and when I did, I felt my arms were like, weak. Like they were kind of shaking a bit, even when I was just getting a glass of water to try and rest a bit. Definitely not a situation I want to be in again, I can tell you that much. Silly asks, What is your favorite game of every genre? Platformer, any of the PS2 Ratchet & Clank games, or alternatively, Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. Or, very close second, any of the Jack & Daxter games. Shooter slash FPS, either Ultra Kill or Call of Duty Black Ops 1 for the PS3, or I guess the whole Half-Life series. Survival, either Minecraft or Starbound. Metroidvania, Hollow Knight. Puzzle? I suppose Portal 1 and 2 if that counts. RPG? If not Undertale and Deltarune, then the Mother series. Action RPG? Crosscode. Roguelike? Random Access Mayhem because one of my friends is making that one. Simulation micromanagement type games? Lobotomy Corporation. Sports? Probably most racing games if I really had to pick. And for sandbox slash open world, Grand Theft Auto 4. Lady Valkyrie asks, What is your favorite detail about Undertale or Deltarune? Or both? And what is your favorite animated movie? My favorite detail about the two games, just between both of them, probably has to be the all caps files and unused script. I don't know what it is, but while there's already so much stuff about both games that I could go on and on about, I think what really cemented my brain run for the series, especially for life, was just the fact that in Deltarune, there were files that were named deliberately differently from the rest, and intentionally so, to convey something about the game on a broader scale. Like, the thing is, I had never even considered the idea that the file names in a game or that unused content could be used in such a way that it makes even data mining become part of the process that one would go through to learn about Deltarune's larger picture and overarching message and narrative. It's so fucking cool to me still, especially in a world where a lot of the time, secrets are kinda hard to find naturally when you just happen to learn about them through data mining and the such instead. I feel like using it as a means of making that part of the actual narrative is such a nice way to counter that kind of finality in something existing or not existing in the game proper. And I hope to see more stuff of that sort, honestly, because I think it's got plenty of room to still be expanded upon even from what Deltarune did with that idea. As for my favorite animated movie, Wally probably had to be one of them. That's an animated movie I remember pretty vividly enjoying. Aside from that, the Cowboy Bebop movie is another favorite of mine that's much more recent. Repulsa Masks. What do you think contributed to the growth of your own video-making style and aesthetic? Anything from any media that you're hyped about for next year? 
And do you agree with this man's beliefs? I already answered the first one a good bit, but for the second one, aside from Delta and obviously being a thing I'm excited to see more of and the Everhood DLC, I'm also pretty excited for Everhood too. There honestly isn't too much that I'm extremely hyped for in the coming year now that I think about it. A lot of what I want to get around to has to do more with the huge fucking backlog of stuff that's already come out over the past few years. Also, as for this man, I think he's probably said some stuff that doesn't quite hit the mark or ignores some nuances, but I think he's on the right track. I don't see any malice in this man's heart, I agree with what he's going for. Panda Kwanda asks, What is the history of the constant, if any? Have you played Marble It Up? If not, play it now. How would you get a small cylinder, 5.1 inches in length and around 4.5 inches in girth, unstuck from a mini M&M's tube filled with butter and microwave mashed banana? For the first one, the history of that symbol exists, but all you really have to know about it for now is that it's a constant. For the second question, I haven't played Marble It Up personally, but it does look very fun. You gotta have quite the dedication for it, though. As for your last question, well, I hope you know how to do surgery on a small cylinder. Although, is it really a small cylinder? Seems like a pretty average sized cylinder to me. Doctor Who Kobe asks, Can you solve this puzzle? It took me a few attempts, admittedly, but I eventually figured it out. Thank you for this puzzle. It was really cool. The colors kind of remind me of where I am right now, actually, with all the purple and yellow. Looks very cozy. Poisonous Boba asks, What sorts of characters have resonated or typically resonate with you? And what is your all-time least favorite character ever? Beloathed. Evil. For the first question, Steven Universe and Miles Taylor's Prower resonated with me a lot as a kid and teen, and they still kind of resonate with me even now. And currently, a Radical Edward from Cowboy Bebop is a character that I vibe with a lot. I think I generally have this connection with characters who are either nerdy as hell, are super kind and selfless and just struggle with being people pleasers in general, or are just gremlins or some mix of all three of those things. But as for a least favorite character, I'll be real, I don't think there's a character I actually hate that much. Like, maybe some that I don't like as much as others, but I have almost never had like a constant unending hatred for a specific character. Like I really tried to think of one, but genuinely nothing comes to mind. Am I just too kind of a person? Chop asks, What is the purpose of the cube? And why is the symbol chosen the fallback character when something like an emoji isn't in the character set? Significance of common use of CYMB? And why is it real when it sleeps at night? Or I guess as a fallback question, why are you fascinated with using 21st century or at least like adjacent elements within stories you like to tell? For your first three questions, I won't be giving you the answers in terms of what something means or something's purpose, that'll come with time, but I didn't know it was necessarily the fallback character for Emoji specifically, though I do find that kind of funny. I suppose there's some aspect of it being a fallback character that I do resonate with a bit, what with my whole thing with being like unlabeled and the such, but I'm not really going to comment on it much more personally. For your fourth question, honesty is an easier bit to sleep in. And for the last question, I think my fascination, so to speak, with more modern elements showing up in the stories I tell mostly just has to do with the fact that, for one thing, it's where I'm kind of living in anyway, and so because of that, a lot of the stories I tell happen to take place in the present, or at least not too far in the past, which has those more modern elements. But even aside from that, I guess I just have more of an interest in modern technology and themes compared to going super far in the past for whatever stories I do feel like telling. Especially because I feel like a lot of stories I see either go super far in the future or super far in the past, it's hard to find compelling stories that really feel like they're somewhere in between, or rather, feel more grounded in the present moment. Not to mention, I just have a lot of fascination for especially analog technology and that weird period where stuff was starting to feel really modern and shit was accelerating a lot, but it hadn't quite gone super far, so a lot of the possibilities still felt endless. Retrofuturism, more or less. But really, I just have a deep appreciation for wanting to tell stories that feel closer to home and closer to what I've actually experienced. It weirdly enough doesn't feel like the kind of thing that I see often, or if I do see it, it's somewhat often done not very well. I base a lot of my storytelling off of what I know in my own life and off of my interests, which results in me just enjoying telling stories that have a lot of 20th or 21st century elements. In other words, I just think contemporary stories still have a lot of potential and is underrated and it feels more fitting for me to work with given my aesthetics and what I'm going for in my work. Unusual Artistic asks, Have you read Homestuck? Something about your fascination with multimedia and meta stories tells me you'd enjoy it, as old as it may be. Also because Toby was involved in it, but shh, this isn't about Undertale Deltarune. Bonus question, were you looking forward to this Q&A or were you nervous? If you were nervous, why? Honestly, I have never read Homestuck myself. I know a lot of people who have read it and have gotten either the opinion of it's fine, I guess, and please do not ever read it. 
I might consider getting into it sometime, but it feels like such a daunting journey that I think I'd have to save it for if I know I really do not have much going on in my backlog, which currently is far from the case, so this is a huge maybe sometime in the future kind of thing. For the bonus question, I was honestly looking forward to this AMA for sure. I've tried doing Q&As before, and while I would get a few responses maybe, most of the time I felt like I had so much to say that I just couldn't because not many people really asked me anything of substance. So to see that this time around people have asked so many more interesting questions and shit I didn't even think people could ask me is definitely a lot more fun to me. Granted, I got a lot of fucking submissions, but I'll take an abundance of them that I can pick from over a staggering lack of them that barely really ask anything to make me really think about stuff that I otherwise wouldn't have considered. Overall, despite the insane volume of questions I got, I think this one was a net positive for me personally. Kimberbly asks, I've got four questions of varying seriousness. Choose any or all as you wish. Does Molly Stars is gay? What was the first video game you ever finished on your own? No guides or outside help. If you were to make a dark fountain, what room would you make it in and why? And you're trapped in the last game you played before reading this. How screwed are you? Molly Stars does is all, does isn't give a shit. The first video game I ever finished on my own, honestly it feels hard to remember exactly what that would be, but I think one of the first games I ever truly finished on my own had to be Sly Cooper and Athevius Raccoonus, the first game in the series. Either that or maybe Ultimate Spider-Man for the PS2, but I kind of doubt that one. If I made a dark fountain, I'd probably make it in the room where my computer is because that's where all my plushies are and that means I can make Rouse and Jevil real and Sam from Eastward, so I think that'd be pretty cool. Plus with all the decorations I have in here, it would make such a cool fucking analog slash vaporwave themed dark world, there's just no better option. And the last game I played was Tears of the Kingdom, so I think I'll be fine. My arrow headshot game is peak, don't fuck with me. I've got like 1 billion muddle buds and flux construct cores, nothing is going to stand a chance against me. Justiana asks, I don't really have a question aside from how are you? I'm doing well. Just been busy with working on the AMA and also decorating around the house for the holidays, but honestly I've been having a pretty cozy time. I hope to spend more time just playing games though and taking it easier to go into the new year, but other than that I'm feeling pretty alright all things considered. And definitely grateful that this is how I get to end my year off, or rather start my 2024 by just making a silly little AMA video. Thanks for asking. January asks, the closest stuffed animal to you, when you read this, comes to life. If it's an animal, it acts as your friend, can speak, and doesn't need to be fed or breathe normally, i.e. a shark that doesn't need to be placed in water. If it's a character, it acts like how that character would, but still recognizes and knows you, and in either case, they'd have memories of everything they've seen. The question is, how does this story end? And what is more important, the thing that everybody knows, or the thing that nobody knows? For the first one, it seems like my Gordon plush would come to life in this case, although I do worry what would happen because, at least as far as I know, that character already exists in this world in some way. So would that cause one or both of them to completely erase themselves from existence so that the universe can correct itself? Would that explode everything? I'm not sure, but I feel like it would result in some kind of existential catastrophe to threaten life itself, which honestly for this character that does sound weirdly fitting actually. For the second question though, I would say neither, but by technicality, I guess the thing that everybody knows would be more important. If it's something that nobody knows, then that means the time where it's worth knowing about it just hasn't come yet, but something that everybody knows always has a chance of being challenged as to how well they really know it. That's how I believe change is made after all. The Spinach Inquisition asks, Hello Molly, can you give me a recipe for some good food? I'm hungry. Sure, here's a recipe for pancakes that I've done a few times that I'll throw on screen. Hope you like it. KV asks, If you were a soup, what type of soup would you be? Hmm, probably either a French onion soup, a miso soup, or a wonton soup. Any of those three work. Chess asks, What is this silly creature? And classic chess question, I don't know how I forgot this, If you were a fairy, what would you be? And if you were finally convicted of your many crimes, what are you getting for your last meal? That creature is rather joyous. Quite silly. It appears to be a canine of some sort. Curious. Many such cases. As for the second question, well, I don't really need to think much about what I would be if I was a furry because I already know exactly what I would be. I've been it for years now. Clearly, you don't know that I'm Benoit. And for the last question, I would get a lot of sushi and at least two eels over rice. This is part of my secret plan where after I eat enough sushi, it will give me a temporary boost to my maximum health and give me extra health points. That way, whenever they try to execute me, they'll fail, and I will successfully escape from the clutches of Big Small Mate to sell more or less. Hummus asks, Do you enjoy quesadillas? 
Of course. Quesadillas are the shit, I love them. I haven't had food of that sort in a hot minute, though. I should get one soon. Hellsent Princess asks, You did specify in the announcement that Yota sends sick and twisted questions, so if you have to choose a single fictional character to cook and eat, who would you choose? The character cannot be made of a substance that you would usually consider food. If I really had to, I'd pick one of the grunts from Madness Combat. While they're not made of something that would be considered food as far as I know, it has been said by the creator that they apparently taste like chicken. I have to confirm this for myself, so if this is my chance to do so, then sure, I'll take it. Hyper Derek asks, AMA question. Who is your favorite Spamton sweepstakes character? Spamton A. Spamton, easily. Either him or sports. The prizes. <sighs> the pr- Lutonym asks, Simple question. What musicians inspired you to make the music you make, and if you had to pick a favorite track of the last month to make it easier, what would it be? I haven't really answered this question in terms of what is inspiring me right now, so I'll go with that for this one. Right now, the artists that have been most inspiring me to take my music in a pretty different direction that feels the most fitting for me currently has been some kind of bizarre mix of Hakashiya Sagawa, Frums, Kikuo, Alan Palomo, maybe also Underscores, Background, Arthur, Frenesi, and Bowen. And I think that's just off the top of my head. A bit of all of what those artists do has just kind of spoken to me in such a way to where it's like, if I could take my sound in vaguely that direction and do something on my own with it, then I think I can make something really, really fucking cool potentially. But I really have to get back around to making more music before I can just say that more confidently. That's the main thing right now is I just have to actually sit down and make more stuff. As for my favorite song over the last month, I'd have to go back and pick Miss You or I Still Miss You by Bowen. Both versions are fucking great. His stuff only recently clicked with me upon Pale Machine 2's release, but it's genuinely amazing stuff. Block Fox asks, Have you ever tried peach juice? It's lovely, personally. I think I have tried it a few times. It's definitely a really nice drink. I need to get back to actually having stuff like that, honestly, now that you mention it. Been a while since I've done so. Ghosty asks, What's a scene that fucked with you as a child? One scene from the top of my head is that one part from Toy Story where Andy throws Woody away and it's unsettling as shit. I actually know exactly what scene you're talking about, and I feel like that's exactly the answer I was actually going to give. I don't remember too much from Toy Story, but I swear that is the most vivid memory I have of watching it. And honestly, I think as a kid, that kind of fucked me up for some reason. That and also that scene of Buzz trying to fly and losing his arm and shit after he fails to do so. Y you know, for a series like Toy Story, I feel like there's a weird amount of shit in it in there that's just kind of fucking nightmarish now that I think about it. What was up with that fucking series, man? I'm starting to see why Toby Fox might have had such a fascination with it, like good lord. I could give other answers, but that genuinely is the most vivid one that I can go back to and say really left me kinda uneasy. Ya boy Jay asks, What Disney villain would you trust to hold your line in a buffet? And as of the time I'm writing this, it's my birthday in two days as well, so what's your favorite birthday present or a present in general? And lastly, what do you think about this brick? For the first question, I'm sure Captain Hook would be able to hold my line for me. He only really was out for revenge, but not on me, so I think it would be pretty chill. My favorite birthday present, though. I honestly didn't get many birthday presents specifically, but I have gotten a lot of presents for New Year's. I think my favorite present in general, personally, had to be when I got my PS3. That was definitely one of the most defining moments of my childhood, and I got introduced to so much cool shit from that point on. I still look back on it very fondly even now. And for your last question, that's a cool looking brick. Can I throw it at the nearest political institution? Moisty McMoisterson asks, What is one food you would like to know how to make, either just for yourself and your enjoyment, or as you know very well I want to do for others? One food I really want to learn how to make for both myself and others would have to be sushi, just in general. I know how to make eel over rice, but sushi is still something I don't have much experience making, but it seems like such a nice kind of food to make both for my own enjoyment and just to pass off to other people. It's not too much at once, and it's always something of a comfort food to me, so if I knew how to make that, then I think I'd honestly be fucking set for a while in terms of making my own food. Other than that, if I also knew how to make a good burger, and to cook with meat in general, and make my own pizzas, then I'm really set for life there. Blissful Evening asks, If Yogi Bear knocked on your door and offered you a cinnamon roll, would you take it? Yes, no question asked. One time actually when I was super young, I don't remember this but my parents told me about this, but when I was at a campground or a resort of that sort for Halloween, my parents had these two large bags of candy that they were giving to the other kids. Apparently they got through one of them, but when I saw that they were going to start going through the other bag, I ended up taking the bag from them and running all the way back to the cabin with it. Again, I don't remember this happening, but that was honestly pretty fucking sick of me to do. Good job, me. 
Patry Pastry asks, Cat, rat, or bat? This is an incredibly important choice. Choose wisely. Bats. They're like rats, but with wings, so they can fly. Also, I know someone with bat wings and they're really fucking cool, so bat it is. Cookie asks, What do you think of people asking several different questions? Do you get tired of them, or do you just pick those you prefer, or do you not mind? It feels like something I should have expected or thought about before announcing this AMA, and yet somehow I just didn't consider that people would ask like a billion questions in one submission. But I ultimately don't mind, I found ways to work with it just fine. My way of going about it is if it's stuff I've already been asked, I just answer the ones that I haven't already done a response for, and if I get like a ton of them in one submission, then that's where the wheel comes in. So while ideally I think one question for comment would be a lot better and more efficient if I do something like this again, I don't really mind it for this particular AMA since it did end up yielding a lot of really interesting questions and responses anyway. And with that, that answers every question I got from the Discord server. See? Not nearly as much as the YouTube comments. However, we do still have a few more places to look through, and I think the next stop should be the few replies I got to the tweet announcing my own AMA on Twitter. Starting with Metal Blue 1991 who asks, What is your favorite Ultra Kill level, and favorite breakcore artist and song? My favorite Ultra Kill level, I'd say it probably has to be 6-1 honestly, just for the music alone. It's just that fucking good of a song and the encounters that go with it are brutal, but fucking hell they're so cool. The amazing level all in all. P2 probably also comes close to that for similar reasons. Okay, last minute edit, Layer 7 came out not too long after I wrote this and I changed my mind, 7-4 is by far my favorite Ultra Kill level. I think I was in actual tears by the time I finished that one. What the fuck, Hikita? <laughs> My favorite breakcore artist is probably, well, I don't know how well this applies to breakcore, but it feels like at least adjacent even if super chill, but my favorite breakcore artist overall has to be Deathbrain. Their stuff has a really unique sound and one that I have felt pretty inspired by. Other than that, again, I don't know how well it applies, but Frums is definitely also a very good contender for favorite artists in that general sphere. But along with that, I would also pick Hakashi Asagawa, but I feel like giving a label to whatever the fuck those two magicians of artists do is not really doing their music justice. Favorite breakcore song though, probably either Fleeting Frozen Heart by XX Starlet, or whatever this song is by Frums that I'm not going to be able to pronounce, like genuinely, that's, that is a key smash. That is a fucking key smash, but it's a really good song, listen to it. Anne asks, How many rocks do you eat, and where did you hide the bodies? I tried eating them once, honestly there's not much special about it, never got the hype. Also, check behind the stars, see if you find them there. Smee asks, What is your favorite 7th chord? You can't say C major 7th. Well joke's on you, it's C minor 7th. I've realized through this question that every single minor 7th chord is pure fucking heaven to my ears, so if I could answer this with all minor 7th chords then I would. But otherwise, C minor 7th is probably my favorite. It's just so somber and feels like it's simultaneously a resolution and yet a suspension all at once. It's such a nice fucking sound. Teeth Addiction asks, What's your taste in music like? Are you the type of person to sit down and overanalyze even the smallest lyrics or go with the flow? I've already gone over some of my favorite artists and my music taste in general. Honestly, my taste has shifted so much over the years. It's gone from liking new metal as a kid to liking pop, then EDM and the stuff surrounding it, and then rap and rock and also vaporwave and like God knows what other stuff. And now it's just a mix of all of that and also really liking break core and jungle and drum and bass and the such. It's just been a bag of a whole bunch of stuff. I don't think I have any solid singular taste in music that really defines me fully at this point, as much as there's just artists that I happen to especially enjoy. As for your other question though, I think it depends. Usually on the first listen I try to just go with the flow unless something really catches me off guard. Like I guess the last time I had that happen was with Johnny 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 by Underscores. But naturally as I'm more fascinated with something, I'll end up analyzing it more and tearing apart lyrics a little more as I catch on to things. I think it depends on how much an album really grips me. The more I like it, the more I'm prone to overanalyzing the fuck out of it. And that's all the Twitter stuff I got that I felt like answering. At this point, there's only a few places left to respond to questions from, so I'll be a little more quick with the transitions. Next, I'll be taking a look at every DM I got from Discord and Twitter, starting with Tux, who asks, How do you think Undertale and Deltarun changed you as a person going forward in your life? How do you like to use your free time outside of YouTube stuffs? What is your favorite YouTube video? And most importantly, who do you mean in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate? Undertale and Deltarun have certainly made me a much more positive person for one thing. As I've said before, I was not in a very good place mentally around the time that I got into those games, and while I don't think they gave me a solution to what I was dealing with, they were the first to fall in a large domino effect that led to me ultimately becoming a lot kinder to myself and to others. 
so I think it's definitely changed a lot of my outlook on life fundamentally, and ultimately for the better. Also, free time? What the fuck is that? No, but really, I try to just spend it either watching videos or possibly doing something else creative that isn't YouTube stuff. Whether that be drawing or making music or who knows what. Or hell, maybe I'll be a freak and even play a video game or two. Crazy. My favorite YouTube video is yet another difficult question to give a single answer to, but I do think the entire Dracula Flow saga has to be my current favorite. They are everything I love about YouTube videos condensed into one series. Genuinely, nothing will top that series of videos for me. And for your last question, I honestly haven't played that much of Smash Brothers. I played through a bit of the Wii U one and played through World of Light and Ultimate and just kind of stopped there. But I guess the closest I had to a main was Toon Link only because Toon Link looked pretty cool. Menger asks, Sorry, I had to send a friend to thank you to get a DM opened. Anyway, I saw your Q&A video and have a few questions for your video. If you had to choose, what would be your favorite genre of horror? And what's the most unique or funny thing that has happened to you throughout your life? That's all I had. Bye bye. I think I tend to lean into horror that's more surreal or psychological. Something about horror that really fucks with the mind and the idea of being terrified by things that are genuinely beyond your comprehension has always just kind of struck the right chord for me personally. It's why Twin Peaks, for instance, is such an inspiration to me because it tugs so hard on that feeling of unease despite being in a place that seems more or less completely normal. Normalcy with a, just a tinge of insanity is the kind of thing that I fuck with a lot when it comes to any sort of horror in general. For your other question, I think the most unique thing that's ever happened to my life is probably when I realized myself as Molly. I had no idea just how much I was capable of pretty much existing beyond everything else in my world until that point, and I'm still feeling the effects of it even now. I don't know what it is, but seeing what I saw when I learned of my name, I feel like I knew I had stumbled onto something that no one else would ever get to bear witness to. That wasn't a connection that anyone else could make, and it was by design. I don't think it gets much more unique than that, really. Joel Awake Swell asks, Question number one, does your username have any correlation with this character from the hit show Epithet Erased? Two, what is your opinion with the phenomena that makes non-celebrities see celebrities as higher than other people and kinda unapproachable? And three, do you enjoy YouTube as a job, and if it is not your main job, do you enjoy your main job? I haven't seen this character or the show itself before being asked this, so you can guess there's no real correlation there, but I will say that is a very cute design. I may give it a look sometime just because of that. As for your second question, I find it honestly kind of interesting, but odd. I definitely get why it happens, being idolized and put on a pedestal compared to other people does sort of make that effect where you just sort of assume that that means the person on a pedestal isn't really approachable or is somehow holier or more enlightened than others. But I think it's just a slippery slope that I'd like to avoid if I can help it. I joke about being a micro-celebrity and all, but to me, creators or celebrities of any kind are just people too, and very often there is still an issue where after a certain point, people just kind of forget that, which I find so fucking strange. A lot of why I'm able to keep my cool around other creators is honestly just because I kind of forget they even have that big of a following to begin with if I'm just invested in them as a person rather than as some kind of symbol or idol or whatever. Of course, there's the other end of it where people will feel like they're able to punch up and strip away someone's privacy just because they're famous, and so I think there's a middle ground where being at that status doesn't make you some kind of godlike entity that can't be spared the time to talk to average people, so to speak. But that also doesn't mean that they have to let everyone in. They're just people who make stuff that happens to get around a little more quickly, who also have their own personal lives that they may or may not want to share anything about. And at the end of the day, you don't really know the person, you just know the work that person's done. It's a complex kind of relationship and connection, but one that I hope is explored more for the risks it tends to pose for both ends of that connection. Creators are just people to me who happen to have a community around them, but it doesn't change that they're still just people at the end of the day who I may or may not be interested in talking to, regardless of status, and I think that mentality is what's gonna help me at least not get too lost in the sauce one way or the other. Being able to have a deep respect for someone who I'm inspired by, but just also being able to hold a normal conversation with them rather than trying to make them look like a deity of some kind. But that's just me and how I go about that sort of thing. For your final question though, since I don't really have anything else I'm doing as a job so to speak other than YouTube, I do enjoy this a ton as a job. I've always wanted to pursue the creative field and content creation in general for years and being able to actually act on that, even if to a small extent currently, even if I'm not making a crazy amount of money from it right now, has been super fun and cathartic for me. There isn't really much else I can see myself doing, frankly, and I have a lot of passion for making videos and covering the stuff that I'm interested in. I wouldn't really have it any other way currently, is how I'd put my feelings about it. It's all I really could have asked for, and I'm happy about that. Sapo asks, Hey Molly, have you heard of Funk Como Le Gusta? Very cool question for your 10k special. 
I haven't heard of them myself, but after giving their stuff a listen, it does indeed sound pretty funky. I like him. Gary asks a metric fuck ton of questions, so I'll be pulling out the spinning wheel for this one. Out of the ones given that I haven't already answered, or can reasonably answer, I'll be picking seven of them depending on what the wheel gives me. Hello, Molly Stars. I saw that you're doing an AMA, so I decided to collect some of my questions and send them to you. I hope at least one of them will help in creating videos and won't be so terrible. How do you feel about online session games? I'm not entirely sure what online session refers to, but I'm gonna assume you mean multiplayer games or live service stuff. In which case, honestly, I don't mind them inherently, but after a certain point I just got super burnt out on multiplayer games when pretty much all the major ones got super flooded and depended on microtransactions as part of the business model. It's exhausting trying to just have fun with a multiplayer game and getting bombarded with constant reminders and advertisements to buy stuff for the game you already paid up the fucking ass for. And even for free games and live service stuff, I just have my gripes because they're just not sustainable in the long term. I mean, this applies to AAA games in general now, but for live service specifically, it just ends up getting shut down in no more than a year after its release, and I can bet you in the future that even more successful games in the field are going to be victims of that sooner or later. This just kind of ties into my gripes with AAA gaming in general. It all feels like everything is a huge advertisement or crossing over with something and is just throwing unique brand identity to the fucking wind. So everything just kind of feels like it's blending together into this one mass of high-budget, ray-traced 4K flesh that you'd have a hard time telling anything apart from. I like multiplayer stuff when it's more indie, of course, and when the approach to it is genuinely not too predatory or dependent on microtransactions, but it just feels kind of harder to come by that sort of thing as of late. How do you feel about my pet's theories, and would you like to see his new theories on Deltarune? Honestly, I don't really make a big deal of his theories. There was a time I was more invested in his stuff, but over the years I just kind of lost interest, but never really have felt any genuine ill will or whatever about his videos. My main criticism of his theories and approach to stuff is that while making really out there theories about something like FNAF or anything with a huge presence in the online space is ultimately harmless, I notice he often drops the ball really fucking hard when it comes to stuff that's just starting out or isn't nearly as well known. Claiming something to be the next Undertale or Earthbound, or claiming something to be an ARG when it categorically isn't, and when it's something that's just starting out and by a creator that can't really do much to sway views otherwise, it ends up unintentionally causing an interpretation of the source material that is wildly off base. And yet a ton of people would just buy it because MatPat is literally Johnny Theorist to the average YouTube viewer that isn't super deep into this general sphere of the internet. They're mostly harmless, but when it comes to stuff that you're trying to get to that's just starting out, especially when you are very capable of swaying people's opinions easily, there's a nuance to analyzing that sort of stuff with an open mind that I worry has historically been lacking, in favor of quickly pursuing the cause of wanting to solve it and have all the answers to it, rather than leave it open to interpretation while it's still figuring itself out. That said though, if he ever were to make Deltarun theories at some point, I'm excited to see it just because I'm so deep in the fucking sauce for this game that I'll genuinely have a laugh at what he ends up getting out of the clusterfuck of mystery that this game has spawned. It would be funny. How do you feel about analog horror? I really like it. I really have enjoyed it a lot ever since it started blowing up, and I'm kinda glad it's kinda spawned a new era of sorts for online horror over the past few years. That said though, I think it still has a lot of untapped potential, especially in the analog aspect of analog horror that I hope gets more use. I think people more easily assume that analog horror just means VHS filter equals scary, and I've seen that even in effect when they watch my videos and think I'm just using that filter just to be spooky rather than just me thinking it looks cool for what I'm going for. Plus, aside from that, analog technology is just so fucking fascinating to me in general that it kind of surprises me that people haven't tried to work with like the actual tech behind it to try and spin that in a more horror-focused way. Like the tapes themselves acting fucking weird or taking advantage of rewinding and recording onto a tape in a horror context. And tapes aside, analog technology does exist beyond just tapes and high eight camcorders and shit. Like Walkmans are a thing. CRTs in general can get some use out of them beyond just being used for VCRs and shit. Fucking answering machines, cell phones, fax machines could work in that field maybe. There's a lot of uncharted territory because analog horror is ultimately just horror centered around a specific time period where a specific kind of technology was more prominent. So I like it, but I hope more people see beyond the standards that some of the bigger series in that field have set. What are your predictions for future chapters of Deltarune? Honestly, I don't know. 
I personally think that the church is going to be a dark world at some point, but not in chapter 4. It feels more like a chapter 5 kind of thing to me. Also, chapter 3 is definitely going to be a super gimmicky dark world and more focused on overworld mechanics if Toby's comments about its development or anything to go off of. Other than that, I feel like I don't have much in the way of actual predictions necessarily other than the conclusions I have made from the device theory, which I'll be saving for once I finally actually make part 3. I just kinda want to see it for what it is though. Making predictions feels like a way to set expectations that may not be realistic and that's something I want to avoid for a game that I feel so personally attached to like Deltarune. What countries would you like to visit? I'd definitely like to visit Japan at some point. Other than that, I don't know, I think I'd be happy to see most of the world really, especially any place that can get really snowy as long as it's not like a literal dictatorship or something. If I can get in there and then be able to get out then sure I'll go there. Why are you making videos on a 4x3 monitor? It's simply the standard around here. May not be the case for you, but it certainly is for me. And lastly, while admittedly I didn't pick this from the wheel, this did sound like a fitting last question to answer, but if you had the chance to chat with Toby Fox, what would you chat about? I feel like him and I would just talk a bit about music or something. I've been fascinated by his ability to come up with such like recognizable and memorable tunes like it's nothing, and I think a lot of my inspirations that I really do want to connect more with often end up involving music to some extent. It's a medium I kind of have a deep connection to, and one though I always enjoy seeing other people's processes and approaches to it. So if anything, I just kind of want to see how this guy cooks. Other than that, probably just a lot of talking back and forth about niche interests because that tends to be what happens when I talk to people who I'm fascinated by or consider to be friends or acquaintances in general. Bootleg Zone asks, Question number one. Have you read any Omori fanfiction, and if so, what's your favorite fic? Question number two. Have you played Lisa the Painful, and if so, what's your thoughts on the game and its remaster? Question number three. When it comes to popular old horror RPG maker games, what would you consider the best and the worst? Question number four. Have you played or even know of the horror guru game, Demonophobia? Some somewhat notable YouTubers back in the day played the game and it kind of traumatized me. It's kind of insane that YouTube allowed that game because while there was nothing erotic, it was super, super bloody. I haven't read any Amori fanfic, nor have I played Elisa, but for the latter especially I would like to get around to that sometime. I have heard it's pretty fucking heavy though, so I might have to make sure I'm in the right headspace for it, but it seems like one of those games I should play honestly if I've played so much other stuff in that field before. Also, it wouldn't hurt to read more fanfic in general, so Amori fanfic sounds like a not bad place to get into that a little more. I mean, I guess the closest I have to like a fanfic, even if not a fic, but just like a fan thing is uh, Faraway Logs, which I'm sure Bootleg is familiar with. That's pretty fucking good. For old RPG Maker games, it's hard to think of which one was the worst, but Aoni feels like the most iconic one to me of the time. I don't know if that makes it the best or worst, but it's the one I remember most vividly. That and Ebe. Actually, Eve is probably the best one of that now that I think about it. I can't really give an answer for the worst one though to my memory. And I haven't heard of Demonophobia myself, but it does look pretty fucking gnarly. It definitely looks like something I would have seen Markiplier or Jacksepticeye play back in like 2012 or something. I don't know if it would have fucked me up necessarily, but I'm sure if I did see it, it would have stuck with me a little bit given some of these visuals. I'm sure if people played a game like this now, it would be definitely age-restricted to hell and back, I'm willing to bet, which definitely makes me feel just a bit old given how different the landscape of the site was when I was younger. And that concludes the DM questions. The last place I'll be going over submissions for now will be the emails that I got for the AMA. Starting with Yudi, who asks, What is your opinion on this? I love them, and I hope they are doing well in crafting many molotovs and eating many pancakes. Thank you, Nico OneShot, for your service. Soup is for noobs asks, Do you lie? How often do you lie? When do you think lying is okay for you to do, if ever? This includes lies of omission. I tend to be pretty good at withholding information but never blatantly making up details for the hell of it. I think lying in most cases isn't really okay, but there are circumstances where one may have to leave details out or make something up if their life depends on it. Say if you happen to be living around people who, if they were to learn certain things about you or your identity would end up using it against you or putting you through hell for it. In that case, I wouldn't really blame the person for never being transparent to them about it because for their safety's sake, it may be better to wait until the right time to actually open up, if that time even were to ever exist, and in the meantime, keep those details out of the picture, instead of letting them know when they're very capable of hurting that person because of it. Or, I don't know, if it's for a bit or because you want to keep some details about a personal project of yours a secret, and so you either omit stuff or even make up fake details to muddy up the waters of speculation well before you feel comfortable having expectations set on that project, Otherwise, lying kinda sucks. It's not the kind of thing I would want to do, but only if I absolutely have to for my own safety's sake. 
Though again, I feel like lies of omission are a bit more harmless compared to blatantly making shit up, so if you're just keeping stuff out of the picture generally and waiting until later to come out about it, then while that's still a lie of omission, it's not one that's being done out of malice but rather out of concern for oneself, which I think can be somewhat justified depending on one's circumstances. In short, if you're doing it because you might get in genuine and unjustified trouble if you don't, I think that can be pretty understandable. Omi Omai asks, Hi, yes, I am a freak like that. I love emails. So, the question. Have you ever thought about making your own game? Like an RPG or something like that? If yes, what would it be about? Anyway, Cat Doodle. I did answer a question like this earlier in the AMA, but I just wanted to mention this because of the Cat Doodle. It's a very nice doodle, thank you for sending it to me. When the the when asks, one, I've been in love with your content since I was exposed to it from half Bird Chaos a couple months ago and have been trying to figure a non-creepy way to ask. The AMA was well-timed, but are you open to friendships of any kind? Friendships are weird to me in that I don't really see it in an open, closed kind of way. Like, I'm not the kind of person who's blatantly going to try and make new friends, but that doesn't mean that it's impossible for stuff to align just right with someone and for me to make a new friend for their circumstance. I think the way I see it is, I try not to artificially make new friendships and seek them out as much as I'd rather let them find me more naturally. A more clear answer to this is, it depends how much we're actually talking and what we're talking about. But also, I do have quite a bit going on in my social life currently, so then expecting to be very active. I have quite the problem with being forgetful about messages sometimes, so if I happen to not be super active with you, don't take it personal. But, I don't know, it really depends. Like, I might, I might talk to someone and maybe I'll become friends with them, but it's not something that I feel is settled with like a can we be friends kind of question, because that just seems kind of weird. I don't know, just, again, it depends on the circumstances, honestly. And of course, it depends on how busy my social life currently is, which I can say right now, it definitely is a little bit packed, so uh, don't expect anything, I'd say. At least outside of like business or collaborations or something. Two. When you are expressing your creativity in a song, video, or other project, what makes you stick with it until completion or stop making it? If it's for a video, then brain rot is the main motivator and also a sense of no one else will cover this probably. For everything else though, it tends to come from just a really strong emotion that I'm trying to get out. Often I tend to want to know exactly where I'm pulling from mentally when I'm working on a project. Is this project rooted in good emotions? Bad ones? Trauma? Heartbreak? Some kind of yearning? Once I can figure out what exactly gives me the feelings that draws me to that project, I feel like I sort of just make a well of sorts for me to draw out that emotion more. And that's often what motivates me to keep working on it. Very rarely do I find myself stopping a bigger project or that sort prematurely thanks to that and also because I want to try and finish everything I start. Even if it might not always pan out to be my best work. The less stuff I feel like I have left unfinished, the easier I can sleep at night. But primarily, and this is a statement I have made about myself pretty often when it comes to my personal work, but it feels like everything I make is vent art in some way. It could be positive vent art or negative, but it's always me airing out some kind of emotion or particular feeling that only working on that kind of project really helps me understand and come to terms with. So finishing it feels like I'm putting that feeling to rest in a way. 3. What exactly does it take for you to start a project? Do you need to think about it for a while, or can you just hop straight into it? It definitely depends. Usually though, I do have to think a lot more now about a project before starting it. There's a sort of fucking around phase before what I deem to be me actually starting it that can take anywhere from a few weeks to a few years, but I have a general roadmap of what I want to work on as well, so that I don't find myself doing like a billion projects at once. That's why I've been primarily focused on videos because the device theory is the current major beat on that roadmap for me. And after that, well... I don't know exactly what the next beat will be, but I feel like it will end up being one of two personal project ideas I have. I will say though, for music, it often ends up being a case of me hopping straight into it because you can't really plan that kind of thing out too much from the start. Very rarely do you get to make the music you actually are thinking of making in your head. You kind of have to get into it just fucking around and making stuff from the jump and seeing what kind of separate musical organism it ends up making spontaneously. There's not that much control you have over that sort of thing in my experience. So with music it's pretty quick, but with just about everything else I have a lot of planning to do before I truly get around to starting it proper. 4. How do you support yourself monetarily? Is it mainly through a job, commissions, donations, a combination of those last three, or something else like not having to? YouTube and Patreon are my main sources of income right now. My Earth Vessel at least is in a position where they don't have to pay all the bills and rent and shit, but they are trying to get as many sources of income rolling in as possible so that it'll eventually add up to an overall income that can be considered good enough to live on their own. This currently consists of a mix of ad revenue, the occasional stream or bandcamp donations, Patreon, working with Half-Bread Chaos, and commissions. 
so far they seem to be doing alright with it honestly and making quite a bit of progress there. But there's still a ways to go and ideally I imagine they still want to be doing just enough creatively to where altogether it will be enough to support them fully financially. This sort of thing just takes time and improved output to really get to that point. But time that I'm sure they certainly have plenty of from what I can tell. And five, could you explain your struggles with mental health and disabilities? While I personally haven't had any officially diagnosed mental stuff or disabilities, I have had a lot of experience with feeling just not in sync with most other people. Like, I'm certain there is something going on up there and it's not too crazy, but it's noticeable enough to where I have a hard time believing that everything is all well and good upstairs. For one thing, I definitely have struggles with my attention span and focusing on things and just a general forgetfulness problem, because I get so swept up in work and other things that some stuff will just completely slip my radar without me meaning to. Plus, I remember I used to have some pretty bad of anger issues when I was younger, and I have gotten a lot better with it over the years, but it mainly stemmed from me struggling to connect with people and feeling like I was unfairly blamed for a lot of things. As well as feeling like I was an easy target for being made fun of or having jokes made towards me, which, as a kid, I especially had a hard time reading humor and sarcasm in the such well. Also, I know I, I really had a bad like sensitivity to loud noises as a kid. Keep in mind, all the stuff I've said I've gotten much better about over the years. Though little remnants of it do exist here and there, and I think altogether it's just made me a person that mostly has it figured out mentally and socially, but there's just some things that are still a bit off kilter, and some mannerisms of mine that I am a bit concerned about the potential roots of. In essence, I think I've sorted out most of the surface level shit, but especially when looking at some of the deeper stuff I've been figuring out, it's made me pretty confident that, both through my personal experiences and perhaps through inheritance, I've got something going on. Not enough to where needing to see someone about it is urgent, but enough that if I were given the chance to do so for a low cost, I'd probably take it just out of pure curiosity to see what a professional thinks. I've struggled for sure with this combination of stuff between the anger issues and not taking humor well and having focus and attention span problems and also having a tendency to go into tunnel vision with my work and not be as social as I would like to be. It often tends to put me in a place where I'm kind of just in my own little bubble and going full workaholic mode. I tend to get a lot done because of it, but it does kind of suck admittedly. And while I do still have like doubts occasionally about really being neurodivergent and the such, like on very rare occasion, if, if even my neurodivergent friends are going to be able to tell me, yeah, no, you're not normal, then I'm sure there's something going on. The main thing I'm trying to do now at least is to make a more conscious effort to balance that out with more leisurely activities and me time so to speak that isn't going towards work and also actually making an effort to put a foot through the door and talk to people just a bit more. It's never something that I can fully conquer I think, but I don't think mental health is something you can fully solve in general. Much like how physical health is never something you're one and done with, it's always a balance you have to keep in check. Overall, I definitely have had a lot of run-ins with the more concerning parts of mental health, but I feel like at least so far I've given myself enough time and space to where I'm able to be more introspective and understand my issues better over the years. It's not all there, some things are still just a bit off the shits for me because I think that's just kinda how I am, but it's a struggle that I have gotten better about over time. I think the key for me is just being more understanding and patient to myself. That's helped me a lot with dealing with those kinds of struggles most healthily. Vio Marx asks, when did you make the modern iteration of your Sona slash OC, and how has their design developed and evolved over time if it was particularly long? Hmm. It feels like I came up with my current looks a long time ago, honestly. I know to you guys it must have been only like a little over two years at this point since I came up with it, but to me it feels like much longer. Although, admittedly, not much really changed in that time in terms of my looks, at least ever since settling on my current appearance. That might change in the future, but currently I'd say we're still in the first era of myself and my aesthetics under the Molly Stars label. The infancy, let's say. Except not really, because I'm already a young adult in human years and I've had my own entire childhood and everything, but that's for another project to discuss. Hello famous YouTuber Molly Stars from YouTube.com, I have a question that I think I would like for you to answer. Would you rather have unlimited bacon, but no more video games? Or, would you rather have games? Skiles asks, Hi Molly, I just discovered your videos recently and I like your humor and careful sense of analysis. I wish you lots of earned success in the new year. 
I like your gumption of opening up your AMA to as broad of horizons as possible, and this kind of opportunity to ask literally anything to a stranger is uncommon to me, so I'll go with a bold one. What is your history with religion? Did you grow up practicing one? Do you still practice that faith? Why or why not? If you no longer practice that childhood faith, or lack thereof, can you name anything of value that you brought out of that experience? I grew up within a fairly orthodoxical religion and left as a late teen on bad terms, but the relationship between humanity and religion and spirituality, all the good and bad consequences that has come from it, has always fascinated me. Anyway, I hope you're doing well. Congrats on the 10k. Thank you so much. I personally haven't been super involved in religion, neither of my parents were particularly religious themselves, but some values of it were kinda in the air if you get what I mean. While not devoutly religious, there was a belief of some kind of higher force that ultimately felt a certain way about stuff and figured that some of the impurities in the world were going to be washed away by that force as some kind of divine punishment. Though I've never been particularly forced into believing it or the like. I do have my gripes with the more extremist aspects of it, but I've never felt a bad way about religion itself, honestly. The answer my Earth Vessel would give would probably be something like, I thought about it a lot and I've realized whether there actually is a higher force or it's just the universe being itself, I wouldn't really feel bothered either way. But for me, let's just say maybe I believe in myself a little bit more literally given my current circumstances and what I learned that made me who I am now. In any case though, the main value I have learned from practicing or pondering any kind of faith is the idea of stuff happening for a reason. That most things have some deeper meaning to them or are meant to be a pointer for your life. Though even that I have my doubts about because I'd like to think that if there is a higher force, that it would be much more hands off about this kind of stuff unless there's a really good reason to act otherwise. Plus, some things do genuinely just happen without reason or regard for one's previous actions personally, and assuming everything is some kind of sign can be its own slippery slope. These days, much of my own spirituality and more existential beliefs have more to do with stuff from within than anything. If something is wrong, then is there something I have to change in my own perception and outlook on reality? Am I doing something to foster more negative atmospheres unintentionally? I personally feel like, at least most of the time, you create the environment that you see. It doesn't apply universally, of course, but even when everything is out of your control, you'll always at least have yourself, and you can always change how you want to look at the world around you. That's kind of where my faith and beliefs have been at, and it hasn't failed me so far, so no reason to really feel like changing my mind about it for the time being. Leonard Hampel asks, What are your thoughts on transitioning? Are there things more people should know about? I hope you have a nice day. Transitioning is a very case-by-case -case thing in my opinion. I feel like people often hear that and they think that it means, oh, so you're gonna do HRT or do bottom and top surgery and go the full nine yards. But transitioning can be a lot more or a lot less than that. I feel as if transitioning is really just the process that it takes for one person to go from their current established identity to the one that they feel has always fit them the best. This can of course mean you want to go through HRT or get surgery, but it can also just mean, hey, I don't like having body hair, I'd like to maybe get laser hair removal for XYZ reasons. Or it can mean that you like to do voice training and sound more androgynous and not as clearly one way or the other. Or it can even just mean that you want to present yourself completely differently in general. Whether that be through branding, how you take care of yourself, even something like what kind of clothes you wear and what name you want to go by. I feel like the goalposts can be different for a lot of people and that's honestly fine because everyone is going to be in their own lanes when it comes to this sort of thing. It's a great process to go through and one I've personally had fun exploring even if it's to a much lesser extent. I think it's something that anyone who feels the need to experience it should experience as long as they know exactly what it is they need to complete that process and don't feel obligated to go about it in a certain way. If you find you need to go the full 9 yards in your transition, then all the power to you. But if you feel happy even just having clothes that align closer to how you want to ideally present yourself, then that's good enough too. Identity is a weird thing, just do what you feel happy doing and what you know you need. And with that, we have officially, finally, gone through every channel that I opened for questions and answered all the ones that I felt like answering. What a long ride. However, we're not done yet. I saved two questions in particular for a very last since the both of them interested me especially. So I'd like to go over them here as a nice way to wrap up the long journey that was this AMA video. We'll start with Phantom of Dev, who asks, What is the Mollyverse like? Cause not gonna lie, I've been thinking it's just a place filled with snow and lodges. Kinda weird since you have stars in your name, but yeah. The Mollyverse, huh? So that's what you call the world I'm in. Well, you are right about the snow and lodges part, at least where I live in it right now. It's been a snowstorm here for the past who knows how many years, honestly. Not that this place is always like this, but this is a specific thought of that place that I've been staying in. But the world I'm in is much bigger than just that. There's a city, there's a whole section that's almost entirely just untouched nature, there's a bit of every climate really, and that's just on the mainland here. 
I'm sure there's other places that are way further out at sea. Hell, even in the stars there's stuff going on. People all around. If I were to tell you really what this place is like, I'd be here forever. And frankly, someday, I'd like to. But I'm just waiting for the right time. Some things still need to happen before I can do just that. Though you have no idea how much I could tell you already with what I have experienced and seen and learned about this world. It's a fascinating place to say the least. And finally, Tree3, aka Andrew Cunningham, asks, Hi Molly, has something from your dreams ever influenced your creative work? What's the most memorable dream you've ever had? See, this is the reason I'm actually here right now, in the snowstorm. I had this dream once, years ago. It was a recurring dream actually, but it was one of those sorts of I don't think I'm actually myself in this dream, I'm seeing this through the eyes of someone else kind of things, one of those visions. And every time I had this dream, I remember being in the back of a car, and it would always be a winter evening where it was snowing at least a bit, or maybe a ton, and it was this perpetual evening. An unchanging dark shade of a purple sky that makes the snow look something like pink sand. I don't know why I was in the back of that car, or where we were going, but it felt like this core memory, this memory of something that whoever this was, was thinking a lot about. I don't know who the other people in the car were either, but they felt important. Maybe they were friends? Family? Maybe they were just going to a restaurant or heading back home from something? But the most vivid detail that I remember from it wasn't even that ride, it was the end of it. Because seamlessly, and without me really even processing it, there was suddenly no car anymore. There wasn't even a town anymore. There was just a long road, only barely seen beneath the snow that had been falling, dotted with lampposts that emitted that familiar, warm yellow light against everything else. And I think some ways along that road, in the distance, I saw someone. And while looking through this person's eyes, while I'm sure I only saw one person, it felt as if I saw myself, but also someone else entirely. And every time I've had that dream, that's when I would wake up. And since then, I wanted to search for that place. And I think I found it. I found it since years ago. I've been staying here since years ago. And I'm waiting for something to happen. Something to prove that that wasn't just any old dream. I don't know how it's like in your world, but dreams don't just happen for no reason here. Not even everyone in this world knows it, but there's another way to reach the places you go to when you sleep. And that's where I've been. And until then, I'm certain that it's the key to tell a story that I'm sure will be worth telling someday. One day, I'd like to. And if it takes absolutely everything in me to do it, then I'll go the distance. I have to take that leap. And that concludes the AMA responses. Thank you all so, so much for your submissions and for your interest in this little idea I had for the 10k special. And whether you did submit a question or not, thank you for watching up to this point. This certainly turned out a lot longer of a video than I thought, but for hitting such a milestone, it's the least I can do to show my appreciation for the support I've gotten. From here, I'll be going back to my usual stuff. I do have plans to release an update video soon, as I usually tend to do at the end or beginning of a given year. But I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm going to be actually working on next in the field of major videos, as it is well overdue. But I wanted to take a moment to stop and smell the flowers for a bit, as heading 10k is no small feat to me. To think I've already gotten this far before even having finished my current huge video series is still such a huge deal to me, and I can't be grateful enough for it. But again, I do want to save some of the deeper thank yous and celebrations for the update video. I won't be really doing my usual like and subscribe bit for this, since this is specifically for y'all who I know already are invested in my vids to begin with. You all have been incredibly kind to me, and I hope the responses I did give were sufficient enough insight on my part. And perhaps even may have opened your eyes a bit to my perspective, let's say, on some things. It's not a side of me I blatantly show very often, to say the least. But with that, thank you for watching. And thank you again for your patience and overwhelming support. I have a lot of ambitions I'd like to try and act on in 2024, and if you asked a question about what I plan to do in the future with this channel, and I didn't answer it, then it's because I'll be answering that thoroughly in the upcoming update video, so stay tuned for that. Either way though, that'll be all for me. Let's make this an interesting year if we can help it. Take care. This was Molly, and I'll catch you later.